of four and a half tonne and over. This bill has been on a long journey. In 1989, the Interstate Commission report was succeeded by a report from the Department of Land Transport consultant, Mr Ted Butcher. In October last year, the Special Premier's Conference looked at this report and decided to set up a working group with three reporting bodies, a regulation committee, a road funding committee and a charging committee. The working group has set the figures which I, as well as industry bodies, believe will be implemented by the National Road Transport Commission. This bill does not establish the charge or the uniform rules, but gives the power to the newly appointed commission. That technically may be correct, but the new National Road Transport Commission is strictly controlled by the guidelines that are in the bill and were in the Special Premier's Conference Agreement signed by all the Premiers. The decision that the newly appointed Commission makes must be endorsed by a majority decision of Ministerial Council, which consists of all Transport Ministers and the Minister from the ACT, and chaired by the Federal Minister, Mr Brown. The Northern Territory has refused to be a signatory to the agreement establishing the National Road Transport Commission. The Northern Territory Government has researched the new charges and are, are of the opinion the increased registration charges would increase the CPI in the Territory between 1 and 2 per cent and increase transport costs by 10 to 15 per cent. This legislation does not set up a commission or the National Road Transport Commission as a fearless independent body able to stand up and make rational judgments based on research, fact and information, as asserted by the government, that is simply not true. This newly appointed commission under this legislation is bound to endorse the agreement signed at the Special Premier's Conference. In fact, the, the formula and the methodology agreed to at the Special Premier's Conference is exactly as it is in the bill. Clause 20 of the bill is a direct lift out of the, uh, of the Special Premier's Conference. And, uh, Mr Deputy President, uh, I have somewhere here uh, a copy of that bill that I would like to incorporate, uh, or a copy of that clause that I would like to incorporate in the bill and I seek leave to incorporate it. I've discussed is, this with the minister. Is leave granted? I'll give it to you in a minute. Being no objection, uh, leave is granted. Thank, thank you, minister. Senate. Clause 20 requires that the National Commission, in recommending road charges and road use charges to the Ministerial Council, shall ensure that by no later than the 1st of July 1995, the charges it recommends will comply with the charging principles and recover fully the road costs of all vehicles based on average annual distance travelled, except for road trains, which are to receive concessions of up to 50 per cent of full cost recovery under mass distance charge. In arriving at its recommended charges, the Commission and the bill says the Commission is to. It doesn't say it may or it will consider. But the, the wording in the bill is very definite. It says it, will, it is to use a pay-go system for determining what expenditure is to be recovered, uh, and it goes on. This supposedly independent commission is emasculated by the legislation, by the very legislation that proclaims its existence. It can't make independent decisions at all on cost. It must refer back to the Ministerial Council for approval. At any, to uh, any time, two or more states can veto any decision it makes. The exact agreement the Special Premier's conferences made on road charges. So it only requires a blocking of two ministers and uh, the, anything that the Ministerial Council decides or anything that the Special National Road Transport Commission decides can be vetoed by only two, two Premiers. 
The formula in the Special Premier's Conference Agreements uh, repeated in this legislation will increase road charges by 300 and, in some cases, 400 per cent, and is the same formula used by the working group that established the following scale of charges for heavy road use. Mr Acting Deputy President, I seek leave uh, to um, have a table included in, uh, in the Hansard. Leave granted. I have shown this to the—, uh, the I'm always nice, Senator. Leave us, Granis. I thank the Senate. The above table is the working group's figure that must be recommended by March 1992 to apply no later than 1 January 1993, with full cost recovery phased in by July 1995 and by 1 July 2000 for road trains. Senator Collins confirmed that the, in the Senate on October 15, when I asked him whether there would be only one charge. The reply he gave was that the National Road Transport Commission will recommend charges by March 1992 to apply no later than 1 January 1993. Full cost recovery will be phased in by 1995 and by 1 July 2004 road trains. So what Senator Collins told the Senate is exactly what was in the special Premier's conference and what is in the bill. So we have uh, Senator Collins agreeing with the Special Premier's Conference and agreeing with the method that is in, the, uh, in this legislation. So it confirms again that the National Road Transport Commission has no option but to increase charges to the working group's figures that I previously uh, tabled. At a Senate inquiry last Wednesday, we were told by the Office of the Department that the charges were not set. It was up to the National Road Transport Commission to set the charges. Senator Collins also said that there were no charges set at present. The government has never been prepared to tell the truth about the increased road charges. For two and a half years, we've lived with a smoke screen surrounding this, with no one prepared to tell what the charges will be. But everyone in the industry is well aware that the charges will be those of the working group uh, that I've tabled in the, uh, in previously in the speech. On the 7th of November, the Minister for Road Transport told the House the total charges for the increased registration would be seven to eight thousand dollars. Well, I believe that is the first charge to be uh, introduced in 1993 uh, for a six-axle articulated vehicle, a 42-tonne. But Mr Brown has not told the House that those charges will increase to full cost recovery by 1995 and will be 14,100. So we have the Minister representing Mr Brown in the Senate, Senator Collins, saying no charges have been set. The Minister saying the total charges for six axle articulated vehicles will be seven to eight thousand dollars, and the working group responding to a formula of total cost recovery as laid down in the special premier's agreement and repeated in this bill, reaching the inescapable conclusion that initial charges from January 1993 will be 7750 for a six-axle articulated vehicle of 42 tonnes, and full cost recovery by July 1995 will be 14100 So there is confusion, I believe, amongst the government, but certainly not amongst the people that are involved in the industry. Because last Wednesday night, the Senate committee took evidence from, a concerned, industry, from concerned industry groups and unionists. They told the committee exactly how those increased charges <coughs> would affect their industries and their members. Submissions were made from the National Farmers Federation, the National Transport Forum, Australian Livestock Transport, National Transport Federation, and the New South Wales Road Transport Association and the New South Wales Transport Union. And as I said, there is no confusion with these people because they know exactly where they're going. Every one of those groups believed that the new National Road Transport Commission would have no other option than to charge the working group's recommendations because of the prescribed formula set down in clause 20, uh, section 3, or clause 20 in brackets 3, in this legislation. 
There are two parts of the heavy vehicle charge. The first component is the increased registration charges that we've just been through, and the second part is a charge equal to the part of the diesel fuel tax levied by the Commonwealth for the use of road building and maintenance. The figure bandied around at the moment by those that are in the know is around 15.6 cents a litre would be uh, allocated to road spending, and that's certainly an improvement on the six cents that is presently being spent on road maintenance. When this government came to power in 1983, excise was 9.4 cents, of which six cents was spent on roads. Due to automatic indexing, the excise has risen to 26 cents a litre, yet the government has only allocated the same six cents a litre to road charges, siphoning off $2.5 billion to consolidated revenue. The Coalition's position is that all excise will be removed from the transport industry as well as sales tax on semi-trailers, prime movers, batteries uh, and tyres and parts and any other accessories that go to make up the component of a, uh, a semi-trailer and uh, the prime mover. There's no excise, but there's, there is sales. You will, you will concede there is sales tax. Well, you will concede that. Thank you, Senator. This will mean a saving in cost to the transport industry. I hope Senator Button listens to this because he may learn something. This will mean a savings in cost to transport industry of 10 per cent from the removal of excise and 6 per cent on the removal of sales tax. And that is a massive 16 per cent that will be removed uh, from the cost to the transport industry. And they are figures that have been given to me by responsible members of the transport industry. And so, Senator Button, if you think that the uh, fight back package is not going to be popular in the transport industry, then I've got to inform you that you're going to be very much mistaken. This government is leaving on the excise and the sales tax and then increasing road charges by a mass of 300 to 400 per cent. This is just another example, if any were needed or any more were needed, of the philosophical differences between the National and Liberal parties and the Labor Party. This package is not one of economic reform. It increases charges to a sector of Australia that can't afford one more cent added to their budget, to rural Australia and the trucking industry. Microeconomic reform is about lowering costs, not increasing fees by 300 to 400 per cent. This government has taken no account of the burden the transport industry bears. The Interstate Commission addressed the road transport industry or assessed the road transport industry pays on an average three and a half times more indirect tax than other industries, but this has been ignored in all the calculations. There are no improvements in the bill. There is no uniformity achieved by the bill. There are two zones, A and B. One territory government that won't sign the agreement, and if any transport minister wants to absolve his state from any part of the agreement, then they can issue an application order and absolve themselves from uniform rules in their state. What sort of unity is that? What sort of federalism is that? There is absolutely no unity. It's a package of compromise. Its only achievement will be increased freight charges, more truckies losing their livelihood, their jobs and their homes and their rigs, more costs going to our export markets and more country towns being destroyed. That's what the package will give. To get an agreement from all states to be part of the national road transport system, the government was forced into accepting uh, Senator Button, I'll be very pleased to hear your contribution because I'm sure it will be interesting to the people of rural Australia. <laughs> Well, if I can continue, uh, thank you, Senator O'Chi. I know that you're particularly interested in this speech because you're concerned about rural Australia. To be part of the uh, the government was forced, Mr. Acting Deputy President, into accepting a two-zone system because Western Australia, Queensland, and South Australia premiers were not prepared to accept the higher zone A charges, while New South Wales, Victoria, and Tasmania and the ACT will pay higher charges. But the scheme hasn't even got off the ground and has already been uh, uh, in a disarray at the moment. 
because of the two-zone system. It's ironical that we're talking about a Prime Minister's new federalism and we're already seeing differences between the states. We're going to see trucks from the Northern Territory and from the lower zone states stopped at the border and asked to pay higher fees to enter a zone. It's been mentioned in the committee that some trucks or trucks may even be forced to pay the higher registration fees if they are going to um, apply their trade in uh, the higher zones. We could even see the reintroduction of the old tick gates on the border where you have to get a permit to cross the border. Well, that's uh, maybe Senator Button's idea of new federalism, but it's certainly not mine. Could, we're going to turn the clock back 190, uh, 90, 90 odd years when we had custom posts at the border. That's how stupid it is. No one is, no one's got any idea how it's going to work. Even Mr. Brown concedes it's a farce when he said, frankly, we, need to, we needed to incorporate zones into the special premier's conference to get everyone aboard. Just another compromise. But I continue to have considerable reservations about the efficiency of this approach in terms of its administration, enforcement and equity. Mr Brown hasn't got a clue on how the extra charges will be made on vehicles moving between the states from one zone to another, and either as anyone else, if they're going to be perfectly honest, it's going to be passed over the National Road Transport Commission and it's going to be one hell of a fight when the premiers meet and make it a, make a decision. We're told that there will have to be permits issued at the border and they're going to create tensions in the industry. We're also told that there is to be a reduction in charges between the low-cost zone and the high-cost zone. In fact, the legislation sets out that under Clause 20 the charges will be uniform. Mr Goss, the Queensland Premier, has never come out and told Queenslanders what registration charges will be in Queensland and what the savings are in Zone B, or the savings differences between Zone B and Zone A. There is a complete contradiction in terms between the new federalism and what we have at present or what was being presently proposed in this bill, because it is going to be chaos. We are debating or we are bringing in legislation that will be passed without the Democrat support that will set increased road charges by 3 to 400 per cent by 1995. The formula is set in this bill, it's set in the special premier's conference and it has been worked out by the working group. The Commission has nowhere to go. The legislation that sets the Commission up in effect sets the charges up also. The Democrats may oppose the legislation, uh, the, comes, uh, the supplementary legislation that comes in setting the charges up, or it may amend them, but this bill, uh, and, and hopefully uh, they will do that. The legislation does not take into consideration any impact on regional and rural Australia. In March this year, at a rural and remote transport conference at Alice Springs, the government commissioned a study by the Bureau of Transport and Communications Economics and the Bureau of Ag Agricultural and Resource Economics into the regional impact of the proposed changes embodied in the Special Premier's Conference Agreement. That report won't be ready until March or April and therefore will have no impact or influence over the charges. The National Road Transport Commission is required by the agreement in this legislation to recommend charges by March 1992 to apply no later than January 1993. That report that was commissioned seven months ago hasn't even uh, been seen and won't be seen probably to February or March next year. And yet the uh, newly appointed commission is required under this legislation to set the charges by 1992. It's really just another example uh, to show regional and rural Australia just what contempt, and I mean contempt, this government has for country people. You know it's true too, Senator. You know it is true. I was given an impact, but I'm, I'm being provoked. I was given an impact study done by the Shepparton, Kyabram and Rodney 
Regional Development Corporation on the effects of the Special Premier's Conference Agreement, using the working group's figures that I have incorporated in my speech. And this study would be typical of country districts in Australia, and, but probably because of Victoria's smallness or compactness, the results would be more disastrous for the bigger states, particularly my state of Queensland. The, the study found the following points that it would cost an additional $6.8 million to register the 650 articulated vehicles in the district. It would push up livestock transport between $0.08 cents and $0.50 cents a kilometre, hay by $10 a tonne, and increase the cost of transporting fruit between $1 and $5 per tonne. The Goulburn Valley's economic viability would be devastated. The results show that 140 jobs would be lost in the road transport industry and 520 jobs lost in other industries. In my own state of Queensland, it would cost an additional $15 to transport a beast from Mount Isa, Julia Creek and Ewenden to Toowoomba or Roma, the main selling points, and an additional $40 a tonne freight. And you've got to ask yourself, what sort of crazy harebrained scheme is this that's going to add cost to export industries and put more lead in the saddle of primary producers and further depopulate country areas? The government has produced a recipe to devastate rural Australia. The government has a hide to bring this legislation in without any impact statement, and the Democrats should follow the example of the National Party and Liberal Party and reject it also. The position is, as it now stands is that the Democrats, while supporting the National Road Transport Commission bill, have stated they will not guarantee to pass further road transport legislation that sets up the new charges. The whole matter has now been referred to a Senate committee that will report on the 11th of uh, September 1992. The result of that inquiry will determine the attitude the Democrats will, have to take, uh, will take to passing any legislation that will increase the charges. But let's look at the real politics of the matter. The, matter. the committee report will go to the Senate on the 11th of September 1992, and the new charging legislation and if the new charging legislation takes into consideration the Senate inquiry, legislation could not be introduced into Parliament before at least October. By then, the election date will be looming in the government and the Democrats' minds. And we've got to ask, would they be well, they are, some of them are small-minded. Would they be prepared to increase charges on the eve of an election? And that's a big question. If the National Road Transport Commission is to be implemented, it will require complementary legislation in the state parliaments. It will be difficult for the New South Wales government to muster the numbers in parliament, as all independents and Labor Party uh, state that they won't support a bill with two charging zones. The National and the Liberal parties are making noises in Western Australia. They won't support a bill, and they'll knock it off in the upper house. And the South Australian government is rapidly losing enthusiasm and interest for this particular bill. The flawed concept of a National Road Transport Commission that has no other option than to increase charges to full cost recovery by 1995 under a formula that will raise registration by 300 to 400 per cent looks to be sailing in a very heavy weather and could sink with all hands. And that would be a great benefit if it did to rural and Australian primary industry. If the government is to ignore the warnings and proceed with the increased charges after the Senate inquiry on the 11th of September 1992, it will even lose more seats. It's already lost government now. The trucking industry in rural and regional Australia have won a reprieve, but they can't be complacent. The Democrats won't support the legislation until the Senate committee reports on the 11th of September 1992. The Coalition won't support this legislation or have a bar of it at any price. And, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, in conclusion, I am very proud to oppose this legislation. It's ill-conceived, ill-thought-out, would cripple industry, primary industry and rural and regional Australia. It would kill our country towns and ruin our export markets. This bill deserves no support at all. Senator O'Chi. Mr Acting Deputy President, I have great pleasure in uh, following and supporting my colleague and leader, Senator Boswell, because this bill, as Senator Boswell has said, would destroy remote and regional towns in this country and do untold damage to our primary industries and to our other exports around this nation. 
Because the fact is that 90 per cent of our freight is carried on the roads, and irrespective of what changes we made to the rail network, at the end of the decade, 90 per cent of our transport will still be carried on the roads. And so any attempt to increase road registration charges is nothing but an increase in the cost of freight from one part of this country to the other. Now, you would have thought that with a nation the size of Australia, with the tiny population it has, we would be doing everything in our power to reduce the cost of road transport in this country, but not this government. This government's view of microeconomic reform is not to reduce costs to industry, but to increase them, because that's the effect of this bill. This bill sets up a corporation which is locked into recommending higher road user charges. This bill sets up a corporation which is locked into imposing greater costs on people who live in regional areas of Australia and on industries in regional areas of Australia. And this government is locked into a false and myopic view of uh, microeconomic reform that will do nothing but inhibit our exporters rather than a system becoming more competitive throughout the rest of the world. I think it's very important we look at the genesis of this bill. We look at the whole genesis of this loopy proposal that the government has brought before us, because it was in May last year that the aptly named Butcher Report came out, recommending these uh, increases in road user charges. And I have great pleasure in saying that it was my colleague Senator Boswell who, with me, took some of the members of the Commission around regional Queensland and actually showed them for the first time, actually showed them what life was like outside the capital cities, what it was like when you got further west than Toowoomba, and showed them the effect that their plans would have on people in remote and regional Australia, because they hadn't been there. And it was only the work of the National Party in fighting this tooth and nail in New South Wales, where my, Senate, where my colleague uh, Senator Brownhill comes from, and in Queensland and in Victoria, and later the efforts of our friends the Liberals in Western Australia, and I acknowledge the work of Senator Panizza in that regard, that forced the government first to back down uh, on the original proposal to introduce this charge on the 1st of July this year. Because that's what the original proposal was. July 1, 1991 was D-Day for the road transport industry. D-Day for the road transport industry as this government set about increasing the charges. And we fought them to a standstill. But they still have this crazy notion that they need to increase the road user charges. And it's not about improving the funding to the roads, because honourable senators know perfectly well that this government gets more than enough money to fund the roads four times over. This is the government that gets $6.5 billion in fuel taxation and returns $1.5 billion to the road network. And yet they come into this chamber and they talk about full cost recovery. They've got full cost recovery. They've got full cost over recovery. We even have the absurd situation under this government's uh, taxing regime where cruise boat operators pay a fuel tax that's supposed to support the roads. They're getting money willy-nilly, and they want more. They're like, some, they're like some cancer that's gotten out of control, feeding, feeding on the money of others, in this case the money of the road transport industry. And it's not as though the road transport industry doesn't pay its way. I mean, even if you leave out the fourfold taxation that's inherent in the fuel charges, Look at the other taxes that this government imposes on the road transport industry. The 20 per cent sales tax on their parts and on their trucks, the existing registration charges, the provisional tax, and then, of course, if they're lucky enough to make a dollar, the income tax on top of that. And if you put all the taxes that truckies pay on one side of a set of scales and you put the small amount they take home to their wives and kids on the other side of a set of scales, the truck drivers the transport operators don't own their industry. The government owns their industry because the government owns the profits of, it, of their industry. And Senator Button and his colleagues on that side know this very well, because that's exactly what they want to do. And we on this side of the chamber, the National Liberal Parties, represent a completely different attitude to business. 
and a completely different attitude to the road transport industry. Because we say that what you need is not more taxation, but less taxation. Less taxation on business, and particularly less taxation on the road transport industry. And I can talk about the road transport industry because 20 years ago, my father got out of the road transport industry because he wasn't making a buck then. And road transport operators that thought they were having it hard in 1971, if they were still around in 1991, would say they were having a breeze 20 years ago because in the intervening period, costs have gone up something like tenfold, but the actual increases in charges have only gone up threefold. The road transport industry is the most competitive, most cost efficient in this country. The only truly efficient service industry that we have, this government, under the guise of perpetrating microeconomic reform, is going to throw it all out the window, destroy it all, because that's what they want to do. And there is no way that we in the National Party will support this bill, because in bringing this bill before the Senate, the government asks the Senate to sign a blank cheque. It asks the Senate to set up the commission that is locked into the higher charges without us knowing what those charges are. And more and worse besides, because as Senator Boswell has said, this commission will make its recommendations in March 1992 for charges that are due to come into effect on January 1, 1993. But what's happened to the report on the effect on remote and regional Australia? Where's that? Will that be tabled so that the, uh, the National Road Transport Corporation can have a look at it and put it in their recommendations? Take it into consideration? Of course not. It won't be on the table. It may not even come out until after the National Road Transport Corporation has finished its work in March 1992. That shows how shallow and hypocritical this government's commitment is to the people of remote and regional Australia. How shallow and hypocritical indeed is their commitment that they set up uh, bodies to make reports and then make, make sure they, send, they you know, head off with their proposals before those reports can be made public. And of course that's what they wanted to do with the Butcher Report, and we stopped them. And we intend to do everything we can to stop you again this time, because it is wholly unsatisfactory. We have a Senate Committee of Inquiry that reports on the 11th of September 1992. Six months, six months after the corporation recommends its charges. This is the truth. This is what this government wants to do. It doesn't care about the effect, so long as it can get its hands on more taxpayers' money. And that's all this proposal is about. And I have severe doubts as to whether some of the things that are proposed uh, by the government are in fact constitutional, because I doubt that the discriminatory charging regime the discriminatory taxes that will be imposed by virtue of the different rates inherent in the registration charges are in fact constitutional within section 51 of, of, of the Constitution. Because unless every single cent of that road user charge is returned to the roads, then it is not a user charge but a tax. And as such, it is not possible to have taxes that discriminate as between states. And I would suggest that the government and the minister give serious consideration to this, because what they are doing is setting up a taxing regime that will discriminate on trade between one state and another. So that, for example, trade going between New South Wales and South Australia will be at a higher rate than trade going between South Australia and West Australia. And that's what this government will do. So I have severe doubts as to, uh, to whether it is at all constitutional. But I suppose we ought to talk about the effect it's going to have on industry in this country, because uh, that is what is of major concern to me. It's surprising, of course, that in his attempt, in his attempt to save his leadership, Bob Hawke had the indecency, I use the word indecency, carefully, Mr Acting Deputy President, he had the indecency to accuse the coalition, which is opposing this bill, 
of planning to introduce these charges, which his own government brought up, thought up and introduced. How much more hypocritical, how much more cynical could a Prime Minister become than to mislead the Australian populace in such a disgraceful and disgusting way? The truth is, and let the whole Australian population know it, that we on this side of the chamber oppose this bill, oppose the principles behind this bill and oppose this government's attempt to increase the charges for the road transport industry. Let them know it, because we believe they ought to know it, that this is not a coalition of people intent on higher taxation, as this government and the Democrats are, but a group of people intent on lower taxation. And will Mr Hawke now have the decency, if he remains Prime Minister after 6.30 tonight, to go to the Australian people and say, I misled you. I didn't tell you the truth. I didn't tell you it was my government's idea. Of course he won't. Will Minister Button be shouting it from the rooftops? What about, what about the ex-treasurer Will the, will the ex-treasurer, maybe the next Prime Minister of Australia, be shouting it from the rooftops? Will he be saying the previous incumbent told the Australian uh, population a grave mistruth? Of course not. They don't want people to know what they're doing. But we want them to know because we are not going to tolerate what this government plans to do to the road transport industry. Let me talk about, as I said, the effect on other industries, on other people who would be affected. For example, potato growers on the Atherton Tablelands are currently earning about $8 a bag for potatoes which come off the Tablelands and are sold in Sydney. The problem is that the cost of getting those potatoes from the Atherton Tablelands to Sydney is $5.50 a bag. And if there is a 20 per cent increase in road user charges, which is what's expected to result from this bill, then we're going to add another $1.10 to the price of a bag of potatoes. Now, as it is, those potato growers are already losing money taking the potatoes off the ground and shipping them down to Sydney. There will be effectively very little opportunity for the potato industry in the Atherton Tablelands if this bill goes through. Look for example the effect it would have on the sugar industry. The sugar industry. The sugar industry is a big user of gypsum, which they spread over the soil. It currently costs fifteen dollars a tonne to buy gypsum in Brisbane. But in Bundaberg the cost of gypsum is fifty dollars a tonne. In other words, there's a $35 a tonne freight component on that gypsum from Brisbane to Bundaberg. You add another 20 per cent to that, you add another $7. Instead of that gypsum costing $50 a tonne, which is exorbitant as it is, it would cost $57 a tonne. And of course, the cost to the, uh, to the sugar industry would be quite dreadful. It is one of the things that the sugar industry needs to have gypsum to enable to ensure that the soil is fertile and to ensure that they good, get good returns. Yet this government is going to add to their input costs, and we believe that that is despicable, absolutely despicable. Another uh, industry which, uh, of course, would suffer would be the, uh, the dairy industry, because the dairy industry is a major user of road transport in shipping milk from the producer to the uh, to the dairy itself and from the dairy to the consumers. Now, one only needs to look, for example, at the, uh, the dairy cooperative on the Atherton Tablelands to see what an effect that would have, because it's really quite frightening. That dairy cooperative would be faced with hundreds of thousands of dollars of extra uh, registration fees just on the trucks it, own, it, own, it owns itself, let alone on the transport charges it pays to other operators. Hundreds of thousands of dollars of higher registration charges on the trucks which it itself owns. And this is what this government will do. And yet it tells us it's microeconomic reform. It is nothing short of microeconomic destruction, Mr Acting Deputy President, for this government to increase the charges to industry in the way it has. It will be nothing short of destructive of the efforts of that dairy cooperative to export dairy produce into Southeast Asia. This government gets its way. 
And this government is likely to get its way because its friends, the Democrats, are going to support it. Its friends, the Democrats, the people who pretend they're the friends of the Bush and the friends of anybody else they happen to meet. But the same people who shamefully, shamefully support an increase in road user charges, in the same manner in which they have shamefully refused to support any attempt by the coalition to reduce the cost of diesel and petrol through the abolition of the fuel tax. A disgusting and disgraceful public position, and one which will be remembered for a long time. So I conclude, Mr Acting Deputy President, by saying this. Let the people of Australia know who are the authors of this proposal. Let the people of Australia know who are the supporters of this proposal. And let the people of Australia know who is going to knife industry in the back through this bill. Because one thing is for sure, it won't be the National and Liberal parties because we oppose it now and will oppose it whilst this government continues to tax industry in the way it does. Senator Macdonald. Mr Acting uh, Deputy President, uh, the Liberal and National parties have proposed an amendment uh, to this uh, particular uh, motion before us, uh, which I would certainly urge the government to very seriously consider and, in the interests of Australia, uh, adopt as uh, the uh, policy of uh, the parliament and of the, the government. Uh, Mr. Mr Acting Deputy President, uh, my uh, colleagues uh, in the Liberal and National parties have spoken at uh, some length uh, on the uh, effects of the bill and what it will do to Australia. And I think it's important that we uh, do understand the uh, concept of this bill, what this particular bill is all about, and what the industry or the concerns that the industry has about the uh, particular uh, piece of legislation. I might say, uh, Mr. Acting Deputy President, that the the uh, bill itself is, is innocuous enough, uh, and at a, uh, a reading, uh, at a cursory reading, it simply sets up the National Road Transport uh, uh, Commission, and uh, that uh, seems to be not such a uh, bad idea. I might say, uh, however, Mr Acting Deputy President, that one of the benefits of the Senate committee system is that it enables senators and the public at large to look into, at some uh, greater uh, depth and detail, just what the bill really means, what lies behind the words and what lies behind the uh, sentiment that uh, the government is proposing. Now, the broad thrust of the uh, sentiment I think uh, uh, not many people would object to, but when you look at it closely and when you understand what the industry says about it, then you will have some real concerns as to what uh, this particular bill may do for transport in Australia. Now, I, of course, am particularly uh, concerned about uh, road transport uh, in Australia, transport of any nature, because I live in uh, the, uh, and always have done, uh, lived in the far north of Queensland, where we, we exist because of transport, road transport, rail transport um, and air transport. And uh, it's uh, particularly pleasing then, Mr Acting Deputy President, to find that Dr Hewson, in his fight back package, has recognised the role that uh, road freight and uh, freight generally plays in the lives and uh, living standards of those of us who do live remote from the capital cities. And, uh, to that end, uh, Dr Hewson has introduced a package of reforms which will make uh, uh, road transport in particular much more cost effective. The complete uh, wholesale sales tax will be removed from all business inputs, but particularly, uh, I want to mention today, the road transport industry. The 20% wholesale sales tax on uh, rigs, trucks, tyres, windscreens, repairs, all of those sorts of things will go. In addition to that, the 26 cents a litre uh, in fuel and diesel excise, which currently applies, will be removed completely. Now that effect and that, the cascading effect of that will have an enormous impact, a massive impact, on uh, the lives of those of us uh, living in areas remote from the capital cities because we depend so much on uh, road transport, so much on rail and air transport, and so much uh, on our own cars and the fuel we use. And that more than anything, that more than anything is one of the most uh, significant reforms that has been proposed in this country, I, I would venture to say this century, because it will mean just so much to the uh, costs of, uh, of uh, shipping things by road. In fact, uh, yesterday, Mr Acting Deputy President, I was uh, travelling with Dr Hewson in uh, north and central Queensland. We were talking to truckies at that time, and we were receiving uh, from the truckies 
their, uh, their enthusiasm, their enthusiastic support for the Fight Back package, because they recognise just what it will do for uh, remote and regional Australia, what it will do for Australia generally. And the trucking industry as a whole significantly supports and endorses enthusiastically the Fight Back package because of the things that it will do for remote and regional Australia and for the cost of transport. Mr Acting uh, Deputy President, I uh, digress uh, slightly to uh, uh, just say something else about uh, uh, transport to the area I come from, uh, Senator Button, and it is a very sad day in the uh, annals of uh, far north Queensland, northern Australia, with transport when uh, we see the reports of what is happening to Compass Airlines. Now, Mr Acting Deputy President, Compass Airlines are struggling. They have made an enormous impact on uh, far north Queensland in particular. They have really boosted the tourist industry in that area at a time when, uh, because of this government's actions with the pilot strike and its uh, recession we had to have huge interest rates, the tourist industry in far north Queensland was at its knees. Compass came along, and I uh, venture to say, uh, it's, it's my opinion, that that, uh, that significant event, more than anything, uh, saved the uh, tourist industry in far north Queensland and really boosted it to a stage where it is now one of the most progressive uh, industries in the world. And I read with some sadness today that uh, Compass Airlines is uh, struggling. Now, I might say, Mr Acting Deputy President, that Compass, in its first seven months of operation, paid, in their words, in the words uh, in their balance sheets, to government coffers some $22 million, $22 million in seven months to the uh, coffers of uh, various governments. And I might say, Mr Acting Deputy President, that of that, in a, a mere seven months period, some $2.4 million went in sales tax and another almost $1 million went in payroll tax. Now, if the government had the courage to adopt the fight back package, there is $3.5 million that Compass Airlines would be better off just today. Now, that's just, just one aspect of it. One aspect of it, uh, one aspect of it uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, and the flow-on effect of all of the other uh, uh, reductions of taxes on businesses would be enormous. And they would even uh, help people in Senator uh, Tate's uh, uh, area. And I'm sure the people of Tasmania would love to have uh, Dr Hewson's fight back package because of what it would do to transport in your area, uh, Senator Tate. And there it is. There's Compass's figures. Three and a half million dollars to government coffers, which wouldn't be under Dr Hewson's uh, uh, fight back package. And, uh, and the industry understands that. The tourist industry <coughs> generally accepts that. And it is a sad day. I certainly hope Compass can continue running because it's very important in the freight, uh, in the freight and transport uh, areas of our nation. Now, Mr Acting Deputy President, I did mention that I was in uh, central and north Queensland yesterday talking with uh, uh, truckies about the fight back and, and other things and about the National uh, uh, Road Transport Commission bill. Now, I might say some of the truckies who went to uh, showed to us press releases that had been issued by the Australian Democrats pretending what a joke, Senator Wigman, exactly, pretending that they are the truckies' friend. Now, I don't have I don't have to get up in uh, Parliament here and denigrate or point out to Australians just what the Democrats uh, uh, are really doing, the hypocrisy of the Democrats and their policy on uh, transport, because the industry is doing it for me. The industry are throwing around these press releases from uh, uh, the uh, Australian Democrats and wondering how politicians, how a political party that was established to keep the bastards on us can be so hypocritical and so uh, have such a deleterious effect on the uh, national road transport industry. And uh, I just think that uh, Senator Kernow, who's taken some interest of this and who issues uh, these press releases around the uh, countryside, should really wake up to herself. It would be far better that she said nothing than uh, issue these sorts of press releases, which then make them really the laughing stock of the transport industry. They are scorned, and rightly so, uh, by those people who need assistance, who want assistance, who understand our package will give assistance, but who f realise that our efforts are being thwarted by the combined uh, uh, totals, the combined uh, force of the uh, government, its right, left and centre factions, and its far left faction in the Australian uh, Democrats. And people uh, do understand that. Mr Acting Deputy President, time is short uh, because, again, we get to the day before uh, Senate rises. We have a, 
a, a quite a deal of legislation to do, and so uh, we've been asked to keep our speeches down, which is difficult on a matter as important as this. But I just briefly want to uh, uh, mention some of the things that happened at the uh, uh, Senate uh, Standing Committee's inquiry into this particular uh, bill. Now, I'm privileged to be a member of that uh, committee, and along with my uh, uh, colleagues, uh, my Liberal Party colleagues, uh, uh, Senators Chapman and Panitza, we spent a great number of hours listening to people <coughs> make submissions on that bill, people who, at short notice, had come from all over Australia because they had a very great concern about the bill. They wanted us as parliamentarians to understand it. And I say, and as I said previously, I'm particularly grateful they came because they made me more aware of what was happening. Now, had the government had some members there, they may also have learned and may have uh, realised that the bill requires substantial lo uh, looking at again, substantial further investigation. Now, Senator Foreman uh, sat through it and uh, he would understand the submissions made, but none of his colleagues bothered to, and the Australian Democrats didn't even bother to show up, didn't even have the courtesy to listen to the submissions made by uh, those people. Now, I've read what Senator uh, Coulter said about Senator uh, um, uh, Powell uh, not being available, and uh, I can understand that. But Senator Kerno used to be on that committee. She understands it. She has the carriage of it here, and she could have easily been there. I see that Senator, Ker uh, Senator Coulter said that between 7.40 and 7.50 he spoke to members of the industry and suddenly he understood all of their concerns. In 10 minutes he was able to achieve, so he says, uh, what the, those people, those witnesses, took some uh, four, five or six hours to explain to the committee and to be questioned by the committee. Now, Senator Tate, I wouldn't interject if I were you because your people, you had four people on that committee, one of them, the chairman, bothered to turn up. Now, that, that's a disgrace. And then to come along and, and put some, some particular proposal to this parliament by the majority of that committee, the Labor Party and the Democrats, is an absolute disgrace. They weren't even there to hear the arguments. How would they know? How would they be able to understand what it was all about? How would they appreciate the real problems that the uh, people in the trucking industry had with it? And I might just mention some of those uh, concerns. Mr Directing Deputy President, the witnesses were concerned about the independence of the committee, not of the committee men, but of the commission itself. Not of the commissioners, I should say, but of the uh, commission itself, because its uh, its rules were wrong, its uh, its uh, its uh, its jurisdiction was wrong. The rules under which it were oper to operate were not appropriate, and they were concerned that the commission were being directed by the government, by the Labor Party, in a certain area, and they wouldn't be then independent to look at all aspects of the road transport industry and all of the things that need to be looked at. Uh, to properly uh, consider this bill. There was, uh, Mr Acting uh, uh, Deputy President, a concern that the bill was being rushed through. There was a plea by nearly all of the witnesses, a plea which I might say uh, those Liberal Party members on the uh, committee took up, for further time to look into this, for further time to investigate just what would be the concerns of the uh, industry, to give the Commission some power to look into things, to uh, find uh, uh, do some estimates, some uh, estimated costs of what the road freight charges might have to be, and then to determine that impact on the uh, people of Australia. And there was a real concern that, um, that, uh, that there wasn't sufficient time being given uh, to investigate those matters. There was, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, also a concern with the uh, zonal system, the two zones that's being proposed. Now, I remember uh, uh, some uh, time ago that uh, my State Premier, Mr Goss, in a blaze of publicity and in an attempt to uh, hoodwink the people of Queensland, he came out as the tough boy from one of these Premier's conferences when he came back and he said, I'm not agreeing to that road freight thing. I've got a special deal for Queensland. We're going to have a different say and it'll be beautiful <coughs> Queensland. And foolishly, I suppose uh, I, like a, a lot of other Queenslanders, thought, well, that sounds like a good idea. Uh, we'll get some favoured treatment. But by learn, listening to that committee, by uh, attending before the committee, hearing the concerns of the people that have investigated it fully and understand it, there is quite obviously a real concern with a two-zonal system. Now, that concern, Mr Acting Deputy President, uh, I wouldn't have been aware of if I hadn't have been uh, able to get the in-depth uh, advice and the in-depth uh, submissions from people in the industry and people who understand uh, what that's all about. Mr Acting Deputy President, it's most important 
that um, the social and economic uh, impact of the proposed new road uh, user charges are investigated uh, before or at least at the same time as uh, recommendations are made for the uh, new charges. And, uh, this seems to be something the government has overlooked and quite uh, 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 petulantly, I think, uh, refused to consider and allow to happen. Why a full investigation cannot be allowed, what the government has to fear uh, from these sort of things, I can't understand. But it's certainly something that I do urge uh, people to uh, uh, consider uh, when voting for this. I mentioned very briefly, Mr Acting Deputy President, that many of the witnesses had a real concern with clause 20 uh, or subclause 3 of clause 20 of the uh, agreement between the states, and that uh, related to the uh, possible non-independence of that uh, commission. And I again urge the government uh, to look at that. I again urge the government to consider the, the submissions of the Northern Territory government in uh, addressing these uh, particular issues and to take on board the concern of the industry, the concern of the people who really know how it will affect Australia, how it will affect uh, road transport generally, uh, just uh, the concern that rushing this through without proper and adequate investigation uh, uh, will uh, concern. Those people uh, uh, made a uh, significant effort to come and explain that uh, to us, to point out the flaws in the bill, to uh, point out that what the uh, parliament should do with it. And I just uh, hope, Mr uh, Acting Deputy President, that this Senate will take on board those uh, submissions, take on uh, board uh, those uh, uh, arguments uh, to the committee uh, in, by adopting the uh, amendment that uh, Senator Chapman has moved on behalf of the Liberal and National Parties, and uh, which is uh, printed in the thing. I urge that the Senate uh, support that amendment and so give the uh, freight industry, the trucking industry in Australia, a fair go a chance to serve the people they uh, presently uh, look after. Senator McGibbon. Thank you, Mr Acting President. Time is short and I won't take very long speaking to the uh, road transport bill that's before the Senate at the moment. Uh, I compliment the previous speakers on this side for putting the opposition's position so clearly and so lucidly. And uh, We have a number of concerns about this bill. The fact that the taxes and charges already being paid are not taken into account. Uh, the whole business of uh, not being able to look at the industry uh, with respect to the roads that are provided for it to run on and not being able to make an assessment of how economically they're being funded and uh, maintained. There's also a great disability with it. And uh, I want to talk about it uh, very briefly as a primary producer, one of the very few in the Senate because it has a major impact on rural Australia. One of the major propositions is that uh, heavy transport will be uh, put onto a user pays basis. And as uh, anyone in the Senate knows, I have marked reservations about user pays. Uh, I think it's something that is very glibly trotted out. Uh, very few uh, people seem to uh, understand that there are a lot of ramifications if we're going to adopt a user pays concept. It's one of the worst legacies the Whitlam government left us. And uh, if we're going to have a user pays doctrine, as I've said on repeated occasions, particularly in relation to aviation, well then I think there's a good case to get away from personal income tax because we're paying twice for a lot of things under the user pays concept. And uh, I certainly don't want to pay. If, if we're going to have a user pays doctrine, I want to be consulted on how money is expended by government departments and certainly half the bureaucrats in them I wouldn't feed. I'd take them off the payroll. But uh, I find in the aviation field I have very little rights of, uh, or very little consultations made uh, with me as to what expenditures are run up in my name and I suspect that this is going to be much the same with respect to transport. Uh, we'll have a bureaucratic determination of what the true cost in inverted commas is for this service and it will be levied against the industry. Now, everything that goes onto a property, everything that comes off, moves by road. And uh, it's very much in the national interest that we make that as cheap a service as it is possible to be. And that's, of course, one of the great benefits, as Senator McDonald was saying, of the GST proposals, which cleans out all the on costs to uh, transport in this country and makes them a deductible business expense. And that's why rural Australia has uh, embraced the GST so 
emphatically, and uh, it's been one of the great breakthroughs uh, towards reducing costs that rural Australia has faced. But uh, one of the difficulties is that I think that most of the people in the Department of Transport have never been out in the real field. And uh, there's this great concern when you talk to people about how the heavy transports are breaking up the roads. Now, if transports are properly designed, they don't break up roads. What happens is that people overload transports. And it is not uncommon, whether they're hauling freight between Sydney and Melbourne or whether they're hauling wheat off a property on the Darling Downs, to load those vehicles up to two or even three times their designed all-up weight. Now, when that happens, the effect on the road paving is catastrophic and uh, very expensive repairs are required. But the solution to the problem is not to attack the industry and say we're going to charge you 20, 30, some figures up to 70 or 80,000 a year to register heavy equipment. The, the correct approach is to enforce through the state police forces and the traffic authorities the design loading of the trucks. And if that happens, then uh, except in extremes of wet weather, when the paving is uh, undermined to some degree and the stabilisation is reduced, you don't get any, un harm any harmful effects to uh, the road surface at all. But uh, I'll close with those few remarks, Mr Acting President, and I uh, support fully the position of the opposition on this. The uh, move to a National Road Transport Commission has some virtues in it. But like everything else this government's done in recent times, it hasn't been thought through. It isn't a coherent document, and uh, as it stands at the present time, it will only add very significantly to costs and frustrations in the transport industry, and it certainly won't work the way the government intends it to work. Senator Kemp. Senator Kemp. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mr. Acting Dep Deputy President. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I rise to speak on uh, the National Road Transport um, Commission Bill 1991. You're not and normally so shy, Senator. <laughs> You're not so, uh, so um, intrusive, <laughs> if I have to say so, but Mr. 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 Acting Deputy President, either. For a vote tonight. <laughs> uh, thank you, uh, uh, Senator MacDonald. As, uh, as mentioned, I'm trying to speak on this bill, uh, Mr. Acting Deputy President, and uh, as uh, um, many of my colleagues have uh, drawn attention to uh, particular problems and concerns with this bill. Uh, my uh, major concern in rising uh, to speak on it is to draw attention to some of the problems that this uh, bill will be causing in my home state in Victoria. Senator, uh, Senator MacDonald, um, Senator Boswell, Senator O'Chee have uh, very effectively put, I think, uh, to this chamber the very great concerns that uh, is uh, existing amongst the transport industry in their own state about this uh, particular bill, and uh, I would have to tell them that, uh, uh, that uh, these concerns are equally shared by many in the transport industry in my home state of um, Victoria. Uh, in order to um, uh, add, uh, uh, provide examples of uh, our concern, uh, I'd like to draw on uh, a study that was undertaken by uh, the Shepherd and uh, Kyabram Rodney Development Corporation uh, and, and it's the review of that study by the National Transport Federation, which was conducted about the effects of this bill on the transport industry in Shepparton. The study, I believe, is important, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, uh, because all through this process the government has claimed that the changes to road charges, which will be determined by the Commission uh, in this <coughs> bill, which it's, uh, will have a, a negligible impact on rural and remote areas. Uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, th uh, this claim by the government is significant in the light of the fact that, to my knowledge, no real impact study has been done by, by the government on the impact of this bill. And this, of course, is despite the fact that there is currently an interim commission which has been set up to begin, to begin work on these issues. Uh, the study, which I referred to by the Shepparton Development Corporation, um, has based its findings on the recommendations from the government working parties to the heads of governments in July 1991, uh, looks at the major findings and raises some very serious questions which I wish to bring before this chamber. I believe the report is significant because it is the first report of this kind to examine the, the, the impact um, of the proposals for road funding by the government 
on regional areas in Victoria, and I believe its findings can be applied uh, literally to hundreds of regional centres throughout the country. Uh, the report found, among other things, that uh, the road transport industry is vital to the Shepparton region. Uh, it found that articulated um, vehicles play a larger role than the local uh, uh, lighter delivery trucks. This, in effect, means, Mr. Deputy President, that regions such as Shepparton, which rely more heavily on larger vehicles, will be particularly adversely affected. Uh, another finding of the report was, and I'm sure that will be confirmed by many senators in this chamber, the road transport industry operates on very slim margins, around 3 to 4 per cent of turnover, and any increase in uh, road charges, uh, any further increase in road charges, could not. Uh, be easily absorbed, if they could be absorbed at all, by the industry. This report is sending a clear message to the government that its plan to heap on top additional charges over and above those already incurred by the industry would have a disastrous impact not just on the road transport industry, Mr Deputy President, but on the Shepparton region as a whole. The report goes on to, to examine closely the financial impact decisions. Uh, that the Road Transport Commission may have if the recommendations of the government working parties to the heads of government were adopted. Uh, it found that employment in the Shepparton region directly from road transport uh, industry amounted to some 1,400 jobs, that some 60 per cent of employment in the region was generated by or heavily reliant on the road transport industry and that the industry generates a turnover in the region of some $67 million, but it is important to recall that the profit margin here is only around 3 to 4 per cent of this total. In other words, Mr Acting Deputy President, the report found that whilst the road transport industry survives on a very low margin, its survival is vital for the Shepparton region as a whole, as it generates such a vast amount of income. The National, Transport Industry, uh, the, the National Transport Federation has concluded in its review of the, the Shepparton Developments Corporation report that, and I quote, it appears that the proponents of the increases in registration <coughs> have not taken significant account of the regional road transport industries and the effect <coughs> any increase on charges will have on industry and consequently the regional economy. The report went on to say that for items that require freighting through various stages of production, the cost increases will be passed on at each stage. Two of the Goulburn Valley's major industries, dairying and the fruit industry, fall into this category. They are also stable consumer products and provide valuable export earnings to the Goulburn Valley and Australia. Commenting on the government's two-tier registration fee proposal, uh, the NTF concluded, and I quote, if either a fixed cost registration fee or a variable charge is levied on the industry, virtually all the articulated transport industry in this region will become unviable, given the marginal return to the, to the operator is currently between 3 to 4 per cent. Mr Acting Deputy President, I believe it is incumbent upon the minister uh, to rise uh, today to respond to these findings. Nothing less than the jobs of hundreds in the Shepparton region alone depend on his response. And I know you, Mr Acting Deputy President, with uh, your uh, long background <coughs> in the uh, trade union movement and the, the very proper concern that you show about levels of unemployment in this country, and I wish they were shared by the leaders in your party, that you, you would also be particularly concerned about the adverse impact on jobs that this bill uh, will certainly have. Uh, in case the minister doubts the severity of the situation, you might consider the example provided by the NFT response uh, to one of the, Sh the Shepparton's largest transport companies. This company operates 65 articulated vehicles and it estimates that the impact of the registration and user charges would be as follows. Uh, registration fees would blow out by some $6,684,125 to the staggering amount of around $936,000. Uh, user charges, based on a per kilometre levy of $0.10 cents per kilometre and estimating a yearly distance per vehicle of uh, some two, 250,000 kilometres, would amount to a charge of $25,000 per vehicle, or a total 
of $1,625,000, an increase of over $1.3 million over the current charges, a very heavy burden indeed to be borne by a company. On a regional basis, of the companies in the Development Corporation survey, the new charges would take Mr Acting Deputy President, nearly $3 million off the bottom line, and I stress this is in the Shepparton region alone. Three out of four livestock transporters believe the government's measures will add, the co add um, costs of some $2 per head of stock. Hay carting may increase by some $10 per tonne. Grain freight increases could vary between uh, $1 to $12 per tonne, and freighting stock feed bagged up to $0.30 cents, uh, per tonne. Fuel transporting could increase from $1 to $1 to $5 per tonne. Very, a very heavy additional burden to be borne uh, by these industries. Mr Acting Deputy President, uh, Dr Hewson has made it clear at the launch of the Fight Back package that the reform of the transport industry is of major importance. Yet the Coalition believes that any reform must be fair and equitable. The study by the Shepherd and Development Corporation raises very serious questions, not only for that region but for the whole of regional Australia. And their study suggests that the government's proposals are neither fair nor equitable. The lack of consultation by the government is of serious concern, and uh, this was a matter that uh, Senator Mac uh, Macdonald drew our attention very effectively to. And it is very poor indeed that this government has rushed through this measure in the hope of giving um, some substance to Mr Hawke's much vaunted new federalism foray. The Coalition's Fight Back package de details the Coalition's commitment to remove all the current taxes applicable in the area before examining the uh, issue of road user charges. The principal initiatives of the visionary Fight Back package, which would have a positive impact directly on the road transport industry, are firstly the abolition of the wholesale sales tax, um, secondly the abolition of fuel excise duty, third the abolition of payroll tax. Fourth, um, the, the package uh, will investigate possible savings to be made by improving the efficiency of road construction and maintenance. The principal concern of the Coalition with this bill is that the NRTC does not have the power, under its terms of reference, to review the existing level of taxation on road transport, nor the need to look at the efficiency of uh, uh, road construction and maintenance. Mr Acting Deputy President, the government seems quite prepared to put additional charges on road transport on top of existing taxes. This will increase transport costs and decrease Australia's competitiveness. Mr Acting Deputy President, we on this side of the chamber believe microform is about reducing costs and increasing competitiveness. It is clear by bringing before the Senate today proposals for the NRTC which will have the opposite effect to genuine micro-reform, the government, I believe, has shown contempt for the road transport industry and underlined again, and if it does so ceaselessly with its policies, its confused policies, its lack of commitment to real micro-economic reform. Uh, I have frequently argued uh, in this chamber, in conclusion, that the Australian Democrats, in many of their policies, have adopted an anti-rural approach. And if anyone doubts this claim, I invite them to examine the Democrats' alternative budget, brought down by Senator Spindler and never, as far as I am aware, rejected by their current Treasury's um, spokesperson, Senator Curnow. This alternative budget raises over $6.4 million in additional uh, taxes. Uh, they should also examine the Democrats' environmental policies and rural policies, which seem designed in a number of areas to bring much of our primary industry to a grinding halt. Uh, Mr President, I hope that in their consideration of this bill, the Democrats will support the sensible amendments which have been proposed uh, by my colleague Senator Chapman and say that at least some, some constructive changes can be made to a bill. Uh, which, as so many speakers have noted in their contributions to this chamber today, will have a, such an adverse effect on our transport industry in particular and the rural sector in general. Senator Crane. <coughs>
Thank you, uh, Mr Acting President. Um, in rising to speak uh, on this National Road Transport Commission bill, um, I wish firstly to support the comments uh, by my colleagues, and I do not wish, wish to go over much of the ground that they have covered. But I do wish to make uh, some co uh, comments about some aspects which I have concern. I believe in terms of making our road transport industry or our transport industry in this country internationally competitive, it is important that we have a fair and equitable system. But the question we must ask about this bill, uh, is it fair between states and is it equitable uh, between operators and consumers? I believe it is not. I believe it has the potential to force operators to put costs up and lose transport tasks, lose those tasks to uh, the rail system, and I'm not opposed to the rail system uh, winning tasks by being competitive in improving their act. But I am opposed to them winning, uh, winning uh, tasks or carrying operations by, in fact, forcing the road transport industry into a situation where it's non-competitive. And in looking at uh, this particular uh, bill before us and uh, the one that we'll have uh, coming before us, which relates to the um, rail industry, the ho I believe these bills lack the potential to, in fact, maximise the efficiency that's required in terms of our transport industry. Now, the transport industry in this country uh, is the artery of the nation. And I find it absolutely unacceptable that we have a transport industry in this country which is bedevilled uh, by taxes and charges. And in fact, the um, road transport industry is the most highly taxed industry uh, in this country. And I just want to cover some points in terms of that and as to why, in terms of carrying out the tasks required on behalf of uh, Australian consumers and residents and industry, that it is non-competitive. And if we just look, first of all, and I want to deal with the situation which exists when we're talking about uh, a new system of uh, user pay road charging, which is what this bill is leading to in terms of the agreements that have been put in place between the state and the Commonwealth. Uh, if we just look, for example, in the wholesale sales tax area <coughs> and we look at a rig costing $257,000 uh, in the first year in terms of the prime mover trailer and the tyres that would be required for the operation to do some 250,000 kilometres, we find that they pay, in terms of wholesale sales tax, $38,850, or very close to $40,000. That does not include any replacement parts in that particular year. If we go a little bit further in terms of the taxing which exists on the um, road transport industry and we look at the area of import duties. We find that the um, average import duties on commercial vehicles being brought into this country uh, is in the order of 25 per cent. The national average uh, is around about 9 per cent. So once again in this particular arena we find that the um, transport industry or the heavy haulage industry is significantly disadvantaged. We move a little bit further and we uh, look at the fuel excise uh, which is in place. Uh, in the order of some 26 cents today, only six cents of that goes back into the road system. So once again, the transport system, the road system, is making an enormous contribution uh, to um, general revenue uh, to fund other government programs. And of course, this makes our transport industry in Australia very, very expensive. We go a little bit further, and I want to deal now in terms of our approach uh, to the particular road transport industry situation as against the government. Uh, we also look at the impact of payroll tax and um, <coughs> other taxes that they have to pay, licences, uh, state taxes, etc. And our approach in terms of this, first of all, is to get rid of the wholesale sales tax through the uh, fight back package to get rid of the uh, fuel excise in terms of the fight back package and to, of course, get rid of the payroll taxes, which impacts very, very heavily uh, on the transport tasks required. 
particularly in my state of Western Australia, which is uh, very large, um, the agricultural industries and the mineral industries in particular rely very much on the road transport industry to carry out much of the task that's required in um, shifting the product um, around the state. But it doesn't only apply to the agricultural and mining industries, it applies to everybody's uh, movement of their goods and services. And to have such an important industry, which as I said is the artery of the communications in terms of the moon, uh, movement of uh, goods in this country so heavily taxed uh, is unacceptable. And I just want to dwell uh, briefly, if I could, on the amendments that we have uh, before the um, chamber. The first one, a thorough review of all input taxes and charges by, paid by the road transport industry. And in speaking to that particular part <coughs> of the amendment, it is absolutely essential, having highlighted some of the taxes and charges which already exist, to have the threat of another tax or another charge being put on top of what already exists. And we've had no clear indication uh, from the government as to what their position on this is. Are they going to transfer the whole of the uh, fuel excise that's collected into general revenue? They talk about in terms of the taxation uh, or the taxing or the user pay concept uh, in this bill that uh, it is important that the user pay uh, for the road usage. I would claim and spell out quite vigorously that in fact the road transport industry now is already paying more taxes than what is required in terms of the maintenance and building and maintaining of the road system in this particular country. And it is put at a very significant disadvantage, or the industries in this nation are put at a very significant disadvantage because it's an extra cost that they have to bear. And the government should spell out very clearly in terms of their position, which they have not done, uh, with regard uh, to going into the future. And this amendment of ours, or part A of that particular amendment, seeks to establish precisely what the taxes, input taxes and charges are and the impact that that has. Now, there have already been a number of reports into this, including the Interstate Commission report as far as the um, transport industry is concerned. And the only way I believe to go is to wipe the slate clean, get rid of the taxes that I mentioned in terms of the um, wholesale sales tax, the fuel excise, the payroll tax, uh, training levy and all these particular costs that are there, uh, and then look at the charges that come back through the licensing, licensing systems uh, through the states, um, the fuel charges that exist in the states, so as that the road industry has a very clear indication of what they're looking at. Currently that situation is not clear. The other point I want to raise in terms of uh, our amendment, and that's part B, an investigation of the current level of efficiency of road construction and maintenance practices. Now we know in this country that we have all sorts of problems with regard to work practices and how things are carried out in, term, in many, many industries. If we look at the way our roads operate, and I want to give uh, a couple of examples of this, uh, which I'm fully aware of in, in road maintenance. Now, I'm sure that there would no, be nobody in this chamber and very, very few people in Australia who have not driven along a road and seen the maintenance gangs working on those particular roads. And the thing that always strikes you about it is the number of people who are employed in these particular operations who are standing around or sitting down alongside a truck or in other words, not being very usefully engaged in terms of their employment. But occasionally you do come across a road operation where in fact that is not the case. And I want to particularly highlight what has happened in uh, the Shire of Ravensall in Western Australia, the Shire in which I live. They decided a number of years ago that they were going to introduce competition into their operations of their road maintenance and various services that the Shire provided. And they, in fact, started contra contracting out much of the road work that was being done, the main tasks. What did we see then? We saw trucks and graders that started um, early in the morning, worked till late in the evening, worked double shifts and, in fact, got the job done. You never used to drive past them seeing people standing around with no tasks. 
He never used to come out on a Monday morning and find out they didn't arrive to work until lunchtime and knock off at Thursday lunchtime to go back. So the second part of our um, amendment is very, very important as well, because the level of efficiency and productivity in terms of the maintenance of our roads, I believe, is very, very poor indeed. Usually the quality of the construction and the work that is done is quite satisfactory, but the application and the utilisation of the capital that is required in terms of the vehicles, the graders, the rollers uh, and a whole host of machinery that is used on the um, maintenance and the building of our roads is very, very poorly utilised indeed. And of course, this is paid for fundamentally out of the charges that come back onto the road users. And as I pointed out in my uh, comments earlier on, uh, the road transport industry is very, very heavily taxed indeed. And the point that the government should start from in terms of this is to have the courage to implement uh, those aspects of the fight back package and others, of course, that I have referred to in terms of the removal of the wholesale sales tax and uh, the other aspects of the charges, including the fuel excise, and start from a clean sheet in terms of the charging. The next point in terms of our amendment, uh, and I'll conclude with these particular comments, is that an investigation into the efficiency and the improving of the efficiency, the utilisation of the capitalisation and the work practices must and has to be an integral part of a national uh, road transport system. Uh, Senator Coulter. Oh, sorry, uh, Senator Calvert. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy you. President. Um, I, uh, like my colleagues, are very concerned about this particular bill, and uh, may I say how no. uh, pleased I've been to hear the contributions right made by my Mr. colleagues, both from the National Party and the Liberal Party today, because I think they've highlighted most of the uh, concerns that I have. We must remember, Mr. Acting Deputy President, we have a, an, um, a system here that employs some 400,000 people around Australia, the road transport system, and I'm reminded how important it is when I think back to a, a parliamentary delegation I was on last year that visited the Soviet Union. They too have a vast country and one of the major reasons that uh, they are having so many problems at the moment is because they've got a failed transport system. And it's been failed by the bureaucracy. It doesn't have the infrastructure or the uh, private enter uh, enterprise system that we have in Australia. And I believe one of the big success stories of our communication system, our road transport system, has been the fact that it's driven by private enterprise. And yet we see with this particular bill that's uh, being trying to be forced through this House today in, in great urgency before Christmas, uh, a bill to set up another bureaucracy, um, a framework for a bill that uh, really and truly is, is it, it's like asking uh, the road transport industry to buy a pig in a poke because they don't know what it's going to cost. They don't know what the impact's going to be on, uh, on them and the people of Australia. And yet here we are today uh, being forced to debate this, to put this bill to go through the, uh, the Senate uh, as a matter of urgency and yet we don't know the answers. We don't know the answers that are going to affect every man, woman and child in this country. We don't know what the impact's going to be on the freight costs and all those other things that are associated with it. As I said, uh, one of the major problems that I could see anyway that's facing the, United, uh, the USSSR is their failed transport system. And uh, I believe that uh, this particular bill and all the bureaucracy that goes with it is going to not improve our system but, uh, but detract from it. And I'm not the only one that thinks that. It's the, uh, it's also been highlighted by the uh, road, road transport organisations around Australia. When we look at the uh, particular proposition that's been put to us today that we're debating, um, it's interesting to note that all major groups in the road transport industry have strongly opposed the Special Comp uh, Premier's Conference Agreement. And for the life of me, I can't understand why the Tasmanian Premier would agree 
to put Tasmania in the high cost zone. The uh, National Road Transport Commission. Order. <coughs> the time being 12.45, we will now move to matters of public interest discussion. Senator Tamley. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I wish to take the opportunity of the matter of public importance today to raise certain issues um, with regard to the administration of the Office of the uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commission in Tennant Creek. In early September this year, uh, I have put on notice a question with the Senate estimates with regard to the performance of the Anangini Health Congress in Tennant Creek. I pursued that matter further in the Estimates Committee hearings uh, on 12 September and made a number of points with regard to the need for accountability, uh, auditing uh, and a health performance review to be undertaken. At that time, in early, early and mid-September, I also had confidential discussions with both the minister uh, and the, the uh, chief executive officer of ATSIC in this regard. It concerns me that it took some two months for the uh, inquiry into Anangini to get underway and for the minister to, uh, in effect, respond to me with the terms of reference of the inquiry uh, in a letter dated 13 November. I have still heard nothing with regard to the results of any inquiries in that regard. I feel that uh, whilst there is an important independent and proper function for the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commission in any of these areas, given the fact that all of these organisations are principally funded with taxpayer monies, it must be a matter for the minister to accept the proper political accountability and to give the due courtesies and proper reporting uh, when it is the service delivery to Aboriginal people in health areas such as it's the Anangini Congress must be addressed. And the fact that the procrastination and the delays have gone on now for almost three months with regard to this particular project I find to be one of major concern. In early November, I raised um, a matter in the Senate here arising from those Estimates Committee matters, but also which involved the misappropriation of more than $1 million with regard to the operation of the Junkuruka Outstation Resource Centre, also based from Tennant Creek. And it was acknowledged that uh, the flow of events that <coughs> took place in the several days after that did in fact reveal that there was evidence of gross mismanagement and totally inadequate supervision, and that in effect more than $1 million of funds that had been dedicated for Aboriginal service delivery purposes um, had dissipated and disappeared. And, uh, whilst the minister did make available to me an initial report of uh, an inquiry by a firm of chartered accountants, Panel Kerr Foster, and this matter then flowed on through the um, Tennant Creek community, it is a matter of concern that we have not been able to ascertain any of the further details. I am aware that this matter is of major concern to, the, to Aboriginal people in the Barclay and Tennant Creek areas of the Northern Territory with regard to the ongoing service delivery uh, that they necessarily require, but is also of concern to the commercial interests um, of the traders of Tennant Creek, who in this instance, I am aware, have been caught for more than $300,000 uh, in debts arising from this particular project. At the same time, I also called for further information with regard to other ATSIC administered programs, principally with regard to uh, certain community development and employment programs, um, and I highlighted a number of them. Uh, the department subsequently reported to me that a couple had clean sheets, and I acknowledge that. Um, particularly with regard to Robinson River and Lake Nash, uh, but I have heard nothing further with regard to the problems that um, are supposed to uh, affect uh, the, the project at Nicholson River um, and also 
with regard to the, the functions of a housing association at Borroloola uh, and a community service delivery agency uh, in, in Elliot. None of this information has come back despite having been made uh, in representations in this place uh, in early November uh, and also uh, directly to the minister and to ATSI. I find it is a matter of concern that as we rise now for the um, summer recess that the minister has not taken the opportunity to report through Senator Collins as ought to have happened in this place in a proper and due time. And therefore, we will not be able to ascertain properly and obtain the information that we very properly ought um, before the end of February, a further three months, in effect six months from when the issue was first ascertained. I would hope that the minister will address this matter quickly and promptly. Senator Altman. Oh, sorry. Mr. Rackle, Deputy uh, President, um, I rise on a matter of public importance in relation to um, the um, Australian Broadcasting Commission's uh, treatment of uh, children's radio programs uh, and specifically the way in which they have dealt with um, certain of those uh, educational programs for children. According to the Australian Bureau of Statistics, there are some 2,475,300 children in Australia between the ages of naught and nine years. And for these children, the Australian Broadcasting Corporation's radio division denies their very existence. For last year, the ABC axed its, uh, for last year, the ABC axed its internationally acclaimed children's radio service and took away the right of these children to be able to listen to any radio programs of their own. One could easily imagine the public outcry if the ABC instead axed all its radio programs it provided for adults. With an annual budget of just over $500 million, it's inde indefensible for the ABC not to allocate funds to restore radio programs for children. Only recently, the ABC ran its eight cents a day campaign yet again. This means that children up to nine years old are effectively contributing over $72.72 million to the ABC, out of which no money is returned to make radio programs for children. It's incomprehensible that the ABC board, together with its radio management, are prepared not to allocate any funds to ensure its own future existence. If today's children are not given the opportunity to enjoy and be stimulated by radio, they will never appreciate the value of the ABC or become its future audience. Previously, the ABC had taken positive steps to cater for children by providing radio serials and a 10-minute program for young children called Tickle Pot. Commenting on, its early success, on the early success of Tickle Pot, the then chairman of the ABC, Mr Somervale, stated, quote, it brought home to me the absolute necessity to see that our programming for, for young children, rather novel it seems, goes from success to success, end of quote. Now, Tickle Pot brought fun and laughter to thousands of children across Australia, but since the axing of Tickle Pot, the word appears to create terror among some ABC executives. They hoped it would go away, and only recently, after being mentioned in a replay in the TV program PGR on the ABC, they received many inquiries about the program again. In defending its action to ax Tickle Pot, the ABC has come up with a barrage of varied excuses. First, those responsible for this decision didn't know the duration of the program nor the true cost. The Green Guide, quoted by Mr Roger Grant, controller of Radio National, as saying Tickle Pot cost $1 million a year and runs for only seven minutes a day. The next day it had come down to a quarter of a million and he said he was misquoted. But even that figure was, was misleading and ignored important facts. I'm not sure if the ABC singled out other radio programs and costed them in the same way. They would be even, if they did, they would be even more expensive to make. The managing director of the ABC, Mr David Hill, gave a unique insight to the ABC by stating that Tickle Pot was axed because, and I quote, the program offspring wished it to be removed from their program, end of quote. Even the listeners were well aware of the attitude of the then presenter towards Tickle Pot. Surely there is some other accountability uh, for their program decisions than making a decision to axe a program because another program didn't want it to follow their program. 
David Hill then went on to say that Ticklepot was not viewed as being central to the mission of Radio National or the Charter of the ABC. If children's educational programs were not part of the Charter of the ABC, then why had it established such a fine tradition in providing programs for children? David Hill then shows his complete ignorance of radio by stating that, quote, you may be assured the needs of preschoolers will not be neglected by the ABC with the discontinuation of Ticklepot. But ABC television screens twice each day program such as Sesame Street and Play School. Radio and television, Mr uh, Acting Deputy President, are two completely different media and television cannot replace radio. This also overlooks the fact that Ticklepot received many letters from families where their parents had made a conscious decision to encourage their children not to watch television but to listen to the radio. And for these children, they were now denied their own program. Responding to further criticism over the axing of Ticklepot, David Hill then gave another unbelievable reason and wrote, quote, that the ABC Charter states that the corporation is to provide, quote, programs of an educational nature and it does not specify that these programs are to be for children." End of quote. A great many programs broadcast by the ABC are educational and this will continue to be the case. Now what an excuse is that? Using Hill's own argument, the ABC should have axed all its popular educational programs for adults because the Charter doesn't say that the educational programs have to be for adults. It was no coincidence that once a Save Ticklepot concert was organised, Ticklepot was taken off air. Despite being programmed for all of 1990, management altered its program schedule and with one day's notice axed the program. In fact, the ABC completely ignored its young audience and other listeners by telling them they had taken the program off air. The ABC action is indefensible. No money was saved by taking the program off air. In fact, four weeks of programs have been produced and have never gone to air, and most of the 410 programs produced had already had repeat rights paid for. The ABC continued to cover its tracks over axing Ticklepot. After mentioning the success of Ticklepot for two years in its annual report, why was no mention made of Ticklepot in its literacy and education section of last year's annual report to the Minister of Communications? The ABC even took steps to stop the producer of Ticklepot receiving a Literacy Achievement Award for outstanding contributions to literacy. The ABC, in deciding to axe Ticklepot, glossed over the success of Ticklepot and the need for children's radio. It was the only non-educational children's radio program in Australia and was widely appreciated across all Australia, especially in the country in remote areas and in preschools, daycare centres, schools and at home. Normal audience surveys did not reflect the true audience Ticklepot had. However, two separate surveys by the ABC proved how popular it was and called upon the ABC to extend the duration of Ticklepot and to repeat the program. While in some, one survey it was found that more children listened to each Ticklepot program than watched Play School. I know that Ticklepot received over 25,000 letters and drawings in response to the program. In fact, that ABC management has, a fact that ABC management has refused to accept. Ticklepot in just 12 months established a fan club of over 5,000 members. Ticklepot became so popular that a stage performance of Ticklepot was created. 26 sell-out con concerts were held in South Australia and Victoria and over 13,000 attended. Ticklepot also won Australian and international awards, including the Gold Medal Educational Children's Program at the International Festival of New York in 1989 and followed up by winning, winning the Bronze Award in 1990. The first radio children's program the BBC ever bought were episodes of Ticklepot. The ABC can't say there is no need to provide children's radio programs because it definitely falls within the objectives of ABC's radio corporate plan 1991-94, which is to, and I quote, reach most Australians with a range of programs that cater for specialist and minority interests, provide programs which pioneer and challenge, engage and entertain, and thirdly, to retain capable, creative and committed staff in all areas of ABC radio. Despite the radio corporate plan objectives, the ABC Charter and the fact that the ABC maintains five radio networks broadcasting 24 hours a day, the ABC still chooses 
uh, to provide no opportunity for children to enjoy their own programs, whereas the BBC has expanded its service to now provide over 35 hours of children's radio per week. If the ABC makes program decisions based on financial cost without taking into account its overall program responsibility, one must question their program making process. Surely programs are produced because of their value and need, and if any income was generated by the program, it would become a bonus for the ABC. When questioned on Radio 5UV, the controller of Radio National, Roger Grant, uh, stated that Ticklepot program earned precisely zero revenue for the ABC radio, but what it earned for ABC Enterprises I don't know. But we're talking about the one ABC, where it has been conservatively estimated that ABC Enterprise products produced from radio programs by the Children's Unit in South Australia has generated over $660,000 income for the ABC. Further income was generated through the sale of episodes of Tickle Pot and five children's radio serials to the BBC and a tremendous potential to continue to raise funds for the ABC. There is much more that could be said about this saga. The ABC intransigent management has, have refused to bow to public and press criticism over the axing of Tickle Pot. It seems that the decisions and actions of only a couple of managers can impose their view and ignore the views of children, parents, politicians, the press and over 1,300 people who signed petitions calling for the ABC to re-establish children's radio. If David Hill is genuinely interested in the welfare of children, besides campaigning against the effect of tobacco advertising on children, why does he not divert some of his energies into re-establishing children's radio to ensure that the ABC radio will always have a future audience. If David Hill continues to allow the ABC to discriminate against children by not providing them with their own radio programs, then he has failed in his responsibilities as a managing director. I recall when the ABC received its budget this year, the Minister for Transport and Communications, Mr Beasley, said that the ABC would be free to apply the efficiency dividend to prog programming expansion and improvement. If the ABC is to use this money in program expansion, then there is no reason why the ABC can't reintroduce children's programs. In summary, Mr Acting Deputy President, in raising this issue today, I only hope the ABC will not continue to put up a smokescreen of excuses, but will take immediate and positive steps to provide children with their own radio programs. After all, the ABC is, is on a winner with its program, was on a winner with its program in the first place. The ABC still employs the talented staff associated with Children's Radio and could easily return its now idle production studios in Adelaide into the worthwhile task of producing children's radio programmes. Uh, Senator Alston, I presume this is a birthday speech, isn't it? <laughs> well, I'll uh, try and uh, celebrate some other matters, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, the first matter I'd like to address is to uh, associate myself with remarks made uh, late last night by Senator Tamling in relation to NADU. The Northern Australia Development Unit. Uh, I had the uh, pleasure of visiting the uh, unit uh, within the last 12 months, and uh, I was very impressed with the quality of work produced by the unit, and indeed I think uh, unique in many respects, certainly not able to be readily uh, achieved by the Department of Social Security in Canberra or indeed uh, in the other capital cities, and for that very reason the unit was established in uh, Darwin and allowed to prosper for, as it would seem, only a brief period of time. And what concerns me most of all about the recent government announcement is that uh, this is nothing more than a transparent election marginal seat strategy dressed up as a social justice strategy uh, designed to simply uh, take the unit to pieces, to transfer it into the Department of um, Prime Minister and Cabinet and to uh, completely abolish all those uh, researchers who have been, uh, I think, producing very high quality outcomes. And uh, that is a, a great disappointment. Uh, it's yet another example of uh, what Senator Richardson does when he's uh, confronted with a choice between uh, policies and politics and, uh, as a result, will uh, presumably only get uh, broad statements made about uh, the benefits to Northern Australia that can flow from uh, Senator Richardson's largesse, rather than uh, considered thought-provoking reports, which at times have been at odds with the department, but from my discussions with them have been uh, within the bounds of tolerance, and therefore one can only 
describe this outcome as uh, politically motivated. Um, can I now turn to another matter which I view even more seriously, and that is the um, establishment of an interim national child care accreditation council. Senator Tate may have had uh, some involvement in this, and if he has, uh, no. All right, well, brief. Yes. Well, you'll be aware, Senator, that um, uh, it's been on the government's agenda since the last election to establish an accreditation system as part of the trade-off with the ACTU for allowing fee relief to be extended to the private sector. And no bones were made about that. The ACTU was always bitterly opposed to uh, fee relief to the commercial sector, and uh, this was part of the deal. Now, there has never been any justification provided for accreditation, given that you have regulations operating in each state. Uh, sometimes they vary, depending upon uh, the, the uh, level of staff-child uh, ratios, for example. It can uh, make a considerable difference. But no one would argue that uh, you can't rationalise the system via ministerial councils and the like, or indeed that uh, there is necessarily a, a need to have uh, uniformity throughout the system. Accreditation is, I think, simply uh, uh, the ultimate self-indulgence, and uh, I've been critical of it from the outset, and uh, I had, I think, been very pleased when Senator Tate in uh, the Estimates Committee towards the end of last year finally delinked accreditation from uh, the extension of fee relief to the private sector, and uh, there was some confidence that uh, maybe the government would rethink its approach to accreditation. Well, it hasn't. It's gone even further, and it's established what is really a travesty of community involvement, community representation. I mean, we all accept in this place that uh, you shouldn't make policies in isolation from the community; that you should get out there and consult. And when there's a need to establish an advisory group, that it makes good sense to appoint people from the community who have some direct experience of the issues. But what we have here is nothing more or less than a charade. Seventeen people who have been appointed to an interim accreditation council, of whom two have any, any direct experience in dealing with children. The rest are theorists or unions, unionists. And uh, it is quite clear that this is nothing more or less than an attempt to justify dramatic increases in terms and conditions and entitlements for childcare workers uh, and to pander to the self-delusions of the early childhood lobby who consistently fail to come up with any credible research to demonstrate that uh, you can uh, show a difference in terms of quality outcomes between children who have had the privilege of uh, having access to formal childcare as opposed to those who have not. And the fact is, of course, that less than 10 per cent of children under the age of 12 are actually able to be placed in uh, formal childcare centres, including family daycare. Uh, quite often it's got a lot to do with uh, the cost of the service, but uh, the fact remains that it is a small and relatively privileged group that uh, this sort of uh, outfit wants to extend to the wider community. Uh, it's almost an ideological obsession. You get such comments uh, said with a straight face that childcare is too important to be left to parents. Well, now we're told by uh, the likes of the people who are on this committee that uh, you can't put a price on quality. Well, that is an absolute disaster in policy terms. Not only that, but it's an insult to uh, the parents who are abysmally unrepresented on this uh, committee and the consumers who have virtually no say at all. Certainly the taxpayers' interests are almost totally neglected. So we have, uh, with a couple of honourable exceptions, uh, uh, the Australian Federation of Child Care is represented, the Australian Federation of Child Care Associations, Federation of Parents of Children in Day Care are represented. Apart from those, uh, the rest consists of simply a parade of vested interests. Um, Anne Black, for example, ACTU child care officer, is there on this basis, that she worked as a nurse before becoming active in the union movement, she became concerned with childcare following the birth of her own children. Now, that can be said about uh, almost every parent in Australia, I would have thought. And yet, uh, not only do we find the ACTU childcare officer on board, and clearly her charter in representing her members is to boost terms and conditions of employment, but uh, we have someone who's uh, put forward as a ministerial nominee by the Lady Gary Childcare Centre in Melbourne, but is in fact 
the immediate past ACTU child care policy officer. So uh, it's quite clear that this is uh, not only one-sided representation, but almost exclusively designed to serve the interests of uh, uh, those who stand to gain from um, working in the industry or stand to gain from pontificating about it. And I find it uh, very disappointing in the extreme, not only because uh, it won't be addressing issues of affordability, which is absolutely paramount in, in uh, providing access to childcare services, but it won't even address the, the real issues of quality. It pretends, based on uh, US experience, which I would have thought uh, makes it very clear that you just can't identify quality because it's such a subjective concept, that uh, the best way to go uh, is that you set minimum standards. That's what the state regulations do by and large. You have inspectors to ensure that they're enforced. Uh, you can have random visits. You can have uh, whistleblowers. You can have a whole range of people to ensure that uh, children aren't neglected, that the childcare workers are carrying out their duties, and uh, that there is no exploitation in the system. And by and large, there are very few complaints. But yet we have this persistent push to somehow jack up the rates, because that's what it's all about, uh, to go on arguing for over-award payments, uh, over-staffing of centres. I mean, there are some absolutely scandalous examples of uh, the, the unnecessary employment of people in childcare centres, uh, almost always community-based centres. I mean, this is a recession-proof industry. Whilst every other small business in the country is either going broke or is on the verge and having to cut back and doing that in terms of uh, labour, unfortunately, the car care sector just pretends that somehow uh, labour is sacrosanct, that you simply can't address your cost structures and puts out its hand for uh, more government assistance. And this sort of uh, charade is just going to perpetuate that problem. One million dollars was set aside in the last budget to fund a totally unnecessary accreditation system. Now we're told from the Wangman report, which the government studiously refuses to release to the public because it's obviously terrified that it will be taken to pieces, that uh, it's going to cost one million in the first year alone and in year two probably up to three million dollars. All this to fund trips around Australia by 17 self-indulgent pontificators. They're not going to achieve a single thing. What they hope to do ultimately is to have uh, groups visiting childcare centres and giving them ticks, giving them uh, star ratings in effect. Now, you don't have to be too smart to realise that if you go there on a good day you can make a judgement that will be totally irrelevant if you go back a few weeks later and there's been staff turnover or a different attitude on the part of the director, uh, turnover of uh, the quality of uh, or the types of parents using the service. In other words, it's a self-perpetuating indulgence because you'll constantly need to be doing the rounds and uh, spending as much money as you can totally unnecessarily. When the, if there's money to spare in the system, it ought to be going to ensuring that parents have access to affordable and uh, good quality childcare as measured by the regulations. And yet uh, this sort of council is no doubt going to be pushing for the sort of staff-child ratios that prevail in the smaller states. And uh, if you are to bring Victoria and New South Wales into line with those states, it's going to cost something of the order of another $100 million. Now there's not a scintilla of evidence to demonstrate that children are better off between the ages of uh, three and five if they have uh, ratios of uh, five to one rather than 15 to one. Uh, there is absolutely no evidence that uh, those sorts of outcomes will result. And I challenge this committee to do something worthwhile, to not simply travel around Australia and waste taxpayers' funds on trying to persuade others that they ought to boost wages and conditions. I challenge it to do some sensible research, to commission it, to demonstrate that uh, you can measure the quality of childcare by outcomes and not inputs. Because if you keep on going down this uh, cul-de-sac, all you will succeed in doing is putting childcare beyond the reach of uh, the very parents that they pretend profess to be concerned about. I think it's nothing more than, uh, than a disaster that uh, there is no sensible um, consumer representation, that the interests of parents are almost totally neglected and uh, that this is simply going to serve uh, the interests of uh, a very small clique. And I hope that uh, 
the minister staples, will come to his senses, will realise that this is uh, an extravagant waste of public resources and there are much better ways of assisting uh, parents in uh, getting access to childcare services in this country. Senator Campbell. Mr oh, Acting Deputy President, I wanted to refer my remarks in this matter of public interest debate uh, to the administration of the Insurance and Superannuation Commission. I did make some remarks last week in relation to the Superannuation Commission's report, but uh, I wanted to just cover a few more issues which are upsetting particularly taxpayers and uh, people who need to deal with the Insurance and Superannuation Commission uh, in the outlying states, particularly in Tasmania, Western Australia and Queensland. I have been uh, receiving a number of uh, constituency inquiries uh, relating to this over the last six or eight months. They seem to get more and more terse as time goes by, and it is well and truly time that the, this parliament turned its attention towards solving the administration and resource problems of the Insurance and Superannuation Commission. I believe that with the select committee that Senator Sherry has, uh, is the chairman of, uh, which is looking into superannuation, we do perhaps have a vehicle that could look into the Insurance and Superannuation Commission administration problems. And I'll be having a look at the circular that Senator Sherry provided to honourable senators earlier this week, uh, which outlined the terms of reference of that inquiry, to see whether or not uh, they cover the matters I raised today, or whether those terms of reference may need to be widened or expanded uh, to look into this matter. But to be more specific about some of the problems which uh, confront taxpayers, particularly in Western Australia, in relation to the ISC, uh, firstly there is the matter that there is no representative of the ISC in Western Australia. and So my constituents have to uh, try to phone through to the ISC in uh, Melbourne and on many occasions, and I've certainly tried myself just to see if these constituents are uh, being fair dinkum, it is impossible to get through for hours and hours, if not days at a time. It is a terrible, terrible service. And this matter of trying to get through to the ISC to try and get information about reasonable benefits limits, to get information about interim determinations and determinations on superannuation, um, was raised at the Estimates Committee by Senator Watson from Tasmania. And uh, the ISC, in summary, there said that they were severely under resourced, that their telephone switchboard was just not able to cope with the load. They reported in the estimates how many calls they took per day, which was an enormous number, and one could only assume that for every call that got through, there's probably five or ten that didn't get through. The important thing about this and the sad thing is that people under this new system where the ISC uh, has taken control of this uh, reasonable benefits limit and uh, determinations and interim determinations on superannuation away from the tax office is that the maladministration and what seems to be an under-resourcing of this commission is leaving people without the information they require to make sensible decisions about their own provision for superannuation. And one of the cases I referred to last week uh, showed that that particular constituent of mine had lost in the order of tens of thousands of dollars because he had been given wrong advice as to when to resign from his position. Now, that's one particular case, and a sad case, which is going to cost that person a lot of, or has cost that person a lot of money, and cost his family uh, a lifestyle they should have uh, been able to enjoy. And there's probably many, many other cases similar to that. So that's the first point I made. I make that is the access of the Australian taxpayer to this service, which they should have access to. Clearly, uh, there is a need to have offices of the ISC in each of the states, in each of the capital cities. Of course, that's a resourcing question. And of course, a matter the government should look at, and which I would ask it to, to do so. The other matter uh, in relation to service is that uh, the particular uh, chartered accountant who's written to me on this matter, a uh, company called MF Abbott Cooper and Company, who, who've also written to uh, Mr. Free, the minister assisting the treasurer, um, and asked him to do something about it, is that they have written many, many letters um, and have only received one reply in the past 12 months. Uh, on, in relation to some of these questions. They have also seem to not have any policy in relation to the standing of tax agents who uh, make submissions or write letters on behalf of clients to the ISC. Apparently there is no uh, procedure to recognise tax agents as being able to deal with the Commission, which of course is the procedure when people are dealing with the tax office. The other matter um, is that uh, one of this uh, 
company's clients uh, had received six different determinations in the past year, all of which have been totally incorrect. So, in other words, they are being overburdened by work. The value of their work, the quality of their work, and the, the uh, accuracy of their determinations are very, very uh, questionable. If there's six determinations and not one of them was correct, you really wonder how many people around Australia are getting incorrect determinations. And uh, lastly, uh, another specific example is that uh, this particular accountancy practice had received, sorry, had had sought on behalf of its clients something like 41 <coughs> determinations in the past six or so months, and out of those 41 determinations, only one of them were correct. All of the others required alterations. And of course, as soon as you get an incorrect determination, you've got to go back through the process of trying to get through on the phone, trying to get letters responded to. And it really seems to me, uh, from these constituent uh, queries that I've been getting, that we have on our hands a disastrous administration of this Insurance and Superannuation Commission. It seems to be under-resourced. It seems to be badly administered. It is something that I think the government should give close attention to if they're not doing so already. Clearly, they're distracted at the moment with uh, considerations here on Capitol Hill. But once they get those out of the way, once we find out who the new Treasurer and Prime Minister and Minister assisting the Prime Minister, I think this is one of the first matters that the, uh, the new Labor government should uh, <laughs> let's hope it's not a new Minister for Justice, uh, Senator Tate, but um, you can't always back the right horse. But um, this is a, is a serious matter. It's something that I will seek on behalf of my constituents to have she Senator Sherry's committee spend some time on. But through Senator Tate, I would ask uh, his government to have a close look at what is a problem which I'm sure is uh, being channeled through to many senators and members' offices and ask them to resolve this as quickly as possible because these taxpayers pay their taxes to get the sort of service that they deserve from these commissions. And clearly, if you have to mess around for six or eight or ten months to get a wrong determination, then mess around for longer to get a correct determination. In the meantime, you can't put your tax return in and comply with the tax laws. We have a disaster on our hands. So I, I urge the government to take some action to solve the problems in relation to this matter. Minister. To uh, Acting Deputy President, I move that the Senate do now adjourn until 2 p.m. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. And say no. I think the ayes have it. The Senate stands adjourned until 2 p.m. this afternoon. Questions without notice, the Leader of the Opposition, Senator Hill.
Um, Mr. President, my question is directed to Senator Button, the Leader of the Government in the Senate, at least for this afternoon. And I, I refer the Minister to the imminent ballot for the leadership of the Labor Party and the Prime Minister of Australia. And I ask, wouldn't, wouldn't want to vote. What, adva what advantages would there be for Australia in the election of the architect of the recession, Mr Keating? And in the, and in the event of Mr Keating's success, what transitional arrangements have been made to govern this country, particularly bearing in mind the plight of almost one million unemployed Australians? The Leader of the Government, Senator Button. President, ever since I've been uh, here with this opposition, they always ask a question. Um, thank you, Senator. What was that? They, they, uh, they always ask questions about, uh, uh, you know, what are the budget forecasts for next year, and uh, what's going to happen next month, and what's going to happen. Well, my position on all these things has always been that the government will do what is necessary and announce it at, announce it at the and announce any and announce any decisions which it makes. Order. Announce any decision which it makes at an appropriate time. That will follow in respect of Senator Hill's question as well as anything, anything else he asks. Senator West. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is directed to Senator Tate, representing the Minister for Health, Housing and Community Services. And I ask what is the government's response to a recent attack by the HCF in a letter to contributors? on the National Health Strategies Papers Issues Paper No. 2, Hospital Services in Australia, Access and Financing, and the push by HCF for tax rebates for private health insurance contributions. Minister representing the Minister for Community Services and Health, Senator Tate. Mr President, the minister to whom you refer has of course seen a copy of uh, HCF's recent health report and the accompanying letter to contributors. And to be quite frank, Mr. Uh, President, it's a travesty of uh, misrepresentation. It, it uh, misrepresents all the options being presented for public discussion in that particular issue's paper referred to by Senator West. All options which are discussed in that paper aim to extend the overall level of choice available to hospital patients. The question of choice is uh, absolutely paramount. The importance of patients being able to choose their own doctor is emphasised by the National Health Strategy. And all options presented enhance choice in this regard, and that is exactly what you would anticipate. It is therefore a blatant misrepresentation for HCF to claim, and I use their words, that if this strategy were adopted, Canberra could decide not only which doctor would treat you, where you could be treated and when, but even whether you would be treated at all. Now that's just scaremongering, that's just, uh, as I say, blatant misrepresentation, and uh, no credit uh, attaches to HCF for the publication of this misrepresentation. What has been put together in issues paper number two are simply options. They have been presented for public debate and any assertions with respect to future government policy are therefore of course highly premature. HCF's actions simply amount to a cynical attempt to scare people into taking out private health insurance. By pushing the concept of government subsidy through tax rebates, HCF is attempting to further subvert sensible public debate on the options in order to protect its own vested interests in the current arrangements. Senator Panizza. President, my question without notice is for Senator Button representing the Prime Minister. I refer the Minister to the call by the Minister for Trade, Mr Blewett, to the Prime Minister to contact European leaders requesting that they strengthen their resolve on the Uruguay round of talks. I ask the Minister, can he assure the Senate that the Order. government will not accept a Uruguay round outcome that does not give real and substantial reduction in agricultural protection? Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Button. Mr. President, the uh, Uruguay round negotiations have reached a uh, uh, very uh, sensitive and uh, important stage with uh, uh, major discussions and uh, possible conclusions, hopefully, uh, being reached at uh, meetings tomorrow. Um, Senator, you ask in the second part of the question will the government? decline to accept an unfavourable outcome for the Uruguay round. If I might say so, though this government has been diligent in pursuing the Uruguay round, particularly in the interests of the uh, primary producers of this country and levels of agricultural subsidy and protection, though we have been diligent in that, uh, I must say that the question suggests a misunderstanding 
of Australia's position. We've been diligent in doing that through the Cairns Group, for example. But uh, the outcome of the Uruguay round, uh, uh, whatever it is, uh, I, I can't myself see any point in saying uh, we will not accept it. Uh, uh, Australia is not quite in the position of saying we'll accept this or we will not accept that. Uh, simply because, as you know, Senator Beniza, the vice, the great vice in, uh, in the uh, agricultural trade throughout the world is subsidies in Europe and North America. And the essential negotiations, of course, uh, involve an agreement between Europe and North America in relation to subsidies, to a lesser extent Japan in relation to subsidies on, uh, or, or protection of agricultural products such as rice. So uh, I think it is proper to say, Senator, that though we as a government have done everything that is available to us and will continue to do so, it is not a question in the totality of the Uruguay round of uh, saying Australia will accept this or Australia won't accept that. If the outcome of tomorrow's discussions and the next few weeks' discussions is unsatisfactory, then of course the Australian government will pursue further, uh, further talks. If that's the intention of your question, uh, that's, uh, that's an undertaking which I can give you. Uh, Senator Zakharov. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is addressed to Senator Ray, representing the Minister of Foreign Affairs. Can the Minister advise the Senator the outcome of the third review conference of the Biological Weapons Convention, which was held in Geneva during September? The Minister representing the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Ray. Oh, Mr. President, uh, the recent third review conference of the Biological Weapons Convention made very real progress towards uh, strengthening the treaty. It was a conference in which I'm happy to say Australia played a prominent part. The BWC is a major multilateral disarmament agreement concluded in 1972 to outlaw biological weapons. Membership of uh, BWC now totals 118 countries, including Australia, while a further 21 countries have signed the convention but not yet ratified it. The major measures agreed by the conference to strengthen the treaty included agreement to the establishment of an ad hoc group of government experts to examine verification mechanisms. The group will meet for the first time in March-April 1992 and report to the state's parties by the end of 1993. Clarification that the scope of the convention included biological agents relevant to plants, animals, not just human beings. Mr. President, there was agreement on additional confidence-building confidence measures as well as reaffirmation of existing uh, confidence-building measures. New measures agreed included the declaration of past biological weapons research and development programs, both offensive and defensive, and the declaration of human vaccine production facilities. At the conference, Australia played a leading role in forging agreement that any transfers of, rel of relevance to the BWC should only be authorised when the intended use is for the purposes not prohibited under the Convention, and working successfully to have the conference call on developed countries to adopt positive measures to promote technological transfers to the developed world. Uh, in conclusion, uh, Mr. Uh, President, this group, there was a group, uh, the, the group is an informal alliance of 22 Western countries looking at this issue, formed by Australia in the mid-1980s, which introduced controls on the export of chemicals which had potential use in the manufacturing of chemical weapons. The group meets regularly under Australia's chairmanship to discuss chemical and biological weapons issues and to harmonise uh, and review export controls. Senator Kernow. My question is to Senator Collins, as Minister for Aviation. And I refer to the various press reports concerning the apparently precarious financial position of Compass Airlines. I ask the Minister to explain to the Senate and to the tens of thousands of Australian families who have prepaid their airfares for travel over the Christmas period. How many passengers are involved? Has the matter of a financial bailout of Compass Airlines been discussed between the government and Compass? What is the government's position in relation to bailing out Compass or any other airline? And finally, given that the government and the opposition have created the deregulated aviation environment, which will allow airlines to fail at massive costs to the Australian economy, isn't the predicament of Compass Airlines and its passengers simply the inevitable outcome of deregulation in a very small market? The Minister for Shipping and Aviation supports Senator Collins. Mr. President, uh, 
If I could uh, take the three parts of um, Senator Curnow's question uh, first before I just make a general uh, statement about the current situation. Um, in respect of the first part of the question, that is how many, um, Compass Management have advised me that uh, there are approximately 125,000 passengers who have prepaid bookings with Compass over the next six weeks and the majority of those are return bookings, in other words, Christmas travel. Yes, it is uh, true that uh, we had a meeting with Compass Airlines uh, who put uh, some requests to the government. Um, I don't think it's relevant, actually, uh, nor I think is it proper for Compass, which is a private company, to discuss the details of that meeting. But I certainly have no hesitation in saying that the government uh, will not be uh, pre-purchasing uh, significant blocks of uh, of prepaid tickets from any airline, uh, nor will it be providing uh, personal loans to any airline. I mean, we deregulated airlines deliberately uh, to, uh, in fact, uh, remove ourselves from that situation. In respect to the last part of Senator Curnow's uh, answer, senators may or may not have noticed, uh, but I have been taking a consistently cautious line on deregulation precisely for the reason that Senator Curnow advanced. That is the very small size of the Australian market. Senators would know in here that I have been saying this in question time now for months, and in fact I think I can probably find it, uh, only a week or so ago, when attacking the opposition's ridiculous uh, aviation policy in its GST package, which, which can I remind, which can I remind honourable senators, Mr. President, involved dumping large numbers of international flight seats and reducing prices. I did indicate that you could not possibly get prices any lower than they were at the moment, and I was seriously concerned, and I've been saying this for six months, about the depth of the discounting that was being offered by the airlines, because they were in fact offering seats for significantly less than it was costing them to produce them. But can I just say that is absolutely a matter for the commercial judgment of the airlines concerned. Now, last night, Compass Airlines were in dispute with the owners of their aircraft. That dispute regrettably resulted in delays in the departure of some Compass flights. It potentially involved uh, the uh, stranding of a very large number of passengers, particularly at Sydney and Melbourne airports. Fortunately, that was averted uh, last night by discussions between the airline and representatives of the owners of the aircraft, and Compass have advised me that all passengers were carried last night. Uh, I might add, Mr President, that we stood ready last night through the manage FAC management at the airports to have provided emergency assistance in the form of food and, uh, and assistance with, uh, with sleeping arrangements and so on for passengers uh, should it have been required. Uh, fortunately, it wasn't. As I've said, Compass is a private company. The responsibility for its operations and, in particular, the responsibility for its passengers uh, reside uh, properly with Compass. But we are, uh, of course, obviously concerned about these uh, events and we're closely monitoring the situation. And if I could just conclude, Mr President, by advising the Senate of the most recent developments with Compass, because I think it's important that people know this. A, uh, an officer of Compass Airlines, uh, the assistant uh, manager, customer, vice president of customer services, said on Perth Radio this morning, and I quote, the situation is that we are taking bookings and ticketing people today and tomorrow. Beyond that, we are not ticketing people, but we are taking bookings. That has been put out to all our staff, and, that are the, and they are the instructions under which our, all our staff are operating on. And the last advice I have, Mr President, is that legal action commenced this afternoon in the federal court in Sydney at 12.30. Uh, the matter has been adjourned uh, for further consideration by the court at 9.30 on Monday morning next. Senator Schott. Supplementary, Senator Kerner. Uh, thank the minister for his answer, but uh, I just want to address the last part of my question and ask you what could be the long-term cost of, of this failure in terms of how much has Compass borrowed both onshore and offshore to set themselves up in the first instance, because we end up paying for that in the long term. Minister, Senator Collins. Mr President, as I've already explained, uh, uh, first of all, that Compass is a private company and it is entitled uh, to work out its, uh, its affairs in a commercial manner. I can't answer that question. And might I also say, Mr President, um, the, the company currently is in a legal dispute with the owners of the aircraft. Um, that matter is currently being uh, adjudicated in the courts, and as I've said, uh, the, uh, the hearing has been uh, now listed uh, for 9.30 Monday morning. Senator Schott. Thank you, Mr President. My question uh, is to Senator Ray, uh, representing the Minister for Foreign Affairs. 
Since the end of the 30-year war between Eritrea and Ethiopia in May of this year, can the Minister provide details on what assistance Australia is providing to Eritrea? And can the Minister also provide details on the prospects for a plebiscite in Eritrea to determine its future status? Minister representing the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator uh, Thanks, Senator Schott, for his question. Uh, you know how to spell my name when I'm chasing the Nobel Prize later on, don't you? <laughs> uh, Mr. Uh, Mr President, uh, I did have minor notice of this particular uh, question uh, from Senator Schott. And may I say, in response uh, to the suffering experienced throughout Ethiopia as a result of the famine and civil war, Australia provided significant refugee relief and emergency assistance package in 1991. This included assistance amounting to $3.8 million for Eritrea. Even though the fighting has ended, the suffering continues. With this in mind, consideration has currently been given to a similar package of assistance for 91-92, which will be made up of Australian source food aid and funding for the airlifting of relief food, ag agricultural rehabilitation and health services. Assistance will continue to be challenged through Australian NGOs. Uh, provision has been made in the 91-92 uh, country program budget for a contribution of $270,000 for an eye lens factory to be established near Eritrea. Some additional assistance for this factory is envisaged. It is also expected that a small number of in, in, in Australia training awards will be made available to Eritrea in 91-92. Following the fall of the Mengistu government in June of this year, the Eritrean People's Liberation Front established a provisional government in Eritrea. It is subsequently agreed between the transitional government of Ethiopia and the provisional government of Eritrea that a, re a referendum on the future relationship between those two countries would be held within two years. There is no firm date yet being set for that referendum. The Australian government is not aware of any plans by the provisional government of Eritrea to hold in any elections in advance of that referendum. Senator Niles. Mr. President, my question is to the minister representing the Minister for Health. Why has the uh, Health Insurance Commission seen fit to further waste taxpayers' money by sending a kit listing the new schedules of fees to each individual doctor in Australia and to every one of their locations of practice? What was the cost of this gross and unnecessary exercise? Why did the Health Insurance Commission send 10 or 20 books Order. to each practice? And is, it, is uh, waste such as this the reason why the co-payment was introduced in the first place? And now, having wasted the money, is the government, led by either Mr Hawke or Mr Keating, now going to remove the co-payment? Minister representing the Minister for Community Services and Health, Senator Tate. Mr uh, President, I don't have any particular knowledge of the kit that apparently has been distributed to uh, doctors and uh, those who uh, require to know the schedule of, uh, of benefits. I take it you're talking about the Medicare benefit schedule, Senator. Uh, but of course it's extremely important and has been a subject of comment uh, in this chamber from time to time that this sort of information be made available in a readily accessible and uh, an easily uh, readable form for practices as soon as is possible. And there have been complaints from time to time in this chamber where that information has not been made available. But, Senator, of course, the opposition will overcome any problem about having to notify doctors and uh, GP surgeries and uh, health care providers of, uh, of the Medicare schedules, because all you'll have to do is rely on the AMA to circulate their schedules, because that will become the benchmark, that will become the fee which every person who enters a doctor's surgery in Australia for primary health care will have to pay, because of the deal that you have engineered between the AMA and the private health funds, so that, uh, through insurance, Australians, when they present themselves at a surgery for a consultation, will have to uh, provide the fee charged by the AMA, $31 Order. per consultation. That's what you have in mind. So, Senator, you'll simply have to rely on the AMA, of course, to distribute the schedule. That'll be your answer. Supple as to co-payments, as to co-payments, or co-payment, you see, Senator, you made the error, of course, of speaking about a co-payment. There are, in fact, two co-payments, two co-payments, depending on whether the GP bulk bills or not. What you are going to do, as disciples of choice, of course, is forbid, is to forbid, not permit, a GP to bulk bill his patients unless, of course, they're uh, pensioners or cardholders. You're going to take away that choice from uh, GPs. You're going to say they're not allowed to bulk bill Australians as they present themselves for uh, consultation at their uh, surgeries. 
you're going to take away that choice. So uh, you've even got your uh, question, the premises of your question wrong, Senator. There are in fact two co-payments depending on bulk billing. And that is a choice which many doctors want to continue to make, and you're going to forbid them from making that choice. Senator Null, supplementary. supplementary. Mr President, can I now ask the minister to answer the question which is what was the cost of sending this information to every doctor at every surgery that they have, and in some cases sending 20, 10 or 20 books to each practice? And why was it done? But more importantly, what was the cost? Mr. Mr. President, I'm quite happy to find out what the cost was, but the cost of providing this sort of information would uh, be a part, obviously, of uh, providing necessary information to doctors in their practice. That is, a, that is a cost which doctors would expect to be undertaken by government in the provision of this very important information. Senator Maguire. Thank you, Mr. President. My question without notice is to Senator Peter Cook, the Minister for Industrial Relations. I refer to my question without notice on the 9th of September last on the uh, New Zealand shearers working in the Australian wool industry. I ask the minister, is he aware of continuing concerns being expressed uh, regarding the employment of New Zealand shearers in the Australian wool industry? And uh, what was the outcome of the proposed random, inspe uh, random inspections referred to in the answer of the 9th of September to ensure the conditions of the federal shearing award are properly observed? The Minister for Industrial Relations, Senator Cook. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President. Senator Maguire is, uh, is referring to a practice uh, apparently promoted by the NFF to employ shearers on uh, false uh, contracts or contrived contracts below, below the, uh, the legal rate of the shearing award. And it appears that the uh, shearers that are being uh, used in this circumstance are recruited not uh, from Australia but from New Zealand, uh, which of course is uh, these days a third world economy. But they're being used illegally to break down the living standards of Australian shearers and coincidentally to, uh, to afflict considerable damage on the rural economies in some country towns where shearers are a uh, reasonable percentage of the population. But the, uh, uh, Senator Maguire asks what has uh, happened uh, within uh, my department to uh, deal with this problem. And my department advised me that there has been discussions uh, between the Australian Workers' Union, the Shearing Contractors' Association, uh, my office has been represented in uh, these talks and the Department uh, of Industrial Relations. In order to identify who the potential uh, or uh, suspected offenders are and to establish a strategy to apprehend them and prosecute them, prosecute them for Order. breach of a lawful award, Order. Senator, the, uh, the awards management branch of uh, my department would be the responsible one. It will conduct random sweeps in the areas where it is believed these shearers are employed, ensure compliance with the lawful terms of the award, and it will uh, commence uh, Senator Maguire uh, uh, reasonably shortly. Uh, in the discussions that uh, we have had, too, other questions have, have been raised which affect other ministers. For example, questions of taxation evasion and the questions of social security fraud have been raised as well. I am writing to my colleague, the Minister for Social Security, about the social security aspects of this, and my colleague, the Treasurer, as well, to see what can be done to prevent uh, any derogation from lawful standards in Australia, not only in industrial relations, but social security and tax payment as well. Senator Crane. Thank you, Mr. Uh, President. Uh, my question without notice is to the Minister of Industrial Relations, Senator Cook. Minister, on the 9th of September, 101 days ago, on the 17th of October, 63 days ago, and on the 12th of November, 37 days ago, you said that you were preparing a statement in answer to my accusations that on the 9th, 10th and 11th of September and the 17th of October you misled the Senate when you took an inaccurate brief from your mates in the Siemens Union and attacked the export award-winning Robe River. Yeah. I ask you, Minister, well, ask when question. are you going to have the courage to acknowledge your errors and apologise to the Senate and Robe River? Minister for Industrial Relations, Senator Cook. Order. Senator Cook. Thank you. Uh, well, it may, it may well be that uh, the Senator Winston Crane has a been his bonnet about this matter. I, I repeat once again for the record, although there's no need for me to once more say it, I don't think, that I have not misled the Senate in any way. 
but uh, the two because the two assertions the two assertions that I have made is that Robe River is a rotten employer, and uh, and I still hold that view, and I don't mislead you about the conscientiousness with which I hold that view. Order. And I think it's entirely appropriate for uh, me to be able to make that statement. This government has not shirked the task of identifying rotten unions when they've arisen. We, in fact, moved to deregister the BLF because we thought its activities were beyond the pale. And, uh, and, and we did so. So uh, I think we can say, with, uh, with some degree of, uh, of uh, respect for our position, that when an employer conducts themselves in an antisocial way, they too should not escape condemnation. And the other thing that I have made, upon which uh, I do not mislead the Senate, is that uh, Robe River, in my view, is a vexatious litigant in terms of, uh, of uh, industrial relations law. And the uh, example of that is no better example than the one I've given about where, after several appeals on uh, frivolous and uh, minor matters in the main, not all were frivolous and minor, some were substantial, but on frivolous and minor matters, the wholly owned subsidiary of Robe River, the company employing seamen, then went into voluntary, voluntary liquidation, and now a new company uh, has been, uh, has been uh, created in order to get the contract and thus set at naught all the rights of the employees of the wholly owned subsidiary. I regard that, I regard that, and I mislead you Order. not, I regard it conscientiously as vexatious litig litigation by Robe River in order, in order to avoid dealing with the issue of proper industrial relations in their company. And uh, I am, uh, I am uh, if I might say this, offended by some of the remarks that spokespersons for this company have made about their intentions in the conduct of good industrial relations in this country. This government has been supporting a cooperative approach in the, in the Australian workplace between employers and workers to generate higher productivity. And I have cited in this chamber on several occasions numbers of agreements where that uh, type of them and us, boss worker, employer employee relationship has been broken down and a team approach has been substituted willingly by all. What do Robe River do? Robe River say that unions should be excluded from the workplace. Robe River say, and I have the text of a speech here, that people should come to work every day frightened that they will be fired. That, that, is, that, is, a direct, that is a direct quote from a speech by Order. the chief executive of this company. Order. They should come to work every day frightened that they will be fired. Only then. Only then will they act in the workplace in a responsible manner. I have to say, Mr. President, that is a uh, that is a shocking indictment of the type of attitude yeah, yeah. this authoritarian company has to its uh, its greatest asset, the people that work for it. Senator Reynolds. Thank you, Mr. President. I address my question to the Minister for Justice, Senator Tate. The Minister will be aware of the recognition of the Lotus Glen Correctional Centre by the Human Rights Commission as a Queensland prison administration dedicated to fully implementing the recommendations of the Royal Commission of Inquiry into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody. In view of the tragic death yesterday of the second member of an Aboriginal family to die in custody in Geraldton, can the Minister report on efforts to have all state ministers fully account for their policies in upgrading conditions and personal security for Aboriginal prisoners? Is the Attorney-General's Department initiating any co coordination of a national approach to this responsibility? Minister representing the Attorney-General. Senator Tate. Mr uh, President, it's always, of course, a terrible tragedy when uh, there is a death in custody, whether it is of an Aboriginal or non-Aboriginal Australian. Uh, and in the particular latest instance, of course, I would want to express the sympathy of all those members of the Senate uh, with, uh, for the family of, uh, of the uh, Aboriginal who did die in custody. Uh, that is a matter which uh, I think causes us all to reflect on the way in which uh, Aboriginals and Torres Strait Islanders are represented in our prison cells, uh, police cells, prison populations, out of all proportion to their numbers in the general Australian community. And if me me methods can be found to divert uh, such uh, persons from uh, that type of incarceration, uh, then of course those methods should be pursued most vigorously. And I believe that uh, as a result of the Royal Commission 
into Aboriginal deaths in custody, Mr. President. Uh, those sorts of measures are being undertaken in a very cooperative way by uh, the Commonwealth with the states. And in fact, only a couple of days ago, the Minister for Aboriginal Affairs, Mr. Robert Tickner, was able to announce uh, a, a uh, funding of some six and a half million dollars of various projects submitted by the states with a view to reducing the incidence of such deaths in custody, whether it be simply to do with the design of police cells, as I believe is the New South Wales submission uh, in uh, some outback uh, and provincial uh, cities uh, in, in the design of their police cells, or in relation to the fundamental uh, social and cultural uh, causes of the incarceration of so many uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders in custody. Mr President, I think that uh, Senator Reynolds also adverted to the fact uh, that uh, some of the states—in fact, I think all the states are showing goodwill and good faith in these matters—but uh, already the Human Rights and Equal Opportunity Commission has found it possible to make an award to uh, a prison, I think, near Cairns. Senator, I just, uh, the name escapes me for the moment where, in fact, that particular prison, because of the regime uh, which operates there, which uh, relies on uh, uh, the inmates taking responsibility uh, for much of their own uh, uh, care, uh, that in that situation uh, that is regarded as a model for the way in which uh, such incarceration should occur. And I believe that that particular uh, prison, having received that award from the Human Rights Legal Opportunity Commission, certainly does provide a model, probably not merely for other uh, Australian uh, prisons and police cell situations, but possibly of an international significance. So, Senator, yes, much is happening in, in this uh, field, and one would hope that it can reduce the incidence of deaths in custody. Supplementary, Senator Reynolds. Supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Senator Tate. I wonder, in view of your response, if uh, you could ask the Attorney General uh, if he could report to the Senate on whether his department has responded to the unanimous resol resolution of the Senate last month urging state prison authorities to regard Lotus Glen as a model in implementing Aboriginal culture into its uh, rehabilitation programs, and whether the Attorney-General can report to the Senate on how uh, that intention of the Senate is being implemented. Minister Sandertoe. Well, Mr. President, I'll certainly seek that information uh, from the Attorney General, but I would say uh, it's even more important that uh, the uh, resolution passed by the Senate uh, expressed a view which coincides with the assessment made by the Human Rights Legal Opportunity Commission and led to the award being made, because I believe uh, in that way one has the independent uh, verification outside of government circles of uh, what a worthwhile project that has been and what a model it provides for uh, uh, the situation where Aboriginals or Torres Strait Islanders find themselves either in police cells or uh, prison custody. Senator Watson. My question is directed to Senator Button. His capacity is representing the Treasurer. And I refer to the depreciation changes in the industry statement of 12 March and the lack of supporting legislation for now over nine months. Is not the Minister concerned of problems to corporations balancing on 31 December this year, a balance date in lieu of 30 June? in view of the lack of uh, adequate legislative base. And what steps does the government propose, or what advice can the minister give, for December balancing corporations, which now must make a, an instalment deduction in January 1992? Further, has the minister's department, DITAC, had the opportunity of reviewing such legislation in its draft or final form? And can the Senate be assured that the inconsistencies revealed in the joint Treasury DITAC ministry statement regarding effective life of an asset be removed from this legislation. Minister representing the Treasurer. Senator Button. <coughs> Mr President, I thought Senator Watson might have been kinder to me in the day of the sittings before Christmas than to ask me a question about tax. But uh, it's intelligent, Senator, of you, and uh, I, I will a number of a number of matters in your question. I'll have to direct, uh, of course, to the Treasurer. The legislation, the legislation to which you refer, was introduced into the House of Representatives today. I understand, and uh, that will give you an opportunity to look at it. But insofar as there are some uh, detailed questions uh, directed to me, I'll address those to the Treasurer. Uh, certainly, my department did have uh, some opportunity to uh, have an input into the uh, draft legislation. As soon as, uh, as soon as I get an answer from the Treasurer, I'll give it to you. Senator Bell. Oh, yes, it's 6.30. 6.30. Uh, 
My question is addressed to Senator Cook, the Minister for Industrial Relations. I ask, is the Minister aware that on or about November 14, the Australia Post implemented a set of guidelines for the conduct of surveillance of employees in relation to claims for compensation made under the CERC Act 1988, and that these guidelines were lodged with the Privacy Commission. I ask, were these guidelines drawn up in consultation with Comcare, and if not, why not? If the guidelines were drawn up with the assistance or knowledge of Comcare, are they consistent with any guidelines adopted by Comcare? And if not, what action will the minister now initiate to ensure consistency as required, by, uh, as required under the Commonwealth Compensation and Rehabilitation and Compensation Act? I ask, are the Australia Post guidelines consistent with the operation and intention of the CERC Act? And I ask, does the minister regard the action and conduct of Australia Post in using surveillance practices to gather information to be used against people claiming compensation as legitimate practice consistent with the intention of the CERC Act. Order. The Minister for Industrial Relations, Senator Cook. Could I just point out to honourable senators, I think some of these questions are too long from both sides. Senator Cook. Thank you, uh, Mr President. I agree. It's too long. And uh, if there were fewer questions, I'd answer them more quickly. <laughs> Can I, can, I, can I also uh, say I, uh, I thank Senator Bell for giving me notice of this question, but then not asking it, asking a slightly different one. The, uh, the, uh, the <laughs> I, am aware, I am aware of, uh, Mr. President, of guidelines for surveillance uh, in Australia Post and Telecom, and I'm, I'm aware that the guidelines used by both those uh, uh, enterprises and the guidelines used by Comcare itself have been developed in consultation with the Privacy Commissioner. Uh, that was referred to in one of, the, uh, one of the questions asked. The second round of consultative processes I am advised with the Privacy Commissioner uh, has been completed recently. The guidelines specific to uh, Australia Post and Telecom include provisions in relation to a code of ethics applicable to investigators, and might I say that I am, a, I am advised uh, in the general field of workers' compensation investigation, that there is a code of ethics for private investigators used by insurance companies uh, in that uh, area in order to see that the ethical behaviour in investigations is properly observed. But this, uh, these guidelines for uh, Australia Post and Telecom have an inbuilt code of ethics for investigators that ensure confidentiality of information, ensure physical security of relevant records and the physical destruction of those records once the particular matter under investigation has been resolved. With regard to Comcare, the guidelines contain the same provisions as those for Australia Post and Telecom. I am advised that the current practice is that surveillance is only used in the most limited of circumstances and then only with the express agreement of Comcare's chief executive officer or deputy chief executive officer. Can I say, uh, Mr President, that uh, in the field of workers' compensation investigation, uh, it is, uh, I think, a very sensitive matter, the way in which um, investigations are conducted. To my personal knowledge, I do know of cases in the private sector where I think there have been uh, techniques of investigation used which abuse the privacy of the individual and, in fact, uh, entrapment uh, of the individual as well, and uh, I think that, uh, or attempted entrapment. Which, uh, and, and the extraction of, uh, of statements uh, when a worker is in, in, in an injured state or in a state of shock recovering from an immediate incident giving rise to an injury. And all of those are deplorable. Uh, from a government point of view, uh, however, we, we take the view that uh, it is uh, naive and, uh, and wrong to assume that in every case there ought not be uh, uh, in, in, that every case is somehow uh, not worthy of fuller investigation. Some cases are because the sad truth is some people do in fact try and manipulate workers' compensation. Nowhere near the number that is often pretended to be the case, but uh, there is a small element that that is, uh, that that is true of and, then, and we need to safeguard against that. But as a general rule, as a general rule uh, uh, surveillance is not, is not availed of and uh, where it is, in that minority of cases, I think the proper safeguards are in place to ensure it's done appropriately. Senator Perra. 
Thank you, Mr. President. My question without notice is directed to Senator Button, the Minister representing the Prime Minister and the Treasurer. As Australia continues to wallow in the recession we had to have, with unemployment at its worst level for 60 years, what hope can the Minister give the one million jobless plus the emerging school leavers for their prospects over the next 12 months? Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Button. Well, Mr. President, that is, that is of course, a, uh, uh, another attempt to uh, derive emotional and, uh, emotional, emotional and political benefits. Emotional and political benefits. It's a cheapskate question. Uh, it, 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 it is a uh, point of the, order. The minister is reflecting upon the motive, and quite improperly so, of the senator who asked the question. It should be asked to withdraw. Yeah, yeah. Senator Parra, if you had if you, if, 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 if been sitting here as you have been day after day, you would know that we have a serious and tragic unemployment problem in this country. Serious and tragic. Yes. And, and you, you before Christmas, seeking to derive, to derive as much as political comfort as you can from that situation. Get up and ask the point of order. I ruled on the point of order. I said there wasn't a point of order. Send a button. You get up and ask that question in this circumstance. Now, <clears throat> I'll, let, me, let me give you this answer, because if you're going to ask political questions, you'll get political answers. And the political answer to this is this, <clears throat> that, <clears throat> that in terms of this Christmas, the outlook for many people is very sad and difficult. In terms of in terms of, in terms of Christmas 1992, Order. in terms of Christmas 1992, the outlook will be better. If you get in, if you lot get into power in 93, in terms of Christmas 93, the outlook will be worse and worse and worse. And that is admitted by your leader, Dr. Houston, has, who has more intellectual honesty than the rest of you put together, because Dr. Houston has admitted that if your so-called package was introduced, unemployment would get worse. He's admitted that. And that's a, that's, that's, a, that's a political reality which you people have to front up to, instead of asking these uh, pathetic questions, trying to derive some comfort Order. from the situation before Christmas. Supplementary question. Supplementary. Senator Perra. I note, uh, Mr President, the uh, Minister's answer that the outlook will be better. And I ask him, what is the difference between the failed policies and strategies which brought about the recession we had to have and the current policies espoused by either the temporary Prime Minister or the Prime Minister in waiting? Minister Senator Button. Well, Mr President, I've asked, answered questions about uh, policies and uh, responsibilities for a very difficult recession on numerous occasions. Senator Perra either wasn't listening, he was probably yelling his head off at question time, or alternatively dozing one or the other. <clears throat> but I've answered questions about these policy issues time and time again. And I, I have said time and time again that this government, in respect of the application of monetary policy in 1990 and early 1991, accepts responsibility for a, respons a, a, a substantial part of this recession. But there are other factors involved in this recession in, uh, as well. There are factors such as the Huge rural, huge rural crisis which we have in this country, and I, I, no, I suppose I suppose you would say I, I suppose you would say that the wool crisis was in some way the responsibility of this government, would you? Well, I tell you, it's not. I tell you, it is not. And um, Senator, there are a number of other factors which have contributed to this recession in Australia. Now, let me say, let me say, people like you, don't forget this. Don't forget that people like you could be asking the same, the same questions in the Parliament of the United Kingdom, the same questions in the Congress of the United States, the same questions in the Parliament of Canada. Don't let's forget that. This could have been done anywhere. Now, it's no good muttering away in your beard now. This is, that is a fact which you have to face up to. Senator Walsh. Mr President, my question is to Senator Tate representing the Minister for Health and Community Services. I ask, will the government accept the recommendation in the Wangman report, that's spelt with a G, Wangman report on childcare accreditation to spend an ongoing $3 million per annum 
to fund this extra tier of supervision and regulation, or will it use the $3 million for enhanced fee relief to parents who need it? The Minister representing the Minister for Community Service and Health, Senator Tate. Mr uh, President, I understand the Wangman report has been uh, released. It was commissioned by the Department of Health, uh, Housing and Community Services. It's, uh, it's been, I think, provided anyway, Senator, to the, um, accreditation, the Interim Accreditation Council to do with child care. You say it hasn't been released publicly, Senator? I'm not, uh, not sure Order. of that. Certainly. The intention uh, is that that uh, report simply become one of the working documents for the Interim Accreditation Council. And there's no intention of the government to hold us bolus uh, except uh, any recommendations in it without uh, the benefit of the uh, advice of that interim accreditation committee. So, Senator, there won't be uh, an immediate uh, uh, response uh, and there won't be, certainly, an immediate implementation of uh, any recommendations within the Wayman report because, as I say, it will become a working document of the interim accreditation council. And, uh, uh, it's on the basis of the, of the recommendations from that council that the government will make its decision. Senator Patterson. Thank you very much, Mr. President. My question is directed to Senator Richardson in his capacities as Minister for Social Security and representing the Minister for Arts, Sport, the Environment, Tourism and Territories. Why was the $6.2 million disability reform marketing strategy contract awarded over three months prior to the necessary legislation? being passed by either House of Parliament? Why was $412,500 paid to the winning tenderer, Corporate Impacts, 24 days prior to the legislation being passed by the Parliament? And why was an additional $368,644.29 paid to the same company prior to this legislation receiving royal assent? Minister for Social Security, Senator Richardson. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. President. I shall uh, find out uh, some information for Senator Patterson. I can only point out that uh, the disability reform package was being uh, generally supported here. We weren't uh, locked in mortal combat. It was a massive change which affects the lives of people who are uh, dependent upon uh, an income provided by, uh, by the government. And uh, there obviously is a need for, for preparation uh, to be t undertaken early. Uh, but I'll uh, get some specific answers to the senator's questions and try and get them to her next year. Supplementary, Senator Patterson. Minister, I'd like to know when you will give me the answers, other than just next year. And can you assure the Senate that all due processes were followed in the letting of this tender? And I ask: Is there any requirement or moral obligation of members of the working committee of the ministerial council awarding the tender to declare any conflict of personal interest in the matter, such as personal friendships? With one of the tenderers, and if not, why not? Minister Senator Richardson. I, um, I think uh, I, I'm actually not on the, that committee, the, uh, the government that decides these things. I don't think it's uh, uh, going to be possible to say that, uh, amongst advertising agencies, no one on the committee would ever have met anyone in, a, in a, uh, an agency. Uh, although I'll ask, certainly uh, make an inquiry of, uh, of the committee and find out. Um, but uh, I, wasn't, uh, I wasn't present, so I just don't know. And so far as when I'll give you the answer, well, normally, Senator Patterson, I'd give you the answer tomorrow. I suspect, however, uh, we won't be sitting then, so I won't be doing that. Uh, I'll endeavour to, uh, I'll endeavour to uh, give it to you very early in the new year. Hopefully, I, I'll be away for a few weeks, but uh, by the end of January, certainly. Senator Foreman. Mr. President, uh, my question is to the Minister for Industry, Technology and Commerce, Senator Button. I refer to an article in the Adelaide News on Monday which claimed that insurance companies were importing inferior replacement car parts and panels from Malaysia and Taiwan, which could affect tens of thousands of South Australian jobs and elsewhere. It was also mentioned that this practice concerned unions and manufacturers because many of these parts did not meet the same standards as Australian products. Can the minister inform the Senate as to the accuracy of these claims, and is the government worried about this practice from an employment and safety perspective? The Minister for Industry, Technology and Commerce, Senator Button. Well, Mr. President, uh, I'm not aware of the details of the case which. Uh, Senator Foreman asked me about. Let me say that from time to time, allegations of a similar kind emerge, uh, usually from third parties claiming that imports 
uh, of this sort of uh, these vehicles are, or parts are unsafe. And of course, the primary issue in these, uh, in respect of these things, has to be one of uh, safety. The Australian design rules uh, set down a comprehensive range of performance and design requirements for motor vehicle safety. Design rules cover a, a whole range of uh, safety requirements, such as vehicle impact testing, side door strength, steering systems, other features to improve occupant protection and so on. The Australian design rules take uh, force nationally under the provisions of the Federal Motor Vehicle Standards Act, which is administered by the Federal Office of Road Safety. The Federal Office of Road Safety provides a mechanism by which alleged safety defects are investigated. If uh, Senator Foreman wishes to provide evidence of a safety problem, and I don't, certainly don't say it would not exist, I would be pleased to forward it to the appropriate authorities in the Department of Transport and Communications who administer the Motor Vehicle Standards Act. And I hope uh, Senator Foreman will do that. Might I, might I say that uh, from time to time one receives complaints of this kind, and uh, I think it is always worthwhile following them up. Recently I received complaints about uh, compliance with safety, safety standards in respect of imported cranes and lifting platforms, predominantly used on building sites and in warehouses. And uh, <coughs> the arrangement with the federal government has been that uh, customs uh, would report any shipments of uh, cranes or uh, building lifting platforms and so on which were imported from overseas and that the state authorities in each case would inspect them and make sure they satisfied Australian safety requirements. Uh, my inquiries as a result of the complaint uh, recently reveal that that has not been done in most cases by the state authorities and I'm chasing that up at the present time. I think it's very important from the point of view of uh, the use of this equipment and so on if uh, if it is not, if the regulations are not going to be complied with, uh, those people who import these equipments ought to know that the government will consider banning them again. We don't want to do that. We think that's economically unsound, but uh, they should comply with the safety requirements of this country. Senator Lewis. President, my question is also directed to the Leader of the Government in the Senate, representing the present Prime Minister. And it's about the Uruguay round of GATT negotiations, uh, as to which I understand the agricult agricultural negotiations in fact end tomorrow. <coughs> I ask, firstly, uh, why it has been that during the last six months the Prime Minister, Mr Hawke, has not been able to find time to ring any of the leaders of foreign countries, in particular the United States. Uh, President, the, uh, France and Germany, in support of Minister Blewett's negotiations, uh, ultimately having to wait until Minister Blewett rang him up to please request him to do so. And then, secondly, I ask: have, uh, Has uh, the minister uh, seen the comments by visiting Professor Chalmers Johnson uh, that GATT is dead? Uh, in effect, because uh, of the end of the Cold War, he's suggesting that the GATT arrangements have been dead because they were the GATT arrangements were. He well, says. This is another very long question, Senator Lewis. All right. Well, I won't read that out. I hope Senator Button's read that. I ask: Do you agree with his prediction that GATT is dead, and that the world is now entering an age of managed trade in which countries negotiate market shares directly with one another? Minister representing the Prime Minister. Senator Barton. Mr. President, insofar as the uh, first part of the question is concerned, it's true that the, it is hoped that the Uruguay round in respect of the agricultural negotiations will uh, reach at least a, uh, a seminal point tomorrow. Um, I uh, haven't seen the uh, uh, suggestion by Dr Blewett that the Prime Minister should ring uh, the uh, appropriate uh, officials, presidents or prime ministers in the US, France and Germany. Um, I would be very surprised uh, if during the course of this year the, the prime minister has not spoken to the president of the United States about this matter, but I'll investigate that and, uh, and obtain an answer for you. 
Um, it's not, uh, there is not, uh, Senator, I think, uh, uh, probably tremendous point in uh, Prime Minister taking action to speak with the French authorities. Uh, they are well aware of their position and they're well aware of ours, and they've been, uh, that has uh, been made clear to them on numerous occasions. I think the United States is under no illusions about our position on farm subsidies either. Uh, <clears throat> I've not read the uh, current uh, comments by Professor Chalmers Johnson. Uh, uh, I've read uh, publications of his before about international business, and I must say they have a, uh, a fair degree of hyperbole and sensationalism about them. Uh, the publications I've read on previous occasions, you know, "Gat is dead" is a sort of uh, a good slogan for selling a book, perhaps, but uh, <clears throat> it, it probably is, I think, uh, far from the reality. Insofar as the question of managed trade between blocks is concerned, uh, there has been a fair degree of managed trade between countries going on, for example, in ASEAN. Uh, <coughs> the uh, heads of ASEAN meet in January to look at the question of uh, uh, not a trade block but a common external tariff for ASEAN countries. So those sort of things are happening in there and in uh, North America, uh, in Central America. Uh, perhaps in uh, parts of Europe and so on. That leaves you sitting in front of Senator Lewis, whose question I'm answering. And uh, <coughs> the, uh, the, the point is, Senator, that I think even within uh, a changed GATT regime arising from the Uruguay round, there will be a degree of managed trade going on. The lesser the better, but I think that will be likely to happen. Senator Campbell. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is directed to Senator Button, the Leader of the Government in the Senate, and it relates uh, to an answer he gave to Senator Walsh back on December the 5th regarding the wholesale sales tax treatment of road transport. And in that question, he uh, referred to the impact on transport costs as 2.8 per cent for road, 0.8 per cent for rail, and 1.1 per cent for air. Could the Minister firstly inform the Senate where he got those figures from? Secondly, could the minister inform the Senate if he considers the cascading effect of the high incidence of sales tax and fuel excise on road transport is one example of Australia's uncompetitive business tax system? Thirdly, does the minister agree that the distortion between road, rail, sea and air places a dis disproportionate burden on the cost of grocery items? Senator Collins, your, your answer for so long. I think I can ask a Order. detailed question to the minister. Places a disproportionate burden on the cost of grocery items because most of these are transported on large articulated vehicles. And lastly, will the minister inform the Senate if the government is currently considering specific proposals to reform these inequities in the wholesale sales tax treatment <coughs> of road transport? Or is the policy just the same as usual? If it, taxes, move, if it moves, tax it, and if it keeps moving, tax it even harder. The Minister for Industry, Technology well, and Commerce, Senator Barton. <coughs> that is, a, of course, a very long and detailed question to which I will uh, obtain a detailed answer. In respect of the, uh, uh, the figures which uh, Senator Campbell asked about, uh, my recollection is that they were obtained from a Treasury uh, briefing on that matter. Um, so the answer as to where I got the figures from is there. Uh, I'm asked if uh, I recognise the cascading uh, effect of a wholesale sales tax. And the answer to that question is, of course, yes. Senator, you can remove uh, all. I mean, you can look around, and any any business tax that exists, of course, is a burden on business. I mean, uh, people say uh, payroll tax is a great and uniquely Australian burden on business. It, it is not uniquely Australian. All. Uh, for example, all, all European uh, employers pay a social services levy, uh, which is at least as equivalent to the uh, value of the or the effect of the payroll tax uh, on Australian uh, businesses. And uh, arrangements, of course, vary from one country to another with the kinds of taxes which are imposed. Uh, insofar as the uh, uh, cascade effect on groceries. Uh, I understand your sensitivity about this, Senator Campbell, because your tax taxes necessities for every Australian. It taxes food, 
It taxes groceries, it taxes clothing, it taxes footwear, it, it taxes funerals, it taxes legal services, it taxes all those things uh, which uh, uh, the, the, the Australian. Uh, I'm getting some support for one Order. Um, all those things uh, which uh, are burdens to ordinary families in Australia. I, I can't uh, precisely answer that part of the question now, um, but I would, uh, I would say that uh, I think the burden of the wholesale sales tax in respect, uh, in respect of groceries would be considerably less than the burden of a 15 per cent, uh, a 15 per cent goods and services tax. Mr. President, I ask that further questions could. Uh, Reserve supplementary, Senator. Uh, uh, Mr. President, I uh, thank the minister for, for saying that he received his figure from a Treasury paper. I ask the minister, as a supplementary, is he aware of the Treasury paper prepared for Mr. Rick Charlesworth's caucus economic industrial relations committee on the 26th of November, which showed that the 2 per cent figure that he used actually refers to uh, fixed rigid trucks, that indeed the rate of WST incidents for transport is between 4 and 4.5 per cent on articulated vehicles, further that the amount of average tonne kilometres uh, for rigid trucks is only 57,000 and the rate for articulated trucks is 1.2 million. Would he agree then that he, he using figures which do not apply shows something like a 1 to 1 point? A one to one point five billion dollar hole in the argument he used in December the fifth to Senator Walsh's question. Mr. President, Order, uh, Minister Senator Button. Mr. President, because of uh, interjections from both sides of the House, I didn't uh, fully hear Senator Campbell's question. And uh, no, don't bother. Don't bother. I, I think because of the detail in it, Senator, I would be better to read the hands out over the uh, vacation period. I assure you. <coughs> I, uh, I assure you I'll do that avidly, Senator. <coughs> I, I will do that avidly. Mr President, I ask that further questions be placed on notice. Mr President, I li would like, while I'm on my feet, to, uh, uh, to send my best wishes for Christmas to uh, uh, Jessica Bailey and her family who live near Young in New South Wales. And uh, I uh, ask that further questions be placed on notice. <laughs> You're too miserable to pay for a Christmas card. Yeah. Senator, is this ministerial answers? Uh, Mr. President. Bye, bye, Robert. <laughs> Mr. President, um, I, I wanted to ask you a it's question. A order, order, order. I'm just about to find out. Mr. President, it was by, a point by of leave, I wanted to ask you a question relating to an undertaking Senator Button gave to you yesterday. But in light of the uh, comment that he just made, um, the question I want to ask, I think, also relates to that. It'll just take a moment. Well, I'll. I'll ask the ministers to give their answers first, as is the normal procedure. President Senator Bulkus. On the 4th of December 1991, uh, Senator Patterson asked me a question in my capacity representing the Minister for Higher Education and Employment Services. I uh, have now been provided with uh, an initial answer to that question. I seek leave to incorporate it in hand side. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Tate. Mr President, during the course of ADEX and soon after it, I received a number of questions about police actions at the site in the chamber and outside, as for example from Senator Reynolds. I also met a delegation comprising Senators Charles Spender and Valentine and two representatives of the ADEX demonstrators. Several of the allegations raised with me concerned purported actions by the police and I undertook to report to the Senate on those allegations. I have received a report from the Chief Police Officer and have provided a copy of my answer to the relevant Senators. Because of its length, Mr President, I seek leave to incorporate the answer in hand. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Bishop. Thank you, Mr. President. My question relates to the uh, uh, answer that Senator Button gave to you, or said to you yesterday, where he claimed that he had sent to you a couple of. I got leave. Order. Where he claimed that he had sent to you a couple of letters concerning the Order. conduct. No request for leave, as I recall. I did make a request for leave. Well, you better make it again. Order. 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 Is leave granted for Senator Bishop to make a statement? Is leave granted? Leave's granted. Thank you, Mr. President. Yesterday, Senator Button said that he had sent a couple of letters to you concerning the conduct in this chamber during question time. I ask you, Mr. President, if you've received those letters, and if so, will you table them in the Senate? And in the interests of fair play and balance, 
I now seek leave to table some correspondence that I have received supporting the opposition's uh, efforts to bring the government to account and ensure that the government does not continue to abuse the procedures of the chamber, particularly at question time. Uh, Mr. President, I would seek leave to uh, either incorporate them into Hansard or I could read them. Is leave granted? Leave is not granted. And then, Mr. Yeah, President, the I would like to continue uh, my, uh, my free remarks and I would like to read them into the, into the record. President, I understood that she sought leave to ask you a question, not to make a speech. No, no, no I sought leave to make yeah. a statement. Thank you, Mr. President. I would like to read them. If the minister will agree, I'm happy to incorporate them or indeed table them. Otherwise, I will read them in. There's only 20 pages to read in. To, uh, is, leave, is leave granted? Is leave granted for the letters? To be incorporated. Is leave granted? Leave is not granted. Thank you. Then I'll read them. Thank you, Mr. President. To Senator Four. Bishop, uh, the date is the 9th of the 20, uh, 9th, 29th, Senator Jackson Cook. Street, Newport, dated the 12th of December. Dear I, Senator, uh, keep up the good work. You order. Look point of order. Mr. President, uh, I don't want to cut across anything that uh, the Senator Bishop wishes to do, but uh, well, no, I just want to claim my rights. Uh, I would like to uh, add to an answer that I gave during question time. No, no, no. This, is, this is ministerial answers. This is ministerial answers. Order. And I understand that takes precedence. Order, order, I, order, Senator Cook. I gave ministerial answers. I'm sorry. Precedence, Mr. and uh, I didn't think there was anybody else standing. I'm sorry. And I call Mr. Senator Bishop. I'm now in the, a difficult position where I've been, where Senator Bishop asked leave to ask me a question. I don't think she I think she needs leave to read these letters into the hands of she asked leave to ask a question. She asked leave to, uh, to well, ask me a question, we'll I believe. The second time was to make a statement. You conferred, the manager conferred with the leader of the government, and the answer came back, yes, this is a statement. She then sought leave to incorporate letters. That has been refused, so she is continuing to make the statement and has the right to read the letters into the hands of Senator, the point of order, let me remind the senator of what took place. Senator Bishop rose and sought leave to ask a question, and the question she asked was this. Senator Button said yesterday that he'd sent a couple of letters to you that he'd received in the post about the conduct in Senate. Will you, did you receive those letters and will you table them? That was the question. Did you receive those letters and will you table them? That was the question. Now, if you want to check the Hansard record, that was asked of the president. That, that was asked of the president. Now, that is a question for the president. Now look, the purposes of this is for Senator Bishop to put on a stunt, as usual. That's what it's all about. Everybody in this Senate received, everybody in this Senate received letters congratulating on their performance, but order. it's only you. Point of order. Who wants to read the point, point of order? Point, point of order. order. Uh, Senator Button has clearly moved on to uh, engaging in a bit of argy-bargy from the floor of the chamber. Speaking to the point of order, he simply recited the first part of Senator Bishop's statement. And I don't hear him to uh, challenge the proposition that Senator Bishop was given leave to make a statement, the first part of which involved the asking of a question, and she ought to be allowed to proceed as she has the call. And it's a sheer impertinence and reflection on the chair for Senator Cook to try and interrupt in the way he did. Order, order, order. I think that, as far as Senator Cook was concerned, it was a genuine mistake. Order. <laughs> Order Senator, order Senator Bishop ask leave to ask me a question. No, I sought also a statement, Mr. President. And well, I had I did certainly did Lurch, watch it. Order. <laughs> order. Quiet, Lurch. Order. Order. Order I'm President. Order. Oh, he's the chairman. Lurch has taken the chair. Order. Senator Bishop. Thank you, Mr President. I will, I will let Senator Bishop continue because I think that I made a mistake and said that Senator Bishop 
I gave a leave to make a statement as well as ask the question. I don't know whether Hansard could check that, but in the circumstances, I'll let it continue. Thank you. There are only three short ones. It's only a selection, Mr. President. Dear Senator, keep up the good work. You look wonderful on television. We feel so enlightened when you fight back. I am afraid that G. Evans and Robert Ray are a bone of contention with me too. Had an unnecessary experience with Mr. Ray when I was scrutineering in Manly many years ago. He was cracked over the knuck I was cracked over the knuckles when I was not familiar with some papers on the counting table which I should not have touched. The ruler really hurt. A, uh, a headmaster at the table reprimanded him on the spot. I do belong to the uh, Newport branch, but not an active member these days. Yours sincerely, Joel of Page. Compliments of the season. Second letter from Mrs. Kazuko Little, dated December 91. Dear Senator Bishop, my sincere best wishes for your good work in Parliament. I watched on TV and it made me so angry with the practices these Labor men, even the Speaker, any sensible people that watched that broadcasting will understand how unfair treatments of the Labor Party men were doing in their government's most important debating place. Your standing up in the session pointing out the Speaker and Senator Button is out of parliamentary practices were clearly seen by thousands of people in Australia. Keep up the good work, Senator. Wishing you peace and happiness for Christmas and the coming year. Uh, this is uh, from Kingsgrove, from uh, uh, Mrs e Elizabeth Stead. Dear Senator Bishop, firstly, may I congratulate you on your performance in Parliament. I live on my own and always look forward to question time in the Senate. As you can always be seen so well informed, not only on the subject being uh, discussed, but on the correct procedure to be followed with the debate. Keep up the good work. We look forward to seeing you on the other side of the House in the near future. It is such, it is such a secure feeling to see the Liberals united in their party. Point, point of order, Senator Reynolds. Point of order, Mr. President. Could, could I ask if, if this is a, a new standing order that is going to enable us all to make self-congratulatory speeches uh, on the afternoon before we go into recess? There is no point of order. If, you conduct, if, if your conduct and grooming is an indication uh, of how to show of how orderly Dr. Hewson's government will be in Australia. Australia is in for a more orderly line of government. Having said all that, I was wondering if you could explain to me and my friend Senator Bishop how the GST will affect us, and she then uses personal items which I won't include. Yours faithfully, Mrs. Elizabeth Stead. P.S. Keep up the good work, Senator, in the House and show how a better alternative is for all. Yeah. There's more if you'd like, Mr. President. I, I would put on the record now, Mr. President, that there are more letters if, uh, if the uh, Senate would like. This was just a random selection and I only brought them in because Senator Button told us he had any letters but he couldn't produce them. <laughs> Order. I think this originally started out as a question to me. I've uh, received lots of letters about the conduct of question time. I received lots of telephone calls. I must say, over the last couple of weeks, they haven't been all uh, complimentary of either side of the chamber. Uh, I'll have a look at my records uh, when I get back to the office and make a reply. Whether or not Senator Button has actually sent yeah, you I'm those answering your question. and whether he had sent them on that particular date and not subsequent to today. Senator Crichton Brown. I seek leave to make uh, but a very short statement in respect to a uh, ruling you gave at question time. I don't propose, of course, to canvass, but I want to the government give me leave for about one minute. Leave's granted. But during question Senator Crichton time, Brown. Thank you, Mr. President. During question time, Senator uh, Kerr asked a question of Senator Button in respect to unemployment and the prospects for the million people unemployed. And Senator Button, in his answer, reflected it in what I thought was the most grave way upon the motives of Senator Perra in asking that question, suggesting that Senator Perra enjoyed the misery of mass unemployment because it brought some political advantage to the coalition. And I took a point of order suggesting that under Standing Order 193 that Senator Button was reflecting upon the motives of Senator Perra, which is considered by that Standing Order to be highly disorderly. A new rule that wasn't a point of order. I, of course, wouldn't presume to canvass that ruling. Really. I wonder would you be good enough to perhaps give consideration to the matter I raised and 
perhaps make a more definitive uh, ruling in due course for my clarification. Yeah. Yeah. Order. In reply to Senator Crichton Brown, I took the, uh, the comments that were made as a debating point. Uh, I will, however, have a look at how it appears in Hansard, and I will report back uh, to the Senate. Senator Cook. Can I add to an answer I gave during question time? <laughs> Senator Cook. Uh, during question time, Mr. President, I was asked a question by Senator Winston Crane concerning Robe River and his allegation that I have in some form or way misled the Senate. Well, I haven't misled the Senate, Mr. President, but I uh, wish to add to my answer by now tabling a, uh, a document which is a history of the Australian Industrial Relations Commission's appeal cases by Cape Lambert Services since June 1989, and which lists by uh, C number each of those cases under the heading of the case number of the proceeding, the nature of the subject, matter of proceedings, statements by Senator Crane and Hansard, <coughs> and the outcome. Uh, in the commission, in each of the or in the uh, courts, in each of those uh, in each of those cases, and uh, I secondly want to uh, uh, put down a statement which is a history uh, of these cases and a, uh, a set of remarks. That, I mean, I'm happy to read these, Mr. President, but these are a set of remarks that I would make, which uh, goes to the facts of these particular cases. And it's a uh, longer document, and in deference to your rulings about the Senate, uh, I would uh, not propose at this stage to read it, but I, but I may wish to uh, at some other time. And I wonder if I can uh, seek leave to have these documents uh, incorporated in the Hansard. Is leave granted? There's no objection. Leave is granted. Well, I seek leave to make a statement relating. Well, I seek leave to move a motion to take note of what the minister has just said in his supplementary answer. Is leave granted? Leave's granted. Uh, Senator Mr. Hill. Mr. President, this is an incredible situation. What's just happened is, is that a few minutes before the end of question time, Senator Crane gave notice to Senator Cook that he intended to move to century. He gave notice because it's the proper courtesy which we, which we follow. Normally to censure him for misleading the Senate in answers to questions on the 9th, 10th and 11th of September and the 17th of October. Senator Crane indicated, reminded the Senate today that the minister has been offering, promising to the Senate that he would put down a full statement explaining the answers that he had given, which Senator Crane has constantly said were factually incorrect. He first said he would put that statement down 101 days ago, and on several times, several occasions since, he has repeated that he would put down that statement. He has not done so. It now seems that he has been sitting on that information and did not intend to put it down because Senator Crane again asked him today whether he would do so, and all he, could, uh, he, he, all he answered with was another attack reflecting a personal prejudice on a, this particular Australian company, Robe River Limited, which is not relevant at all to the questions that Senator Crane has been asking, which related to whether or not Senator Cook had made errors, in fact, on a number of occasions in defence, really, of the original brief that he received from the Siemens, Siemens Union. So, having been given notice that he was about to be censured, suddenly Senator Cook decided he had no choice other than to put down information that he's been, he's been sitting on. Now that's, that, is, that is an incredible way to do business. I remind you also, I remind you also Mr. President, that time and time again Senator Cook from the government benches has said to Senator Crane, I dare you to censure me. Come on, go on with it. Censure me if you've got the information. Put up or shut up. And with great patience, what Senator Crane has been coming back about once every month and doing as an alternative is to, to the minister is to say, on the face of this evidence, you have misled the Senate. The factual information that you have put before the Senate is wrong. I give you the opportunity to correct the record. Correct the record, apologise to the company and apologise to the Senate. But the minister wouldn't do that. He was hoping that this matter would go away, that Senator Crane would, would eventually uh, um, 
find that it, wasn't, uh, it, you know, it was too much trouble to continue with it. He had no intention of putting before the Senate the information that he has now been put, forced to put before the Senate because the alternative was that he would have to admit an error and apologise, which he is not prepared to do. A Senator Crane will take the sensible course of action now and not pursue the censure motion at this time. He will first peruse the documents that the minister has belatedly put down. But it is not a good way to do business. It demonstrates this particular minister's prejudice and the extent that he will go, that he will go to protect his prejudice, his lack of bona fides, as my colleague says. It does him no good. It does the standing of his government no good. And it's interesting on this day, when the new Prime Minister is probably going to be choosing a new set of ministers, that he would again demonstrate not only his prejudice and his incompetence. And I think what has this minister been already censured on two separate occasions yep. by the Senate, yep. uh, and this would have been a third occasion, almost, almost, almost <laughs> unprecedented, almost unprecedented. It is a poor standard of behaviour from, from a minister. It is an insult to the Senate. It is an insult to Rogue River. And he still ought to get up and apologise for the way in which he's conducted his business in this regard. I would like to, through you, Mr. President, I would like to add uh, some comments in terms of um, this matter. When I listen, first of all, through you, Mr. President, uh, to uh, the minister's answer, I was sceptical about the accuracy of it. I took certain actions in terms of getting the decisions, and I have a list of decisions from the Arbitration Commission as well, which will be interesting to compare with the minister's list to see if they coincide in those particular decisions. Through you, Mr. President, I have given you, Minister, four opportunities in this Senate to make a statement so as that the record was correct and accurate. It is not an issue about whether Robe River is correct or right or whether the union is correct or right. It is an issue about whether or not the information that was put down in this chamber was in fact accurate and reflected the true situation. That is what it is about. And I think it is absolutely despicable, deceitful and unforgivable that after having asked you again today that you in fact could not put that record down, that information you had. You had to come in behind uh, procedural matters. After all this, you did not miss procedural be matters today the because to you were not aware of what was going on. You missed them because you were down at the other end of the chamber to to talking to the Democrats. That is why you missed it. And I think it is absolutely despicable through you, Mr Deputy President, that we now have this situation before us. I certainly reserve my right to continue this particular matter. I will look with interest at those documents. I tried to give you the opportunity three months ago, now over three months ago, to make sure that this particular accusation was right about a company uh, in Western Australia, a company which you once again today uh, criticised. Maybe some of that criticism is justified, but that is not the point. The point is that in looking at these particular issues, in your responsibility as a minister, there must be even-handedness in the approach. In this particular case, there has not been even-handedness in the approach. And I believe what you have done today in terms of after question time, bringing that in and now putting it on the table, in fact, has denigrated question time and the processes of this chamber. Senator Coulter. President, just very briefly, um, I was provided with some information through uh, Senator Hill last evening in anticipation of the, uh, the censure motion today. On perusal of it, it seemed to me that there was substantial evidence there that uh, the minister uh, had misled the Senate in, uh, in respect of uh, answers to questions. Uh, the um, brief tete-a-tete -tete I've just had with the minister to which Senator Crane referred to a moment ago uh, involved the minister saying to me that there was other evidence which he, he uh, sought to put before us 
and I'm pleased to, uh, to note that the, uh, the opposition is, is not uh, proceeding at this time with a censure motion because I think it's only fair that we uh, have an opportunity to uh, look at both lots of documentation to see just where the uh, truth, truth of this matter really does lie. The Honourable Minister. Thank you, uh, Mr uh, Deputy President. There are a couple of things that uh, I should say by way of uh, threshold remarks on this before I go to the substance of the issue. The first is an, alle an allegation by uh, Senator Hill that I had no intention, an allegation he, re he reported, uh, repeated a couple of times, that I had no intention of correcting the record. In, in, on the many occasions that I have been asked questions on this matter, I have uh, almost on all of them, except I think for today, because I uh, got sick of uh, needless repetition, said that uh, I would correct the record in due course. This is not a matter of great substance. It is certainly not a matter high on my priority, because nothing in the record, uh, nothing in the record uh, derogates from the two conclusions that are the central propositions of my case. The central propositions of my case are, one, that Robe River is a rotten employer, and two, that Robe River is a vexatious litigant on matters of industrial relations. Nothing uh, here that's before the Senate now derogates in any way from uh, those contentions, and I in fact believe what is on the uh, record now of the Senate supports them strongly. So uh, to the point, though, that I had no intention, I did have an intention, and I would have fulfilled that intention. I would have fulfilled that intention by speaking uh, as it was uh, in my mind to do on an adjournment uh, uh, night so that I could take the time to actually go through the record case by case. Now I, now I, uh, I, uh, I, uh, this is, Order. I, I'm just saying, Mr uh, Deputy President, I would have spoken on an adjournment because I needed a full half an hour. And uh, I didn't wish to detain the actual business, uh, the business time of the Senate by dealing with uh, these allegations. And I, I just think that it is wrong and indeed reprehensible that any backbencher can rise make an allegation, no matter how well or ill-founded, and then, and, then, and, then, and, then, and then expect that the whole ship of government is going to stop and, uh, and deal with some allegation that comes that way. So it was my intention to speak on an adjournment and not detain the business of the Senate and the normal conduct of that business of the Senate. The second time is that there are a number of cases. Indeed, for anyone to make the allegation, as I have, and an allegation by which I stand, that a particular company is a vexatious litigant, re requires, requires that there to be a history of litigation. And there is. And there is a, a whole number of cases. And these cases have gone through the Byzantine coils of appeal uh, at various levels of the Industrial Relations Commission and of the courts in this country. And, uh, and different outcomes at different levels of the appeal. So in order to establish a factual outcome on the record based on what actually did occur is, is by no means a short matter. It is a, a long matter and requires, and requires uh, that the documentation be clearly uh, set out. So uh, I might say, Mr Deputy President, that I haven't proceeded thus far on an adjournment uh, speech to do this. But it is still my clear intention. It is still my clear intention to do this, and uh, well, I don't intend to do it tonight. I just happen to have some other things uh, to uh, to be worried about, and this is not uh, this is not on my list of priorities the highest thing. But it uh, it will uh, it will be dealt with. So to the first question uh, that has been raised by by Senator Hill, that I had no intention. I say those things as. Uh, as commitments I have given to the Senate and commitments for which I will fulfil. The second uh, question is this allegation of misled. The, uh, Senator Crane obviously got his name in the newspaper by making an allegation. Now, I happen to take my responsibilities as a Minister of the Crown in this country as serious. The allegation of misled is a formal allegation in the Westminster system that carries with it, I think, considerable penalty for anyone that in fact does it. And, uh, 
and, and, uh, and I don't think that uh, it is one that, that simply should be traded by way of interjection or uh, allegation freely across the chamber unless, unless, there is, unless there is some substantial weight to them and unless people are prepared to act on their words. Well, I accept that Senator Crane is prepared to act now on his words because, as it is the uh, case uh, in what Senator Hill has said, I have certainly invited him to do so. And I'm pleased that now he's brought this matter to this, uh, to this point, and, uh, and maybe now we can uh, resolve this matter one way or, the, or another, uh, if not now, and uh, it's probably not appropriate that it be done now, but certainly sometime uh, soon in the next sitting period. Now, uh, Mr. President, uh, De Mr. Deputy President, I, uh, I say that the two essential contentions here are by me, one, that Robe River is a rotten company, and two, that Robe River is a uh, vexatious litigant. The, uh, on the first, can I say, my reasons for making that uh, assertion uh, are uh, very many in number, and the examples of why I have come to that conclusion are, if not only picturesque, uh, examples of a company taking uh, an attitude about its workforce, which I think, frankly, is reprehensible. And, uh, and I hold that assertion, and I continue to make that assertion. Uh, irrespective of anything that might have passed from the opposition. But I have not come to that conclusion because a union has asked me to come to that conclusion or because the Siemens Union, who is the aggrieved party here, has asked me to. I come to that conclusion independently of them and based on a survey of all of the evidence. And I say that this government has reserved the right to criticise unions and take actions against unions. There are two examples. We regarded that the building Builders Labourers Union was a reprehensible organisation and behaved itself in a disgraceful and unlawful way. We deregistered that union by legislation on two occasions. We regarded that, the, that AFAP, the uh, Pilots Federation, behaved, misbehaved itself in an improper way in an industrial matter uh, in terms of the pilots' dispute, dispute some two years ago and as a government took action against them. Now, I think that a government, as opposed to a, uh, an opposition, a government has a, a responsibility to be fair and even-handed, and if it's dishing out punishment on one side, when on the other side of the industrial relations fence there is misbehaviour, it is bound in all conscience to speak out and identify that as unacceptable behaviour. And that's what I've done in the Robe case. The particular evidence that I've adduced is uh, now before the Senate. The, uh, the, the second matter about a vexatious litigant goes to the extent in which they have used the law to evade responsibility. There is a question of law and justice here. The law can be used by smart lawyers to delay the application of justice, and where, that is, where the law is, by resort to technical means, is used in such a way, it can in fact delay a proper outcome. I believe that to be the case in this, in this particular case. I believe that to be the case, and I think the record uh, uh, supports me, and the record supports me by uh, not only my view but by the view of any fair independent person inspecting the record impartially to come to a conclusion. Now, uh, uh, I, therefore, I therefore conclude my remarks, Mr uh, Chairman, on the point, on the point of that the Senate take note of my answer. If it is of a mind, and I do not uh, in any way, uh, uh, well, in fact, in some respects, look forward to this debate. If, if it, the Senate is of a mind to debate the merit of those claims and go to the facts and go to the detail, uh, I am happy, and in fact uh, not only happy, uh, dripping in anticipation to do that. But I don't think it's an appropriate thing to do today. And uh, should the Senate be of that mind, when I uh, when I can make my fuller explanation on an adjournment speech soon in the next sitting period, well then I'll be delighted to oblige. Question is. The question is the motion be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Senator Ray. Mr. Deputy President, I seek leave to make a personal explanation. Is leave granted? No. Leave is no. granted. I didn't uh, actually hear Senator Bishop read into the record a letter from a constituent, but uh, she kindly uh, allowed me to have a look at the copy. Uh, the first part of that letter is, uh, is, quite, uh, is quite congratulatory of Senator Bishop's performance, so I won't go into that matter. But the second one says the following, and I'm really disappointed, Senator Bishop, without even checking whether you read it into the record. It says, I had an unnecessary experience with Mr Ray, meaning me, 
when I was scrutineering in Manly many years ago, was cracked over the knuckles when I was not familiar with some papers on the counting table which I should not have touched. The ruler really hurt. The headmaster at the table reprimanded him on the spot. I belong to the New Pelt branch, etc. First thing I've got to say about that, having gone through my memory, I've never been to Manly in my life. That's the first point to be made. It's a lovely spot. Secondly, I have never scrutineered, Mr. Mr. Deputy President, I have never, de I have never scrutineered outside Victoria. Number three, I have never used a ruler, not even in the classroom, to hit anyone over the knuckles, nor would I, because I take this sort of expansive view of scrutineering as what everyone in the room wants is the right result in a quick assessment, and I always encourage cooperation, not hostility. So, unfortunately, Senator Bishop, I have to say that Ms. Gwen Jolliffe Page is a malicious liar when she writes this to you. That there is no. Uh, no, no. Earlier in the thing, she's talking about both Senator Evans and myself. Earlier in the letter. She is a malicious liar. There is no truth to it. I'm disappointed that you put it forward without checking, but I'm not surprised. Senator Bell. President, uh, I ask that the Minister for Industrial Relations tables the documents to which you referred uh, in answering my question during question time today. Well, the Minister is no longer here. Did, uh, Minister, did you hear that request? I did hear that request, Mr oh, uh, Deputy President. I don't have the paper on me at the moment. I've sent my files away. I'll recover them and have the paper tabled. <coughs> Senator hey, 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 hey. Mr. Bishop, There is an interjection from Senator Tate to Senator Walters that she was a malicious liar. Could I please ask him to withdraw that? Well, oh, Mr. Senator Tate. President, of course I didn't call Senator Walters a malicious liar. I said, do you, or words to the effect, do you agree with malicious lying? It was a question. Senator Bishop. Mr Deputy President, just on a, a point of order, I, I do understand uh, that the sensitivities of government members are very great on a day like today and before 6.30, but I do think it's going over the top to call uh, uh, a correspondent a malicious liar when he has no knowledge of whether intent was meant or not. And uh, I think it's quite clear to say that uh, she may have uh, thought it was the wrong, Mr Ray. I I think it because <laughs> we went through that earlier. You weren't in the chamber, Minister. I think, uh, I think it is over the top to draw that conclusion about a, 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 a constituent, Mr Deputy President, and I accept that Senator Ray can say that uh, uh, the, co the correspondent was uh, under a misapprehension, that, that in error, that it was a different Mr Ray. She can say, uh, draw any of those conclusions. But to say malicious, to imply malicious, I think, is uh, right over the top, and I would think uh, that it, if he were if he were serious about it, he would rephrase his uh, objection, which I would accept. Uh, however, uh, it's a matter for the minister. But I do understand the touchiness of today. Order. That's that's a comment. That's not a point of order. To accommodate uh, Senator Bishop, and I will refer to your constituent as an absent-minded, mendacious person, and I don't think that has to be withdrawn. Well, the, uh, order. The, uh, the first comment didn't have to be withdrawn either. Uh, Minister? Uh, can I now table the document requested of me by Senator Bell? The Senate will now move to consideration of government documents. In document one, number one, Economic Planning Advisory Council. Uh, Senator Bone. Mr President, I uh, move the Senate take note of this paper. Uh, in the first place, I'd like to note that uh, this, uh, the annual report for 1990-91 of the Economic Planning and Advisory Council contains in it uh, one comment that I'd like to draw to the Senate's attention, and that is uh, that uh, the director in 1990-91 was Mr Fred Argy, OBE. Mr Argy retired in September 1991 after serving for five years in the position. Uh, I know I would be reflecting the views of all the uh, members of the opposition when I said we would like to place on record uh, our appreciation for uh, his, uh, his work uh, in that, uh, in that uh, role uh, and as opposition members to uh, acknowledge uh, his contribution to, uh, to EPAC. 
Uh, I should also mention, uh, however, that it's uh, disappointing that this slim volume, which uh, is simply a report of proceedings and does not uh, uh, involve any uh, detailed or substantial accounting uh, uh, requirements or anything like that, uh, has only come into this chamber uh, on our last day of sitting late in December for a year that ended in June. And this simply is not good enough, and EPAC could perhaps uh, look to its own forecasting of its own timing of uh, presentation of annual reports uh, when it's looking at uh, uh, other weighty matters. However, I would say uh, that even though EPAC's role is to uh, advise the government on uh, a whole range of economic matters, you can't blame EPAC for the mess that this government has got us into. Uh, it uh, is clear that in so many instances uh, the government simply ignored what was evident in so many EPAC uh, reports or so much advice uh, that uh, was presented uh, to the government via EPAC. Now, uh, one would think that uh, with the, uh, the variety of expert advice available to the government, it shouldn't have made such an incredible mess of the economy uh, that took place under Mr Keating's careful stewardship where he engineered the recession we had to have, uh, which produced a million unemployed, and with uh, the prospects of even greater increases in the level of unemployment in the new year. The uh, objectives of EPAC are to provide a broadly based source and channel of information on economic matters to assist the Commonwealth Government in making decisions relating to economic policy, to provide a forum for the participation of the community in the development and formulation of the economic policy of the Commonwealth Government, and to facilitate the development and consideration by the Commonwealth Government of medium and longer term economic assessments and policy requirements. Now, uh, despite all this, uh, and despite uh, its functions, uh, to act as a major forum for discussions between the Commonwealth Government uh, and other governments, to advise the Commonwealth Government on feasible and desirable goals and targets for the economy, to develop assessments for the Commonwealth Government in the medium and longer term economic outlook, to advise the Commonwealth Government on policies which would help to achieve the optimum growth of the Australian economy, and to advise the Commonwealth Government on policies that might assist the achievement of sustained economic growth. Despite uh, all this uh, advice, input and so on, this government has managed to make a magnificent, incredible mess of things. Now, uh, I would say that uh, if there is a clear relationship between the quality of advice and the outcomes, uh, then uh, either uh, uh, it, it would seem that that relationship is an inverse one uh, rather than uh, a direct one, because there's no doubt that quite a uh, quite an amount of the advice uh, that came through EPAC seemed quite rational. Uh, EPAC papers uh, uh, during the year, as the report says, made a significant contribution to public debate on economic issues, including such questions as competitiveness, inflation, urban and regional issues, taxation, federalism and productivity. Now, uh, let's hope that uh, whatever uh, government is in power uh, next year, and one hopes the people of Australia will get the opportunity of determining that. Next year, the Council, or at least in the current financial year, the Council is discussing private debt and prudential regulation, Australia's unemployment problem, the current account deficit, investment in the cost of capital, and Australia's productivity performance. All these matters carefully and clearly addressed in the opposition's fight back uh, program, which of course this government is refusing to accept, which is spending all its time seeking to destroy rather than getting on uh, getting ahead with the sorts of programs which will resolve these problems which EPAC has so properly identified in its report and which it will be addressing in the current financial year. Uh, Senator Short. Thank you, Mr Acting uh, Deputy President. I too just wanted to say a few words about the EPAC annual report for 1991 and uh, to join uh, my colleague Senator Boehm, first of all, in uh, words of uh, congratulations to Fred Argy. Uh, for the work that he did as the director of the Office of EPAC over a period of five years prior to his uh, retirement from that position uh, just uh, two or three months ago. And I'm glad to see that the government has uh, since appointed uh, Mr Arjun to, uh, to other um, uh, duties uh, within the public sector because uh, he is uh, a man of uh, great experience, very uh, good economist, and uh, has made a major contribution over many many years now to economic uh, thinking uh, in, the, uh, in Australia, in the public sector, 
I had the pleasure of, uh, I've known him for uh, very many years indeed, and had the pleasure for many years of being a, a working colleague of his, and uh, I'm glad to see that he'll be continuing to make, uh, make a contribution. Uh, the uh, EPAC annual report uh, is, as Senator Boehm said, uh, a fairly uh, skinny uh, document. Uh, I th that's one of the uh, uh, criticisms I'd, I'd have of the report. It's one of the things that, though, that of EPAC I would, uh, I would have uh, favourable comment about. Uh, it is, uh, EPAC is one of the, uh, the nine major bodies which uh, conduct uh, research and uh, and which advise the government uh, on e economic uh, policy. And the government, uh, that is the taxpayers, uh, uh, spend about $130 million each year uh, on the government's economic research and advisory bodies, uh, the largest of which is the Industry Commission, but, if, uh, but there are other very large ones, uh, ABEAR, of course, is one, <coughs> and, and so on. Uh, the but of that $130 million, uh, the cost of running uh, EPAC uh, last year was uh, pretty small. It cost, uh, I think, $1.86 million, and that compares, to say, with uh, the Industry Commission, $15.3 million, ABEAR, $15.3, the Resource Assessment Commission, $6.2 million, the uh, Bureau of uh, uh, Transport. Uh, and, uh, and other uh, economic uh, research, uh, 3.9 million, and uh, the BIE, uh, 2.5 million. So uh, when one looks at the, at the uh, reports that EPAC uh, actually produces or publishes, uh, I think that uh, one would have to say that uh, it's, uh, it's a cost-efficient uh, organisation. What I would say is that I think there is, uh, has been a, a growth in the government advisory bodies and policy bodies, particularly in the area of uh, the economy generally and industry policy and the like. Uh, they've, they've grown a, lot, a bit like Topsy over the years. Uh, $130 million is a lot of taxpayers' money to be spending on these uh, organisations. And uh, in the uh, Coalition's fight back proposals, we have announced that in government uh, we would undertake a major review and streamlining of those uh, bodies so that uh, we could get, uh, we think, a better value for taxpayers' money and I think there is a much greater scope for contracting out uh, of uh, research work by the government rather than doing it in-house to the extent that it is now done. EPAC is a good example of the use of uh, outside uh, consultants and uh, the contracting out that uh, we would think uh, ought, ought to be done uh, more so than it is now. Appendix 3 of the report lists the consultants that were used uh, in 1990-91. There are an impressive range of consultants. The uh, prices charged to buy them seem to me to be uh, fairly reasonable for what is, uh, what is obtained and the work uh, that's been done. Uh, on page 6 of the report, uh, the work of the Council in 1990-91 is listed and it does show some of the major items that have been looked at uh, by EPAC in, the, in that 12 months, the whole ro question of investment and savings, the question of inflation, the question of competitiveness and productivity are amongst the most important. Uh, it is regrettable uh, that the government has not taken more account of the advice provided in those uh, documents uh, because they are very supportive of the, the, the need for greater com competition, uh, greater competitiveness, greater productivity, more control of inflation, a more balanced uh, approach to economic policy all the sorts of things that the coalition uh, is uh, saying needs to be done, that's all contained in our fight back proposals, they are all things which this government has uh, been very uh, bad at and are indeed uh, the, the reasons why we have in large degree the amount of uh, concern and despair in the economy that we have today. The question is that uh, the Economic Planning Advisory Council Annual Report 1991 be noted. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against, no. I think the ayes have it. We move to two, Department of the Treasury. Senator Short. Thank you, Mr Acting uh, De Deputy uh, President. Uh, the annual report of the uh, Treasury for 1990-1991 uh, is a uh, comp fairly comprehensive uh, report and it gives uh, an interesting commentary on uh, economic conditions during the 12-month uh, period. But uh, there is much in this report that uh, warrants uh, very careful uh, 
study and consideration. Uh, and in five minutes, it's, it's impossible really to uh, even scratch at the surface uh, of that. So I just make a few points in relation to the Treasury and the role of the Treasury. Uh, first of all, I would uh, join in the tributes that have been made in the par in the, at the time uh, to uh, Dr Chris Higgins, who was, of course, the Secretary of the Treasury for the first six months of 1991. Uh, prior to his uh, really sudden and tragic death uh, almost uh, exactly a year ago. And I'm pleased to see that the first page of the report uh, does uh, pay tribute to, uh, to the work of, uh, of Chris Higgins, uh, who was also an outstanding uh, public, uh, public servant. Uh, the Treasury has, in the last uh, se several months, uh, suffered under, from the fact that it has had no less than three treasurers in the last uh, seven months. We've had uh, Mr Keating, Mr Kerrin and now uh, Mr Willis and uh, probably uh, shortly after a vote at 6.30 tonight on the Prime Ministership uh, the Treasury seems uh, set to uh, have its fourth Treasurer in a period of, of seven months. Uh, uh, my betting uh, Senator Bone would be uh, Mr Dawkins, yes. I think Mr Keating owes him uh, a lot of favours <laughs> out of the past and uh, Mr Dawkins is obviously uh, desperately anxious to be the new Treasurer. God help Australia, I must say, if that happens, because uh, Mr Dawkins would be uh, the, uh, probably amongst the, the most unreconstructed uh, uh, socialists uh, and expansionist Keynesians in, ter in the uh, federal parliament when it comes to, uh, to economic uh, policy. So uh, we, will have a major, we will have an even greater problem I believe, uh, with uh, Mr Dawkins as, uh, as Treasurer in an incoming government, uh, or the next uh, Keating government, uh, than we have at the moment. The report uh, uh, sets out um, the Treasury's central objectives for 1991, uh, uh, which were said to, to be to provide high-quality uh, policy advice to the Treasurer, to elevate the level of economic debate more generally and to assess and better develop uh, organisational practices. Now, so far as the, uh, the first of those is concerned, the objective of providing high-quality policy advice to the Treasurer, it's not clear from the, uh, annual from the Department's annual report the, the extent to which uh, that was actually done, because if one looks at the performance of the economy over the uh, period of 1990-1991, if that uh, performance related from government acting on the advice that was provided to it by the Treasury, then one would have to say that the Treasury was an absolute disaster in 1990-91. I don't necessarily say that because I think the government, uh, on, not on all occasions, acted on the advice of the uh, Treasury and, indeed, in some important uh, occasions, acted contrary uh, to that advice. But the net result. Uh, was that we have had in that uh, 1991 year and since the build-up uh, of the deepest, most cruel, most protracted uh, recession that we have had in this country in 60 years. It's a recession which was deliberately engineered. It was not something that happened because of external factors impinging uh, on Australia. It was a totally homegrown recession which has left almost one million people officially unemployed and another half a million plus uh, uh, underemployed and uh, unable to find uh, the amount of work to provide a satisfactory uh, working situation for them. So we have one and a half million people in Australia either unemployed or underemployed as a result of the, uh, of the very deliberate policy decisions of, uh, of this government. And uh, I would uh, hope that the, uh, the Treasury, when uh, it, the appropriate time comes, and it can't come soon enough, uh, will be able to set the record straight in terms of the advice that it has given to government uh, over that uh, period of time, uh, because I, uh, I find it hard to believe that the advice uh, coming from the Treasury would have been in line uh, with the, uh, the policy decisions that have been uh, taken, uh, taken uh, by this uh, government. Your time has expired, Senator. Uh, Senator Baum. Mr. Acting Deputy President, uh, I join with Senator Short in uh, commending uh, the Treasury annual report for putting uh, a tribute to Dr. Chris Higgins, uh, the Secretary of the Treasurer, Treasury, who died so tragically just a year ago at the commencement of the report. 
But I'd also commend uh, the Treasury for, in a sense, pointing out in its quiet way just uh, why uh, this government uh, has, in its view, gone off the rails and uh, economically. Uh, I notice on page three uh, uh, where it uh, deals with the, the fact that during 1991 the Australian economy was in recession. Um, and it says, through a combination of factors, some domestic, some international, the recession moved to, uh, proved to be deeper than expected both here and in a number of other countries. Not least amongst the reasons for this in Australia was the unwinding of what had been the sharpest asset price boom since at least World War II and possibly longer. Well, we can see why they had that price boom. It was a set of political responses in terms of, uh, of uh, monetary policy uh, that this government undertook at an absolutely inappropriate time, which fueled that boom and which we warned about at the time. And Senator Short uh, was in the forefront of, uh, of the sensible commentators uh, pointing out that the government's policy approach uh, was absolutely dreadful. What interests me is to see uh, that, and then on page four, the Treasury goes on, that the sharp deflation of asset prices led to business failures, which resulted in several financial institutions experiencing a marked increase in doubtful and non-performing assets in their portfolios. Not a uh, mention of the fact that the huge uh, increases in interest rates, which were forced uh, on, the, on uh, financial managers in Australia, on financial management in Australia, because of the failure to use fiscal policy, was in fact the reason for this collapse. That it was pure, simple, uncomplicated governmental incompetence that resulted in this excessive reliance on interest rates to resolve uh, problems that should properly have been uh, uh, dealt with uh, by uh, uh, other uh, uh, financial measures. Now. Uh, what is further interesting to note, and I'm having to rush through this in just five minutes, this is one of the 41 uh, reports we have to deal with in half an hour, but it happens to be a very important one. Another point uh, made uh, is that the recession weakened the Commonwealth budget. Now it says, while the cyclical effects have been allowed to take their course, the policy challenge has been to protect the structural position of the budget so that the underlying integrity of fiscal policy remained intact. Well, what's happening to that underlying integrity now? We're getting statements by, uh, uh, by the Treasurer uh, that, uh, that something will have to be done uh, because economic growth uh, is not as, uh, as hoped for and that there is a clear indication coming from this government that that, quotes, that underlying integrity of fiscal policy unquote, will be destroyed by a desperate government uh, which is uh, panicking into finding ways of softening the blow uh, on the, the million, one million Australians unemployed uh, in the recession that was engineered by the, the former Treasurer. I also uh, notice uh, that uh, the, uh, the Treasury glosses over the $6.2 billion mistake made in the last budget, the biggest ever budgeting mistake, in, to, to my knowledge, in Australia's history where uh, there was the forecast of, a, uh, uh, of an $8.2 billion surplus, which ended up at $1.9 billion, uh, missing its target by $6.2 billion. Now, in dollar terms, I, uh, there's nothing that approaches that uh, level of error. But I notice that in the annual report, uh, uh, the Treasury doesn't actually mention that. It simply says that the surplus fell from $8 billion in the previous year uh, to $1.9 billion. Uh, and that the decline in the budget surplus reflected the operation of the automatic stabilisers on both expenditure and revenue. And then it says, and the failure of certain proposals we passed in Parliament, for example, a proposed sale of the Sydney Moomba pipeline. Well, I can assure the Treasury that the failure to sell the Sydney Moomba pipeline would not have made a massive dent uh, uh, in the $6.2 billion in that year. Uh, and I think that it is. Uh, simply uh, a, a political debating point to, to try to run that line, uh, particularly when, of course, that sale was uh, uh, involved a massive breach of contract, which would have, uh, I would expect, have resulted in severe in, Order. In some Your legal time action. Expired, Senator. The question is that the Senate take note of the Department of Treasury Annual Report 1990-91. Those of the opinions say aye. Those against no, I think the ayes have it. 
We moved to three, Australia and the World Bank. Senator, Senator Short. Uh, thank you, Mr uh, Acting uh, Deputy <laughs> President. Uh, I move that the Senate take note of the uh, paper and seek leave to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Uh, we now move to four, operation of the IMF and the World Bank. Senator Short. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I move that the Senate take note of the uh, report. The, um, uh, this report, uh, the operations of the IMF and World Bank 1990-91, and indeed the one that we have just uh, uh, deferred consideration of, <coughs> or changed consideration of Australia and the World Bank 1990-91, uh, are very uh, important documents, and I would hope that uh, the Senate would find time uh, at some point in the not too distant future, when we return next year, to uh, debate these reports and the matters relating to them, namely Australia's uh, position within the international economic uh, arena uh, more, more fully. And we have had some discussion on that with Senator McMullen in the past, and I think that it was arranged that we would try to have such a debate. Uh, I would welcome that. The significance uh, of these reports uh, is that they uh, underscore Australia's links to and uh, dependence uh, on uh, and interdependence with the, uh, the world economy. We uh, are very heavily in debt to overseas lenders or owners. Uh, our uh, capacity for independent policy adjustment uh, is therefore uh, limited uh, to that uh, extent. If we were able to um, have had a less dependence on overseas debt and overseas equity in recent years, then the problems confronting uh, this nation uh, would be very much less than they are now. And we now have the situation, because we are so heavily uh, indebted uh, to the rest of the world, a dangerous situation because, uh, in contrast to 20 or even uh, 10 years ago, uh, capital, uh, no knowledge and people, in other words, ge resources generally, but particularly financial resources, are very, very uh, mobile. They have the, uh, the ability to move very quickly to the location which is most uh, attractive for investment. Equally, they have the ability to move very uh, quickly uh, from that. And therefore, uh, it means uh, fr from uh, any location if the, uh, if the mood against that location uh, changes. What it means is that Australia is, in se is essentially in competition uh, with the rest of the world, uh, not only in the, mar in the market for goods and services, uh, but more importantly, uh, even perhaps in terms of, certainly as importantly, in terms of being a favourable uh, investment uh, location. That does have enormous implications uh, uh, for this government. It has enormous uh, implications uh, for Australia. It has uh, particular implications in the, in the weeks ahead because uh, everything that we've seen uh, in recent days, uh, statements from the Treasurer, which have uh, been statements under pressure uh, from, the, uh, from the left uh, wing of the uh, Labor Party and of the government in an attempt <coughs> to uh, out Keating, Keating on an interventionist, expansionist policy, economic policy by the government. All of the indications in recent days are that we are going to see a major loosening of an already loose economic situation uh, next year. And if that uh, does in fact occur as a result of the elevation of uh, Mr Keating to the Prime Ministership, uh, or even if he doesn't uh, make it and uh, the, uh, the, the still government, the still Hawke government feels that it has to uh, bow to the pressures of the left, then we are going to see ourselves in a very dangerous situation indeed, because the first impact of that uh, would be to uh, majorly increase the uh, current account deficit, which is already running at $17 billion a year and which is costing something like 25 cents in every uh, dollar of exports that Australia does to uh, simply to service, let alone uh, repay. So we have an enormous external account uh, problem. Uh, if we do uh, do the U-turn that is uh, now being uh, predicted uh, by the government uh, or indicated by the government, uh, then the uh, problems that we already have, the problems of that one and a half million people uh, to whom I've just referred who are underemployed or unemployed in Australia, uh, the problem of falling investment, falling savings, falling uh, production and uh, unsatisfactory productivity growth will all be compounded 
and all the hurt, all the hardship of uh, the last uh, couple of years of the deepest recession we've had in 60 years uh, will go for naught because we will have changed none of the fundamental underlying problems that are affecting the economy. So these reports are very important in that regard. They make us realise uh, the interdependence that Australia has with the uh, rest of the world, and I hope that they will provide a forum for continuing debate in this uh, chamber. And the question is that the Senate take note as a document. Um, yeah. Senator Harradine. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, I too would uh, like to see a full debate on uh, this uh, uh, paper and uh, similar uh, and uh, uh, on Australia's involvement uh, with the IMF and the World Bank. As Senator Shaw has indicated, uh, this uh, has been canvassed in this chamber previously. There had been an indication uh, uh, that uh, there would be time set, of, uh, set aside for a full discussion on this very, very important matter. Uh, this particular paper does not give that opportunity to the Senate, uh, so I seek leave to continue my remarks. Um, the question is, is leave granted? Being no objection, leave is granted. The question is, the Senate take note of the... We'll just leave it. Okay. Uh, document number five. Housing Assistance Act 89, document number six, uh, Senator Heron. Uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, uh, Medibank Private had an overall operating loss. Uh, oh, Senator Heron, I, I would you move, move to, to take note of the document? Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. Medibank Private had an overall operating loss of $43.1 million in 1990-91. Medibank Private's failure to increase its membership share in the eight years it has had the sole control of the Medipair program is one of the strongest arguments yet against nationalising health care financing in Australia. The fact that the overwhelming majority of Australians have stayed with their own health funds is all the more significant given the fact that Medibank Private has had a monopoly over Medicare. This has meant that more than 70 per cent of insured people have had to go to a Medicare office to receive their medical benefit payment and have had then, as an act of free choice, gone to a second place, their own health fund. One should also be reminded that Medibank Private's own figures suggest that it has been artificially holding its contribution rates down, one assumes, to maintain market uh, monopoly. The Macklin report has floated the idea of replacing the existing competitive network of health funds with a single national insurer, presumably the Health Insurance Commission. Yet more than 70 per cent of Australians have shown that when they have a choice, they do not want their business conducted by a government fund. This is, this is quite obviously because Australians like to have freedom of choice and do not like government trading corporations telling them what they have to do. Clearly, if the government attempted to embrace the nationalisation proposals that Macklin has put forward, it would be flying in the face of wishes of more than 70 per cent of the insured population. One area of particular concern is the extent to which the taxpayer may be called on to support the operations of Medibank Private. It is a matter of concern that many of the assets of the Commission appear to be held in the name of Medibank Private and Medicare is required to pay rent to them. I understand this is to be looked at by the Public Accounts Committee and I wish the committee well in its deliberations. The survival of the health care system in this country is dependent on an active private sector, often at the forefront of technology, and the salvation of the health care system Order. will come with the policy of Order. the coalition. Senator, Senator Heron, your time has expired, and that concludes the uh, time for the consideration of government documents. We will now proceed to the presentation of other documents. Order. Uh, in accordance with the usual practice, the president, uh, as, as the uh, sorry, in accordance with the usual practice, I table a list of parliamentary committee reports to which the government has not responded within the prescribed period. This list has been circulated to honourable senators. For the concurrence of the, serv uh, of the Senate, the list will be incorporated in Hansard. Uh, order. I present uh, a discussion paper on behalf of the procedure committee. Uh, I present, on behalf of the Procedure Committee, I present a discussion paper on estimates, committees and the appropriation bill. Uh, Senator Foreman. Um, Faulkner. Thank you, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. 
Uh, I present the report of the Standing Committee on Employment, Education and Training on the examination of annual reports and move the report be printed. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. If the ayes have it. There's one on Senator Zakharov's desk. Um, uh, Mr uh, Acting Deputy President, uh, I present the 18th report of the Standing Committee on Publications and seek leave to move a motion in relation to the report. Is leave granted? Being no objection, leave is granted. Mr Acting Deputy President, I move the report be adopted. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. Mr. Uh, Senator Falk, no. President, um, Uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, after some delay I present the interim report of the Standing Committee on Community Affairs on the implementation of pharmaceutical restructuring measures and move the report be printed. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye, against say no, I think the ayes have it. Uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, I seek leave to move a motion relating to the report. Is leave granted? Being no objection, leave is granted. Mr Acting Deputy Senator President, Walker. I move the, the Senate take note of the report. The question is that motion be agreed to. Do you wish to seek leave to continue your remarks on that particular matter? Uh, I, and I seek leave to continue my leave, remarks. Leave is granted. Uh, Senator Schott. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Acting Deputy President, I seek leave to present a submission received by the Select Committee on Political Broadcasts and Political Disclosures. Leave granted. Being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Schott. Mr. President, I present a late submission received by the Select Committee on Political Broadcasts and Political Disclosures. The reason it's being tabled is it is a response to uh, another submission made uh, during the committee's hearings and the person. Uh, responded to some evidence given when that person was named and that uh, they've taught, they've took the opportunity to have their response tabled sorry good did you move a well I, I just moving it uh, I, I present a late submission received by the select committee on political broadcast and political disclosures oh, I just no. gave a very very brief explanation of why uh, we thought it necessary to do it well, you do have another report I believe yes Senator Shaw. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, uh, I uh, present to the Senate for tabling uh, the report of the Joint Committee on Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade on its inquiry into Australia's relations with, uh, with, PN, uh, with PNG. And I seek, uh, I seek leave to present it. No, no need, you don't need leave to present that, uh, Senator Shaw. Uh, I also, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr Chairman, seek leave to um, incorporate into Hansard a tabling statement. Is leave granted? Being no objection, leave is granted. Um, are there any other reports from committees? Senator Harradine. Uh, Mr Chairman, uh, I move that the Senate take notice, note of the paper uh, that has been referred to by Senator Schott, that is to say the uh, uh, Joint uh, Committee on Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade, Australian Relations with Papua New Guinea. Um, Do you seek leave? I seek leave to move that motion, Mr Chairman. Is leave granted? Being no objection, leave is granted. Um, Mr uh, Acting Deputy President, um, um, I move that the Senate take note of the um, uh, uh, Joint uh, Committee on Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade, Australia's Relations with Papua New Guinea. Uh, this um, matter is uh, not contained on the red, uh, at, uh, well not on the red uh, that has been uh, distributed and therefore presumably uh, people are not uh, aware that it's going to be debated today. Uh, I became aware of it because um, uh, I happened to hear that it was debated in the House of Representatives and uh, I made some inquiries uh, of the um, uh, of the of officials here 
and uh, they indicated to me that it was a mere misprint uh, of the uh, of of the red. It's not a deliberate no, it's a, it's a mere misprint of the red. And uh, but I simply refer to that fact because uh, obviously other senators uh, may not be aware of the fact that this matter is coming uh, before us. Uh, and uh, I make that point because I know that there are a, a number of uh, uh, members, a considerable number of members of the parliament who are very, very interested in the issue of Australia's relationship uh, with uh, Papua New Guinea. After all, I believe that that is a, a, if not the most crucial relationship of all of our foreign affairs interests. I note uh, that the committee uh, refers uh, on page um, Roman numeral 26, uh, make, uh, the committee uh, makes this statement. Of particular concern to the government of the people of Papua New Guinea is the level of, um, uh, no, I'm sorry, uh, it's uh, page 26.5. Uh, Central to the argument of this report is the view that the relationship between Australia and Papua New Guinea has weakened over time, especially at the individual level, and that the understanding of the people of each country have of the other is not as deep or as thorough as it should be for such close neighbours. It is a cultural trade imbalance. Papua New Guineans know much more of us than we know of them. The fault lies particularly with Australians. Apart from those people whose connections with PNG go back to pre-independence days and the small group of officials who deal with the relationship at an official level, there are few in Australia who know or understand uh, PNG well. Uh, Papua New Guinea does not figure in Australian school curricula. There are few cultural, sporting or tourist links in the media in Australia. Uh, present a narrow and sensationalised view of PNG as a violent and disintegrating society. And uh, the committee says it believes that there must be vast improvement these links from the Australian side. I agree entirely. It's, uh, it's a pivotal relationship. It's a relationship which must be worked on, as every successful relationship uh, must. Uh, there must be attention given to it. Um, and constant and consistent attention uh, given to it. Um, it is true that the, um, the press, and, and indeed, um, well, the press in Australia does sensationalise uh, situations that are occurring in PNG. Uh, the image of PNG uh, amongst Australians, therefore, has become somewhat tarnished. And that's unfair. Unfair to the vast. Uh, majority of Papua New, Guinean, uh, Papua New Guineans, and it's unfair uh, to, um, to those of us uh, who have got a great deal of respect uh, for that nation, and to those of us who regard that nation as of pivotal importance uh, to uh, Australia. Not only that, but we regard, uh, uh, the, uh, we, we believe that uh, we do have an obligation, a very important obligation to our nearest neighbour, Papua New Guinea. It does, uh, uh, it, it's obvious that uh, time does not permit uh, uh, at uh, this, on this last day of this uh, last session this year uh, to uh, develop uh, uh, a, 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 a um, a discussion uh, which this, um, uh, this report uh, uh, does uh, demand. Uh, I've only had the report uh, for a very short while, uh, but I must uh, say, uh, express some uh, reservations about some matters in the report, uh, because I believe that uh, the committee has uh, uh, made a certain recommendation uh, based on assumptions which were not tested. And I think that's unfair and it's un unfortunate. Um, let me uh, uh, refer uh, to uh, those uh, recommendations to which I, I, I have just, uh, uh, which I've indicated are unfair and unfortunate. Um, let me refer to recommendation uh, four. 
on uh, page 41 and uh, to uh, um, recommendation 10. Uh, those uh, uh, two references, uh, those two recommendations, uh, which insofar as they re 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 refer to family planning, appear um, to uh, the uh, uninformed reader to be harmless enough. However, there is little or no evidence in the report of the committee uh, 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 that the committee ex uh, 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 questioned the basic premises or, or adopted a prudent or cautious approach in respect of these matters. Um, for example, uh, going to um, uh, those uh, recommendations, um, um, if I can just uh, pick them up. Um, um, it, uh, for example, recommendation four says the committee recommends that Australia offer a special <coughs> project to, to the Family Planning Association of Papua New Guinea in order that they might develop and promote comprehensive services on birth control. This aid would be delivered either through an expansion of current NGOs, non-government organisations, uh, services, or through an ADAB health project. We should also encourage the United Nations Family Planning Association to be involved. Now it does so after having said at 3.2.4 uh, that, um, uh, that uh, uh, a certain group of people whom uh, the committee uh, indicated they saw in uh, Port Moresby uh, thought that population control needed to be made a priority of government with programs directed at reducing the high maternal, inf uh, maternal and infant mortality rates. Um, and, um, uh, and having said that, um, it, it goes on with um, 3.2.5. Already Papua New Guinea has not been able to expand its educational system or its employment opportunities at a rate that keeps pace with population growth. Therefore, continued growth in the population at a rate higher than economic growth is poten uh, potentially very serious. It puts pressure on land, it stretches the capacity of the education and health systems, it worsens the unemployment situation, and it creates problems of lawlessness in the towns and, and in the highlands. I'll come back to that in a minute because it's a ludicrous statement. It's an assumption that's made, and it's unfairly blaming the fertility of the poor women in Papua New Guinea for a whole range of problems. Totally untested assumption. The, uh, when I said that um, the, the committee appears to have accepted certain basic premises without having adopted a prudent and cautious approach to, to them, um, I give certain examples. Uh, was the committee aware of the um, unfortunate uh, track record of uh, UNFPA when it uh, recommended um, its involvement in future Australian aid activities? Did the committee examine the question of UNFPA's support for uh, uh, the scandalous Depot Provera based population control program in Papua New Guinea? And did it examine uh, ADAB's involvement therein? And, was it, and did it examine ADAB's involvement uh, in um, uh, together with uh, IPPF, International Planned Parenthood Federation, and UNFPA, in the process of institutional strengthening of elites in Papua New Guinea, to the detriment of uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the ordinary people in Papua New Guinea. And if it didn't examine this question of the use of Depo Provera in Papua New Guinea, why didn't it do so? Why is there no mention in this report about that? I mean, here is a, uh, uh, here is a drug that is being uh, used uh, uh, in, um, uh, in Papua New Guinea, uh, which uh, 
which the UNFPA project uh, um, has, uh, um, uh, is placing uh, great reliance on in its population control program in Papua New Guinea. Uh, in fact, uh, Depot Bavera accounts for 63.3 per cent of the total funds to be spent on, the con on contraceptive purchases for women by United Nations uh, uh, UNFPA uh, for the PNG pro project. Uh, this indicates that UNFPA has decided that approximately six out of every ten targeted women will use Depot Prefera. And um, uh, this despite the fact that um, that particular drug, Depot Prefera, is not a drug that is recommended in Australia uh, for use. In fact, it's not authorised in Australia uh, for uh, use as a, uh, for contraceptive uh, purposes. And here, uh, of course, you have uh, a situation where, um, though it's not um, approved for use in Australia as a, a, for contraceptive purposes, uh, it's uh, presumably considered uh, by UNFPA and others as suitable for, uh, for PNG. Now, that... Uh, that uh, is a, a real issue, and, and why didn't the committee ask uh, questions uh, um, about that? Does not that uh, smack of some sort of colonial attitude, that uh, something that is not approved uh, uh, for a particular purpose uh, in Australia can uh, be uh, used uh, um, as the flagship, as it were, of the uh, population control program um, funded by UNFPA and supported by, I uh, might I say, by ADAB, by our taxpayers' money. Now, those are sorts of things that I believe that the committee uh, should have had a look at. Uh, did the committee uh, have regard to the possible conflict between the social and religious attitudes of Papua New Guineans and the methods uh, which the family planning bureaucrats attempt to impose on their client states. After all, the committee quotes at paragraph 1.5.17 from a submission wherein it is stated that, and I quote, Papua New, Guinea, Papua New Guineans are amongst the most religious people on earth. And yet you have a situation where uh, the um, those who call the tune internationally on population control uh, are pushing uh, women in particular uh, and families uh, into situations uh, which are quite contrary to their cultural and uh, religious convictions. No mention of this uh, in the committee's report and uh, I think that is a, a failing. Uh, and uh, should uh, be mentioned here. There is also room for potential conflict in the area of human rights. In Recommendation 49, the committee very sensibly states that, and I quote, the Australian government should explore ways in which Australian aid to PNG might be used to enhance safeguards for human rights protection. But it's in precisely in the area of family planning that gross violations of human rights can occur. Uh, witness, for example, uh, the um, uh, gross violations of human rights in this area that, are, that occur in uh, China and, uh, and uh, in a number of other countries. I've been informed uh, that already tubal ligations have been performed on women without their full understanding of what was involved and the general irreversible nature of that operation in PNG. Well, why weren't questions asked about that? Here we have a situation where international, uh, international driven population control uh, organisations are attempting to impose their view on Papua New Guinea. I'm disappointed that the focus of the report has been on the quick fix approach of the family planning salesman from New York and Washington and now Canberra, many of whose methods do not accord with local customs, religion or cultural values. 
while there appears to have been little or no attention given to the genuine needs for better and more widespread uh, uh, medical attention at birth deliveries. That has been the biggest correctable cause of maternal mortality, not the number of children a woman has. I go back to uh, 3.2.5, uh, which I, uh, I read. Um, it's talking about uh, already Papua New Guinea has not been able to expand its education system or, or its employment opportunities at the rate that keeps pace with population growth. Therefore, continued growth in the population at the rate higher than economic growth is potentially very serious. It puts pressure on the land, it stretches the capacity of the education and health system, it worsens the unemployment situation and creates problems of lawlessness in the towns and in the highlands. All assertions made, not one attempt to back up those assertions or to discuss them at all not one attempt. And I'm very disappointed in that because uh, um, we could be regarded and called as uh, colonialists in trying to impose our views of the world uh, on Papua New Guinea. It talks about uh, um, pressure on land. Uh, Mr uh, Deputy President, uh, people that know about PNG know that, uh, that it is a fertile land and uh, properly uh, uh, managed. There need be no pressure on the land. In fact, uh, one of the causes of the downturn in employment uh, is uh, the, uh, uh, the severe decline in prices in agriculture. And as the committee says on uh, page 27, the committee itself says on page 27.7, um, uh, as follows. In agriculture, however, a sector where most of the population is employed, there has been a severe decline in prices. And there's a severe decline in prices there, clearly, is not the ability of the... Um, uh, uh, of, um, uh, the um, uh, producers uh, to make uh, that necessary uh, profit to employ people. And of course it has an effect on employment. It's not the question of the, because there are more people. And it then goes on to say even, and, and, and I'm just quoting the uh, uh, committee's report against itself. Even the improvement in productivity that has been ach achieved in agriculture has not ha offset this decline in prices, nor has there been a successful movement into value-added manufacturing like linked to commodities. Well, there it is. That's what the, uh, the thrust should be, and I, I admit that, uh, yeah, and, and, and I acknowledge at least, I acknowledge that in the report uh, that is what's being suggested in certain sections of the report, uh, that there should be more attention given uh, to the value adding uh, that is needed. And, um, um, uh, but um, it's clear that um, uh, PMG, being an exporter of, in the agricultural area, uh, is suffering because of uh, the decline in, in, in prices. Uh, so, um, that uh, assertion about increasing pressure on land, why is it in the report? Why put that in the report? Is the committee suggesting uh, that uh, uh, PNG uh, is uh, not sufficiently fertile to uh, even to meet its own demands uh, uh, in the area? of uh, basic commodities. But that's not an argument anyhow for, um, uh, for the imposition of a dictatorial population control program. The whole numbers of countries 
uh, in the world, who have got very large populations and, uh, uh, and uh, very prosperous populations uh, who don't have the land, uh, the fertile land, uh, sufficient to uh, meet the uh, production or sufficient to produce uh, uh, their, their own food. Singapore, uh, as an example, Hong Kong, Japan, because they make their money in other ways. So this assertion about increased uh, pressure on land, why is it there? Stretching the capacity of the education health system. Um, increased population, uh, of course, uh, does challenge those who are responsible for the delivery of health and education to ensure that those services are indeed delivered. What's the implication here? Say, well, just because uh, uh, the, uh, the population has increased, well, we won't uh, concentrate on making sure that uh, uh, health uh, services are, uh, are become the priority or employment uh, or uh, education becomes a priority. As I indicated before, one of the key uh, 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 one of the key uh, things to overcome uh, the problem or a problem of ma maternal mortality is to have um, uh, a far better and more widespread um, uh, medical attention at, uh, at uh, birth deliveries. These are the areas that uh, need to be attended to. Um, it's, and the last uh, point that the committee says uh, for its uh, recommendation is creating, that the population is creating, the increase in population is creating problems of lawlessness in the towns and in the highlands. I mean, what does that mean? Does that mean that it's because of the increases in population that, the, um, uh, that uh, there is this uh, problem of lawlessness? Let me quote the committee against itself again. On, in uh, page uh, uh, 26, uh, on, in paragraph uh, 4, uh, it says this, of particular concern to the government of the people of Papua New Guinea is the level of violence that exists in the country. A, a tradition of tribal warfare has long existed in the highlands, but today uh, rascal gangs belie the mischievousness of their name and spread real fear throughout the towns. It is a development that destroys the order and peace of the lives of local inhabitants, mars PNG's reputation and threatens uh, seriously to inhibit economic development. Worst of all, there's potential to infiltrate and corrupt political processes. Now, uh, clearly, what the committee is saying uh, is not that it's as a result of uh, increased uh, population, uh, population growth. Uh, it's clearly uh, uh, situating that in the context of uh, uh, certain gangs uh, uh, adopting uh, 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 mischievous activities um, and um, blaming on uh, blaming them virtually on uh, old uh, tribal warfare traditions. Now that's not going to be overcome by throwing the pill or uh, injecting women with deep overbearing. How's that going to be overcome by doing that? And. Uh, um, I believe it's uh, uh, really time that uh, people had a look at some of these assumptions and uh, examined them more thoughtfully. Because there are many people who dishonestly peddle these prejudiced notions to serve their own vested interests. And those uh, people are in the organisations such as UNFPA, such as IPPF, who are spending enormous amounts of money indoctrinating 
people in the third world, in uh, developing countries, uh, with uh, uh, their predators, and that's happening in Papua New Guinea. Now, I've quite proof of that, and it would have been uh, interesting for the committee to have obtained some of that proof and ask questions of people who they saw as to whether uh, this agenda was their own agenda or whether it was um, as a result of the indoctrination that's taken place by those with the vested interest. So uh, there are many people in those organisations who dishonestly peddle those uh, prejudices. But there are many other well-meaning people who are preyed upon by that type of gravy train elite and who are, are force-fed that nonsense. The report doesn't show that slowing the pace of population growth will make any difference whatsoever. And let me just give you an example in my state. Uh, well, is, is, the, is the report suggesting that, OK, there should be no uh, population uh, growth and that over the next, say, 14 years? Let me say that in my state there's been a 10 per cent drop in the number of uh, uh, people aged 0 to 19 in the last um, um, in the last 10 years, a 10 per cent drop uh, in the number of, uh, of people in that age bracket. And yet unemployment is going through the roof. Now we've had a drop of population, uh, uh, of population in that age bracket. So throwing the pill or, or injecting women with depropovera is not going to uh, have uh, any effect, uh, and certainly the committee hasn't, suggest, uh, hasn't said how its recommendation is going to uh, result therein. Now, um, Mr. Uh, Deputy President, I believe that we've uh, uh, that the uh, committee um, should have had a look at that, uh, and should uh, not blame, as it has done the problems in Papua New Guinea on the fertility of the poor women in that country. As I said uh, in a speech that I delivered to, the, uh, to ADAP uh, on the 25th of July of this year, enabling the true human development of each individual can be seen as the main object of society and therefore of political and economic systems. Individuals and families are the core of society. Their well-being is therefore central to the political and economic process which seek to promote development. There is no sound and authentic development of a society unless priority is given to the needs of individuals and families within that society. To the extent that any action taken is not in the real interest of individuals and families, then it is not contributing to true human development. The totalitarian ideologies of fascist and communist states sought to develop societies at the expense of the rights of individuals and families. They fail to acknowledge that the family is the natural and fundamental group unit of society with preeminent rights and functions. They have been condemned by their victims and by history. Only by respecting the rights and values of the subjects of development can a solid framework for economic and social development assistance be laid. And I believe that the assumptions that are made by that committee uh, for its recommendation in that particular area uh, reflect a, 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 a totalitarian ideology. It reflects a situation which could end in Papua New Guineans, the ordinary Papua New Guineans, uh, accusing us of cultural imperialism and the return of, uh, of colonial, uh, colonial <coughs> domination in Order. this particular area. The question is the. Uh so that take note of the report, those, those opinions say aye, the contrary no, I think the ayes have it. Uh, are there any documents to be presented by the clerk? Certain delegated legislation is tabled. The President has received messages from His Excellency the Governor-General notifying assent to eight laws, details of which will be incorporated in Hansard. 
the Honourable Minister. Uh, Mr Deputy President, uh, pursuant to notice and on behalf of relevant ministers, I move that the following bills be introduced. A bill to establish a construction industry development council and a construction industry reform agency for the purposes of promoting and facilitating development and reform of the construction industry in Australia and for related purposes. A bill to amend the Migration Act 1958. A bill to amend the Trade Practices Act 1974 to provide for the compensation of persons who suffer loss caused by defective goods. Uh, the question is the motion be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Minister. I present the bills and move that these bills may proceed without formalities, may be taken together and be now read a first time. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Construction Industry Reform and Development Bill 1991. Migration Amendment Bill No. 4, 1991, and Trade Practices Amendment Bill No. 2, 1991. The Honourable Minister. Mr Deputy President, uh, I table explanatory memoranda relating to the bills and move that these bills be now read a second time, and I seek leave to have the second reading speeches incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Reid. Uh, Mr Deputy President, I move that further consideration of these bills be adjourned. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Minister? I move that the bills be listed on the notice paper as separate orders of the day. Now the question is the motion be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Pursuant to order of the Senate of the 14th of October 1991, the resumption of debate shall be orders of the day for the first day of sitting in 1992. Clark? Government Business Order of the Day, National Road Transport Commission Bill 1991, adjourned debate on the motion that the bill be read a second time and on the amendment moved thereto by Senator Chapman. Senator Calvert. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy President, and can I thank you for assisting me in taking the chair at such short notice. Uh, in the brief time that I had before a, a lunch and adjournment, I was pointing out that this particular um, Road, National Road Transport Commission bill. Um, I was pointing out uh, that as part of that bill we, we should recognise the significant uh, road transport system we have in Australia, provided by private enterprise, and I drew the analogy with the, uh, the failed transport system of the, United, uh, of the USSR, uh, which I observed last year as to be in a total shambles. And um, we, in, on, on this side of the House, are very concerned about the way this bill has been brought, rushed into the House with no costing, uh, no, uh, with no uh, evidence as to what effect it's going to have on the transport system in, Tas in, in Australia. Uh, and uh, I, was, I was going to point out that uh, the bureaucracy that exists in the United, in, in USSR um, seems to be uh, working its way under, in under this uh, um, this particular bill, because the National Road Transport Commission will have at least 21 committees set up by Austroads, a group of the uh, all road transport authorities, whose work uh, bears directly on the commission, and these committees alone will immediately occupy about 10 per cent of the total staff time available in the, in the, uh, to the Commission. And I guess that uh, the industry will find uh, uh, it's bad enough now keeping up with the bureaucracy, but I think uh, with another 21 committees you'll find it almost impossible to keep up with that. And in addition to that, the National Road Transport Commission will need to act as a secretariat to the Ministerial Council and this may take up to half the Commission staff time. So serious questions should be asked about the level of bureaucracy uh, that's involved with this particular um, bill. I must say that uh, the Coalition has certainly endorsed transport reform, 
but we've always said that it must be fair and equitable. And we've persisted in calls for an economic impact study to be, car uh, be carried out before any charges are implemented. And I think the uh, amendment that's moved by Senator Chapman uh, highlights that. And certainly it is going to a committee, uh, but it seems to be a question of the, of the horse following the cart. Now we know uh, from the industry itself there has been a lot of comment. Um, the National Transport Federation has said that uh, the bill is flawed on technical, democratic and economic grounds and will lead to results that are contrary to the stated aims of, of land transport reform. The uh, National Transport Federation, as we know, is the largest representative organisation of large vehicle long distance transport businesses in Australia and is a member of the Road Transport Forum, so I think they should know what they're talking about. They uh, say in a comment I read from them that they support the reform process as a means of improving the efficiency of freight movement in Australia and they certainly support the formation of a commission as an expert body to independently develop a fairer and better regulatory environment to our industry in an ongoing manner. But they certainly don't support uh, the current terms within the bill which binds the commission to a terms of reference and the agreement signed by heads of government. And there's no need to go into all that, but I'll just quote from a press release that I, or, or from a statement they made. And I quote, along with our federation and, and the road transport forum, these groups believe that whilst reform is necessary and able to achieve real cost reductions in land transport, the current process is unjustified and will lead to higher costs, which is contrary to the aims of reform and against the interest of our nation. The governments have not done their homework. The bill and what it will lead to are flawed. I wish to uh, briefly uh, turn to the effect that it, have, it, it may have on my own state of Tasmania. And I noted, Mr Deputy President, this morning, uh, I think it was Sen Senator Boswell uh, was commenting about the, uh, um, the effect he would see it having on um, remote Australia. And uh, might I say, Mr Deputy President, as far as remoteness is concerned, Tasmania certainly, uh, when you're referring to freight, is probably the most remote uh, area in Australia because we've suffered for many, many years uh, over the, with the problem of uh, vast straight shipping and, uh, and the like, and airline strikes of, of the two, of course. And it's a fact at the moment that uh, a vast majority of our... Of our uh, Freight comes into the north of the state and has to be transported south to the capital city. So uh, the concerns that have been raised by particularly Tasmanian uh, operators, I believe, are questions that the government should take note of. A question comes to mind is that uh, given that Tasmania is already struggling to maintain a viable e economy, uh, why is this process being achieved, uh, pursued? I, asked, I mentioned this morning I'm, I'm quite uh, concerned the fact that the Tasmanian government agreed to place Tasmania in the high charge zone, along with Victoria and New South Wales. I'd like to know what basis was this decision made, on, on what basis was, was this decision made, and uh, what further impact will it have on our crumbling economy? These are some of the questions that should have been answered before this bill came into the place. I'd uh, also query um, what charges the government is going to force on the road transport and possibly cars, but particularly road transport, from the 1st of January 1993. And uh, some figures were mentioned this morning by Senator Boswell. Mm -hmm. He was talking about uh, 45 tonne vehicles uh, having an increased uh, cost of 8,000, moving up to 14,000 by 1995. All these uh, added costs coming on top of uh, an industry that already pays 3.5% more taxes than any other business in Australia, uh, three and a half times uh, other, the taxes of other businesses in Australia is, is quite alarming when, when we all uh, re rely so much on our transport system. And we know that uh, 
The government started investigating the increased charges in 1985, but we still haven't got the answers. Now, I had a letter sent to me only yesterday, actually, from the Secretary of the Tasmanian Truck Owners and Operators Association. I don't intend to read it all, but I, it does point out one particular difference between um, trucking in Tasmania and, and, and the rest of Australia, and that's our cart carrier licensing uh, licensing system, which ensures that um, the remote communities in the state um, are placed on an equal footing with, with the uh, more populated areas. Um, as you would understand, Mr Deputy President, some company routes tend to be less profitable than principal routes, but the, the zoning or the cart carrier licensing system we have in Tasmania certainly helps to um, even that out. And, uh, the secretary here, when he writes, he said, if the federal government is successful in dismantling the licensing system in Tasmania and displacing small operators from the industry, the country and more remote communities will, will suffer. He goes on to say that some large transport operators who generally operate between ports and use principal routes are promoting excessively high taxes and charges with the knowledge that some existing operators will be forced from the industry. It is their belief that all increases will be passed on to the consumer. So uh, we have that situation now where this extra charge on transport is going, I believe anyway, to cause quite significant increases in freight. We know that uh, the intention or the stated intention of the government is to, uh, to use this uh, road tax to improve our road system. But I'd say to you, Mr Deputy President, if they've been fair dinkum about the excise they've been taking out of uh, fuel for the last uh, few years um, and putting that back into the roads where it should have been spent, we certainly wouldn't be in the position we're in now. And uh, one only has to look at the, the, uh, the chart I have here real excise collections and road funding from 75 through to 92. Now the, the amount spent on road funding is, is a pretty level graph, but the excise collected uh, is way and above. Um, in fact, the, the amount spent on roads that was sent early, that was, was sent, uh, that was spent, that was said this morning was a bit over a billion dollars, and yet we, the government are receiving just under f uh, between four and a half and five billion dollars in excise collections. Now, as we know, and has been said by uh, my colleagues, under our proposed fight back proposal, um, fuel excise, wholesale ta sales tax, tariffs, and, and payroll tax um, will be removed from the road transport industry and will have a very significant effect on the costs and charges to all Australians. We are about removing fuel taxes, we're about removing wholesale sales taxes, we're about abolishing payroll tax, and we're about getting rid of tariffs. And uh, we're not about putting on extra road taxes and charges to, to make the cost of freight to all Australians more expensive. It goes without saying that the the road transport operators and the road users and the rail systems, for that matter, are overjoyed at our package, and uh, they see that a future government is prepared to get rid of the shackles of government taxation on inputs and let them be truly competitive. There's no doubt under our proposals, under the fight back uh, proposals, road transport will be a big winner, and in addition, road funding will not be reduced. That's been made quite clear by the leader. The package that we're uh, proposing will mean that transport in this country will be cheaper and uh, I'm pleased to say as a Tasmanian to all my Tasmanian constituents that uh, I believe that Tasmania will certainly uh, be uh, a state that will probably uh, get the best benefit from uh, this particular package because at the present time they play, uh, the, a lot of the shipping companies that travel across Bass Strait are paying um, quite high fuel excise uh, which increases the freight anyway. So I just make the point in conclusion, Mr uh, Deputy President, 
that this bill, this pig in a poke that, that came in here without any costing, without any uh, investigation into the impact it's going to have on Australia, for whatever reason, I don't know, has been pushed through this place uh, prior to the Christmas break. Given the fact that the Democrats are going to support the government, we believe, and uh, push this through, we're going to have a framework that's set up, and I suppose it's anybody's guess uh, what sort of charges and regulations we'll see next year further down the track. The, hon the Honourable the Minister. Uh, oh. I'm sorry, uh, Mr Deputy President. There are at least two other speakers uh, on my speakers list, uh, Senator Crichton Brown and... Uh, never mind. Uh, Mr they're, Acting... Uh, they're on my list too, but they, I couldn't call them because they weren't no, here. No, quite right. Uh, Mr uh, uh, Deputy President, but, um, I think that, uh, that I, I don't want to detain you the, the, the Senate long uh, for the simple reason... Uh, uh, Mr Deputy President, I do want to be consistent about this, that uh, as a member of the committee uh, who uh, introduced our new procedures of uh, referring uh, legislation to standing committees of the parliament for the alleged purpose of uh, restraining uh, unnecessary uh, repetitious debate in the chamber and considering that that committee sat uh, from 8pm in the evening until 2am on the following morning and all of the arguments that we've heard here in the chamber this afternoon were uh, exhaust, exhausted and I use that word advisedly uh, during that previous debate and indeed nothing uh, new was added uh, Mr uh, Deputy President to what we've heard here this afternoon I would like to make a, a few uh, passing references, though, to uh, the general, if you like, uh, um, uh, <laughs> what do we do there? He's missed out. I'll just keep going for a moment. No, yeah, Mr. Yeah, Mr. 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 Deputy Chairman, could I just say that? Uh, I'm, perfect, I'm perfectly happy, and I, I'm sure it would be in order, if at the conclusion of my remarks, uh, Senator Colt, who, if he sought leave uh, to speak, uh, I would be perfectly happy to uh, give him leave to do so, um, so that he's not, uh, not denied an opportunity. Mr Deputy President, um, the speaker's list has evidently changed. There are several no, hold, hold on. Actually, no, I meant we're not hold, finished. Hold <laughs> uh, the, the minister suggested that when he finishes his comments, you may seek leave, and I think that that would be the best way to do it. Thanks, Mr Deputy President. Um, once again, of course, I was intrigued to hear what has become uh, conventional over the years with national party politicians. And uh, certainly in every election that I have campaigned in, uh, they've run the same line, and that is perfectly happy to support when it's politically necessary to do so. Uh, the line that is run in the town by their Liberal colleagues, but also perfectly happy to run a totally different line themselves in the bush. And uh, we heard that once again here this afternoon. And uh, the interesting thing about it, of course, is that in terms of the concerns that were expressed about any increases of, uh, in road charges, uh, by uh, this new national regime, a very welcome reform initiative, I might add, for which the Commonwealth, of course, cannot take sole responsibility because we are equal partners in this with the states and the ACT. Mr. Uh, Mr. President, well, well, in response to that uh, interjection, uh, Mr. Deputy President, and I shouldn't be disorderly enough to respond to interjections, um, but this one I will. Uh, the Northern Territory Government, of course, uh, does have some concerns um, about what I think Mr Finch described during that committee as a 5 per cent component, was his word of the charging, but fully supports and have committed themselves to introduce parallel legislation, all of the other aspects of this package. Because what this package will do, Mr Deputy President, 
is to provide for the first time in our nation's history a national regime of operation for heavy vehicles in this country, so vital to our transport sector, and will remove the horrendous uh, commercial uh, um, inequities and, uh, and disefficiencies in uh, the operation of road transport that currently exist, uh, with trucks having to travel as they do from state to state. And of course, as was pointed out uh, by uh, witnesses and uh, departmental officers and myself at that committee, very significant charges currently apply, currently apply in states for trucks uh, operating in those states uh, that are registered elsewhere. Mr Deputy President, the point I want to make so far as the National Party is concerned is that they're supporting the GST package. The GST package emphatically, and in fact to a degree which I protest against and disagree with, uh, talks about uh, the unilateral imposition of a user-pays uh, uh, system, fully supports it. At the same time, and I've pointed out this nonsense to the Senate before, proposes the removal of uh, fuel excise, which of course currently funds a significant proportion of uh, those costs, which means, of course, Mr Deputy President, by logical implication, that if they are to introduce true uh, user pays, and that's what they say they will do in their GST document, then some other method must be introduced to replace that component of uh, revenue raising for road funding that they're going to remove. And I have to say the only way I can see of doing it is by some system of mass distance charging, uh, because the current uh, uh, revenue raiser is going to be removed with the full support of the National Party. But I just point out again, Mr Deputy President, that it's always with the National Party. Support the Liberal uh, coalition line uh, when you're in town and then tell another story to your constituents when you go bush. And I had recent experience of this in the transport area. We had Tim Fisher touring Northern Australia not so long ago. Mr Tim, Mr. Tim Fisher, Mr Tim Fisher, absolutely, he needs all the help he can get off. I'm happy to put Mr on the front of that. Well, Mr Tim Fisher was cruising Queensland and quite happily, of course, committed uh, the coalition to providing $1 billion in additional federal funding for Queensland roads alone while he was there. He floated across to the Northern Territory on the same trip and committed the coalition to the construction of the Alice Springs to Darwin Railway at the same time. Just another billion dollars. So in the space of a week... Oh, absolutely, uh, Senator Cook. Uh, in the space of a week, uh, the leader of the national rump of the, uh, of the coalition had committed his party to the expenditure of $2 billion uh, in the space of uh, two days uh, travelling from uh, Queensland to the Northern Territory. But I have, to, so I have to put that in context. When I was retailing that story to a, a journalist uh, from the uh, press gallery here, he said to me, oh, well, I suppose if it was anyone else but Tim Fisher, perhaps it would matter. Well, I guess uh, I'd have to, uh, I guess for accuracy, uh, uh, agree with that uh, comment, but nevertheless, that is the traditional performance of national party members, previously country party, and they haven't changed over the years. And I've been very used to it. That is to consistently support their coalition partners in savage public spending, cutting government services, chopping this off, chopping that off, and then, of course, going out to their electorates and promising the world with massive additional federal government spending for people in the bush. Never actually delivering it. Never actually delivering it, of course. But it was interesting. <laughs> Absolutely. And uh, Mr. Deputy President, I was also intrigued in terms of the GST package, in terms of the consistency of the Queensland Liberal Party with the Nationals on this issue, to see a, uh, a number of resolutions passed at the recent state conference of the Liberal Party in Queensland. A, fully supporting the the uh, application of a whopping 15 per cent retail tax on every motel bed, every restaurant meal, every souvenir purchased, every bus trip taken, every tourist package per purchased, every trip to Magnetic Island, 15 per cent on the lot, and at the same Liberal conference decry and protest against any further impost of government charges on the important tourist industry for Queensland. They're not particularly consistent, but yet we heard the same line run in here by our National Party representatives today in respect of this legislation. And, the, and there is one general philosophical point I do want to make. 
and that is the sneering references that were made continually by, op by opposition speakers during the debate to the great federal initiatives of the Prime Minister. Now, this is a hobby horse of mine, Mr Deputy President, and I concede it. I was a delegate to two constitutional conventions. I declared after the last one, and in fact I can remember discussing it with a uh, former senator in here for whom I have enormous respect then and still have, and that is Senator Macklin. We got together at that conference and both decided we'd never attend another one. And having conceded that constitutional reform to remove these inefficiencies in our transport system, Mr Deputy President, is impossible because of the conservative approach we have to changing our constitution, this kind of initiative is the only approach that we can possibly use to succeed. And to continually refer to it in this disparaging way, I must say, from public figures who have got a responsibility, in my view, to help to bring this nation together rather than tear it apart, doesn't do them any credit. And the reason I want to make that point is this. This is not a piece of legislation which is a creature of the Commonwealth Government, nor is it something which the Commonwealth Government is or can, under the provisions of the Act, force down the throats of reluctant states. It is a legislative framework which incorporates the heads of agreement that was reached between the heads of government of the states, uh, the ACT and, in principle, the Northern Territory, uh, with the exception of the charging, and the Commonwealth, in which the Commonwealth is an equal partner. On the Ministerial Council, we get one vote along with the rest. And the fundamental point that I want to make in conclusion, Mr Deputy President, is this. We have had a long debate here this afternoon, which uh, Senator Calder won't be surprised to hear uh, uh, was, is, is a complete reiteration of the six continuous hours of debate we had at the committee on charging. The fact is that this legislation in front of us today has got nothing whatever to do with that. It simply sets up the framework for the organisation which will make recommendations, and that's what they are, to the people that actually have the executive responsibility for, for making a decision, and that is the, head, the ministerial council on which the Commonwealth only has an equal vote along with the states. And the fundamental point which appears to be utterly lost on members of the opposition, or I think they choose to ignore it, is that we are not in a position. Let's, let's take the theoretical example which I gave at that committee. Should the, uh, the, the uh, Commission go berserk, which they won't, but should they propose some horrendous rate of charges, which would be iniquitous, inequitable and unfair, any head of government, any representative on that ministerial council that has the final decision-making power it can not agree with that decision, and for that state it won't proceed. This entire exercise, Mr Acting Deputy President, depends not simply in its genesis but in its execution on continued cooperation with the state governments and the federal government for the first time in our history to have a national regime, I must say to the great relief fundamentally of the entire transport industry, of the regulatory regime and charging regime we have for moving our, uh, our freight uh, across this country by road. It was welcomed by the states rightly. It is welcomed uh, by the federal government, but we are equal partners in this enterprise. And all this legislation does is to set up the organisation that's going to do it. Mr Acting Deputy President, as this uh, uh, Senate knows full well, the government supported uh, happily uh, the initiatives of the, the Australian Democrats uh, to have uh, further matters referred to the Standing Committee next year. We all know that the actual charging regime must be implemented by law. We know that it will involve separate legislation and regulations, all of which will be debated, as it always is, at length in both the committee, and we know that it will be referred to the committee, because it was done yesterday, at both the committee and back again in this chamber. And uh, in order simply uh, uh, to uh, clarify again, Mr Acting Deputy President, for that reason, having gone over this for six hours, four plus two is six hours in committee, and knowing that we're going to go over it again in both committee and in the House in respect of the actual charging regime next year, I'd conclude uh, by thanking uh, honourable senators, Mr Acting Deputy President, for their contributions to this debate. Senator Calder. Mr Acting Deputy President, I seek leave to uh, speak in this debate. Okay. Leave granted. The leave is granted. Senator Calder. Thank you, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, I'm sorry and I apologise to other senators for not being in the chamber at the, uh, at the time. The, uh, it seems as though there have been quite significant changes to the speakers' list and several speakers have, uh, 
Um, order. Order. Senator um, Coleman. And uh, I would begin by reflecting on the remarks of the, uh, of the Minister in that uh, it seems as though in uh, dealing with uh, areas like this one uh, that one is damned if one does and one is damned if one doesn't. But <laughs> having been, been, been forced away from the ideal of, of national legislation and towards a, uh, a cooperative venture between the states, then the, the, the opposition is uh, taking exception even to that. We're, we're debating this afternoon the National Road Transport Commission Bill, which establishes the machinery to implement a national system of road laws for heavy vehicles. And to recover, and to recover Mr Acting Deputy President, as the uh, Minister has just said, the road costs presently accruing to the states as a result of the use of the road, uh, road system by those vehicles. Specifically, the bill sets up the National Road Transport Commission and the processes by which it is recommended the new laws and charges and defines uh, the Commission's relationship with the Ministerial Council to which it will give its recommendations and federal state parliaments to which the Council will submit any uh, consequential legislation. The National Road Transport Commission Bill is the end result of a long process of research, inquiry and consultation, beginning with the Bureau of Transport and Communications Economics report on road cost recovery, which led to the Interstate Commission inquiry, which recommended that full cost recovery mechanisms be implemented. The report of the now defunct Interstate Commission was refined by its former chair, Ted Butcher, and was developed further by the Commonwealth State Overarching Group on Land Transport under the umbrella of the Special Premier's Conference. And I would interpolate here, Mr Acting Deputy President, um, as the minister has already done, that I find it quite uh, inconsistent of the opposition, who extol the virtues of market mechanisms and to the extent that markets should be used for the proper allocation of resources, the, the, the efficient distribution and allocation of resources, the Democrats also are committed to the use of, the, of those market mechanisms, and the, the basis of the market mechanism is that uh, the user pays. Uh, that is what the government is committed, uh, what the opposition is committed to, and that, of course, is what they're now objecting to objecting to in this, uh, in this bill. I'd, I'd also interpolate here, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, that uh, with respect to some of what um, economists call externalities, these are not being included in this legislation. What is attempted here is simply uh, the recovery of, road, uh, of the road damage charges. But of course, road transport also incurs considerable other expenses uh, to the community in the form of deaths, of the form of injuries, of the form of environmental damage, both in terms of, uh, of acid emissions which uh, erode buildings and in the form of, uh, of greenhouse gas emissions. None of, those, none of those externalities are incorporated into this, uh, into this legislation. So that uh, even this legislation doesn't, uh, doesn't look really uh, at full cost recovery. The Australian Democrats strongly support the principle of road cost recovery. We believe that an efficient and environmentally sound transport sector depends, among, um, among other things, on the right price signals being sent to road users. That is why, despite our significant reservations about the detail of the Commonwealth State Agreement contained in this bill, we have decided to support it. Transport contributes about 40 per cent of Australia's <coughs> emissions of greenhouse gases. If we don't come to grips with the challenge of reducing emissions from this sector, then there's no hope that Australia can meet its target of 20 per cent reductions in greenhouse gas emissions by 2005, much less the ultimate goal of 92 per cent reductions by the middle of next century to ensure that the natural world, to say nothing of our children and our grandchildren, are uh, having to face the impossible task of, of adapting to a never-ending and accelerating climate change. This is a major factor in our support for full cost recovery for road vehicles and the development of an efficient and competitive rail system. The Democrats have been lobbied intensively by representatives of the road transport industry and rural interest groups who are concerned about the impact of the proposed new charges on transport operators and regions which are heavily dependent upon road transport. They believe that the new charges are inequitable 
because the input taxes and charges on the road transport industry are well above the average of all industry sectors, and that raising the level of road charges will hit them with a double whammy. They believe that many operators will be driven to the wall, particularly where foreign competition limits their ability to pass on the new charges to their customers. They believe that rural communities will suffer serious economic difficulties as transport operators fold and local industries become less viable. The Democrats have not formed an opinion as to whether these claims are accurate or not. Like everyone else in this chamber, we are not transport economists. Senator Panizza, like everyone else in this chamber, we are not transport economists. We have been confronted with conflicting, conflicting advice from the industry and the government. What we've decided is that there is a case to be answered. At a time of recession and great rural hardship, Order. we believe that these Order. concerns must be addressed and any corrective measures taken as full cost recovery is set in motion. That is why, that is why Senator Vanessa, we have uh, initiated an inquiry by the Senate Transport Communications and Infrastructure Committee into the regional impacts of full cost recovery and whether the total imposts of taxes and charges on road transport industry warrants adjustments being made as full cost recovery is implemented, and not a six-hour uh, inquiry um, involving a few selected witnesses, but a lengthy inquiry involving, uh, involving uh, a full range of people who may be affected by this legislation. So we do not support the call by the opposition uh, for us to join with them in blocking this legislation. Theirs is an unnecessary, crude and counterproductive approach. To reject this legislation would be to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Not only would the proposed new charges be derailed, but so would, too would the development of uniform national road laws, in the first instance for heavy vehicles, and probably and hopefully for light vehicles in the near future. In other words, the opposition, which claims to be the standard bearer for microeconomic reform, is proposing to block the development of an efficient transport industry. This is sheer irresponsibility, sheer irresponsibility on their part. As I've said, the opposition believes in the operation of the market, which necessarily, necessarily involves user pays, the user pays principle. That is how the market is supposed to efficiently allocate the use of resources. Well, as the opposition knows full well, the Senate will have every right and opportunity to reject the proposed new road charges when they are presented to us as part of the package of road transport legislation to be recommended by the Commission, a point which the government acknowledges and accepts. I will later be moving an amendment to the second reading motion to make it quite clear that passage of this bill does not imply support for the subsequent road transport legislation. There is simply no need to reject this entire bill at this time when the charges are the major bone of contention. The opposition dog has allowed itself to be wagged by the National Party tail. Inconsistency. Oh, yes, you are. <laughs> Senator O'Chi is very, very proud of <laughs> Order. Senator Order. Chi, I'm, I'm pleased Senator to see that, that uh, you're pleased to be described as the National Order. Party Order. tail which wags the, <laughs> the opposition dog. The inconsistency of the opposition's economic policy uh, in this regard has been, uh, has been well uh, uh, canvassed by the minister and, of course, one need only also point out to uh, um, to um, Senator Boswell, who is also in the chamber, that uh, the other day he was uh, caught out in relation to tariff reductions in the, uh, the opposition's uh, fight-back package as well. Opposition speakers in this debate have expanded a great deal of energy in, in attacking the Democrats over our inability to attend last Wednesday's meeting of the Transport, Communications and Infrastructure Committee to consider this bill, Order. and I want to put a few of these, uh, the few facts uh, on the record uh, in, uh, in relation to this matter. Last Wednesday's meeting, Mr. Acting Deputy uh, President, was organised at very short notice. At very Order. short notice, having been changed several times in the preceding few days, as should be well known to committee members, 
Senator Order. Powell, our transport spokesman, is on compassionate leave and was not able to attend. She had given the carriage of this bill to me, but I had a prior engagement which I felt it was very important to honour, as many other senators from time to time have had. Furthermore, the agreement that had been Stracking, oh, Deputy nah. President, the agreement that had been reached between ourselves and the government, the agreement which had been reached between ourselves and the government to amend the bill and establish oh, nah. the inquiry meant that last Wednesday's meeting had been made somewhat redundant. We were therefore oh, concerned nah. that oh, the nah. opposition we were therefore con concerned and are still concerned that the opposition had unilaterally unilaterally mr acting deputy president invited a large number of witnesses some of whom travelled a long distance at their own expense to a meeting which would not achieve which would not achieve any formal outcome they sat for 6 hours to achieve what, what i achieved with them in 10 minutes it oh, should have no. been blindingly obvious to the opposition from our press release Senator of last Minister. tuesday Order. Last Order. Tuesday, the day before their meeting, that it Order. would have been much more constructive to hear from their witnesses next year in the context of the inquiry, which has already been agreed to. They nevertheless chose to proceed with their invitations. It was a matter of great concern to me that the witnesses who attended in good faith clearly understood that the Democrats are very interested to hear from them, particularly in the context of the inquiry. A brief meeting, a brief meeting, Senator Kemp. A brief meeting between 15 of those witnesses from the road transport industry representatives and myself was organised before the public hearing, and a written statement was circulated to those attending to outline our position and apologise for our inability to attend. I'm Order. pleased to say, I'm pleased to say, Mr. Acting Deputy President, that we have received a very positive response from the industry and from rural representatives to our Order. initiative on this bill. Order. Senator Reactions Calder. have ranged Order. from qualified acceptance to outright enthusiasm. Would you please resume your seat? Senator Calder listened in reasonable silence to other people. Please extend the same courtesy to him. I'll, be, I'll make the decision on whether I think that, as you will. I think we, it's fairly lucid, actually. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. We've given an undertaking not to form a position on the new charges until the inquiry until the inquiry you haven't voted against them because they they order. have not been determined i mean look you obviously don't understand the the legislation that's order. before you senator boswell uh, we have given i repeat mr acting deputy president we have given an undertaking not to form a position on the new charges until the inquiry has reported and the government has responded and we will honor that commitment even though we support full even though we support full cost recovery, we will approach the inquiry with an open mind. The real reason we're being attacked by the opposition, the real reason we're being attacked by the opposition, is that we have come up with a position which is more constructive and sensible than theirs, and which has won general acceptance in a constituency which, which the National Party fervently believes is theirs and theirs alone. We have pulled the rug from under them, and they don't like it. Their response is to look for Order. any excuse to attack the Democrats and try to discredit us in the, in the eyes of the rural community and the road transport industry. And they are wasting their breath, Mr Acting Deputy President, and they know it. To return to the substance of the bill, it must be said that our support Mr Acting Deputy Order. President, the reason I, I inserted those several paragraphs was quite simply that a lot of breath on the uh, hot, hot air on the part of the opposition has been wasted this afternoon in attacking that Wednesday, uh, that Wednesday meeting. The overriding problem is that the bill is the product of new federalism, something which the opposition supports, Mr Acting Deputy President. The Democrats accept that a cooperative approach to transport micro-reform is necessary, but it also creates problems, very considerable problems. And if I could interpolate here, Mr. Acting Deputy President, it seems to me that uh, there is a reasonable hope that while this legislation may achieve a great deal in terms of substance, the working of the legislation may reveal 
the, the stupid approach which has been taken through new federalism and before too long there will be true national legislation in this area, which is the way I, I believe that uh, this matter should be handled. One problem is that the bulk of the bill is taken up by a schedule containing the Commonwealth State Agreement. That schedule cannot be amended by this or any state parliament, which severely limits parliamentary oversight, something that I thought the opposition would have been concerned about. Either we pass the bill more or less intact or we throw it out. There is no middle course. This bill extends the power of the Special Premier's Conference to an unacceptable extent, because it is drafted in such a way that amendments to the agreement do not need to be submitted to Parliament for approval. This has been identified by the Scrutiny of Bills Committee as an inappropriate delegation of power, and we will be moving an amendment to remove it, which the government has agreed to support and the opposition has proposed independently of us. The agreement also has preempted the work of the Commission by dividing the country into low-cost and high-cost zones for the purpose of charging. The Democrats believe that those states which have demanded this concession have done so for political reasons, unrelated to cost recovery principles. The proposal for charges to be levied on vehicles travelling be between zones will in all likelihood prove to be an administrative nightmare. We support the Minister's suggestion that the Commission take a long, hard look at the zonal system. It has been claimed by representatives of the road transport industry that they will be paying for road construction and maintenance performed by inefficient state authorities over which they have no control. The Democrats note that this matter is the subject of a House of Representatives inquiry and that the states have a duty to tackle inefficiencies as road cost recovery is phased in. We have no doubt that the road transport industry will use its substantial resources, very substantial resources, to keep the pressure on for reform in this area. The Democrats do not accept the argument that the Commission is tied to a rigid formula for calculating road charges that makes it unable to develop more equitable processes. The agreement merely sets out an initial method based on the proposed work of the BTCE and the Interstate Commission and the Special Premier's Conference. We believe it is entirely appropriate that this be the Commission's starting point and that it, is, that it not be asked to reinvent the wheel. However, the agreement allows ample scope for the method to be refined and changed in the light of new information and would ask the minister con to confirm this. It has been argued that the Commission's terms of reference are too narrow and that it cannot take into account the general environment of taxes and charges in which the road transport industry operates in setting charges for road cost recovery. The Democrats do not believe that the Commission can reasonably be asked to make comparisons across industries. That is the role of relevant government departments. We have every reason to believe that the forthcoming inquiry will spur this process along. The Commission's terms of reference have also been criticised for their failure to require consideration of regional impacts, impacts of new road charges. Our reading of the agreement suggests that the Commission can examine regional impacts, an interpretation which has been confirmed to us by the government. Nevertheless, we believe that the Senate inquiry should examine this question to ensure that our consideration of the new charges is well informed and to allow affected, uh, affected parties to address their concerns directly to their elected representatives. The government has expressed the view to us that the inquiry is a legitimate part of the process. Democrats believe that this bill is overall an important initiative for which the government deserves credit. We would urge the government to take the next uh, step and seek the agreement of the states to expand the Commission's role to include the development of a national regi registration scheme for light vehicles under which fixed registration and third-party insurance fees are abolished and recovered instead as an additional, co additional component of fuel excise. What are you going to do about excise? The the, the point here, Mr. Uh, Mr. Acting uh, Deputy President, is that in the in the case in the case of the uh, of the opposition, they, they are seeking to remove that excise at precisely the time at which uh, Australia has a very large and rapidly increasing foreign debt. We import 3.11 billion dollars billion dollars worth of uh, petroleum products into Australia, most of which is used in transport. And, and at a time when we are recognising that we need to cut down our use of, of, uh, of fossil fuels generally, and specifically petroleum, 
You are the people. Order. You are the people, Mr. Mr. Acting Deputy President. These are these are the Order. these are the people who believe in the operation of the market. That as you reduce the price, you increase consumption, and as you increase the price, you reduce consumption. And here they are. They're they're, they're totally contradictory. They're totally contradictory in their in their understanding of their of their own philosophy, their own economic philosophy. At the same time, Mr Acting Deputy President, these are the people who will cut back uh, public funding in such areas as public transport, so that, uh, so that uh, public transport will, be, will become less available, and at the same time, of course, there will be a 15 per cent impost on, on uh, public transport fares, further forcing, further forcing up uh, the, uh, the consumption of, uh, of petroleum and uh, further disadvantaging both the individuals in this country and uh, disadvantaging uh, industry. We regard, we regard the, the sensible shifting of the fixed costs of car ownership onto the usage of those vehicles, so that it would cost less to actually own a vehicle, and that, I would have thought, would be appealing to the opposition in terms of their support for the motor vehicle industry and the shifting of those charges onto a fuel levy so that there is a, uh, an ability to own a car more cheaply but a disadvantage in using, in using that car for non-essential non purposes and encouraging the more efficient uh, use of transport in this country. But the, the opposition has no real understanding of an efficient transport industry, none whatsoever. So we regard Order. this as an essential reform initiative which would meet environmental objectives without an inflationary impact because you're simply shifting one, one, uh, one cost and replacing it with another. The establishment of the National Road Transport Commission lays the foundation for this long overdue reform. As I've said, the Democrats have reserved our decision on the new charges into the inquiry into regional and taxation issues until uh, the inquiry into regional and taxation issues is completed and the government has responded. To make this commitment clear, I now move the second reading amendment standing in the name of the Australian Democrats. Senator and we Colour, the I suggest you foreshadow that. We will dispose of that other amendment. I first. foreshadow the, uh, the, that second reading amendment. But Senator Crichton Brown, do you Mr. propose to seek leave yes, to yes, speak? Mr. Mr. Deputy Sorry. President, I claim Senator that I have been misrepresented and I seek leave to make a personal explanation. No leave granted, certainly. Senator Deputy Pernison. President, Senator Kuldane, in his rather idiotic delivery, uh, order, claimed, order, order, claimed. Order. That's disparaging personally, and I suggest you might withdraw that. Yeah, okay, I'll withdraw it, Mr. Thank you. Mr. Deputy President. Senator but in his delivery, he claimed that the members of the opposition sought uh, witnesses to come from all over Australia. My colleagues will speak for themselves. But I tell this Senate that I certainly did not convince any uh, witnesses to come from anywhere over Australia. My delivery in the second reading speech was made up of submissions that I have read and the experience I have had as an experienced and continuing operator in the transport industry. Senator Crichton Brown. Do oh. you want to defer to Senator? Mr. Uh, Acting Deputy President, can I just. Uh, raise a, a point of clarification with regard to procedures. Um, you indicated that the appropriate course of action would be for Senator Coulter to uh, foreshadow his second yes. reading amendment. I'm just wondering, on that basis, at what stage would I have an opportunity to debate that foreshadowed when amendment? He, when he, I suggest we dispose of your amendment one way or the other. Then when he moves it— Well, I've already moved mine. Yeah. 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 So yeah. there yes, will be a further opportunity moved. for yeah. debate at that yes, stage. Yes, you will. Right. Yours Thank has you. been moved. Yeah. Senator Crichton Brown. Mr. Deputy. Yep. You see, you're seeking leave, Ch Chairman. Can I, can I seek leave? Yeah. Can I seek leave? To is leave granted? Take five yes. minutes. To leave is granted. Speak of the second reading, yeah. um, and that that, mean, that means, of course, I won't be able to speak on the bill. I'll be able to talk in generalities. Can I? <laughs> for five minutes. Can, can I say that I support I support the philosophic concept of federalism, and I always have, and I always will. The difficulty is that. There have been two difficulties. The first is that the states have never assumed their proper responsibilities. They have all clung desperately to their rights and abrogated their responsibilities. Yeah, yeah. And I suppose I use a trite example that here we are uh, 
90 years after federation, and we can't get six states to agree at what age kids should start school. And if we can't get that on the board, one, one despairs about the more sophisticated uh, matters that require federalism and a sense of cooperation between the great states and the territories that make up this country. But having said that, it would seem to me it would have been a, an exercise in futility even if they had, because we have had for the last nine years, other than a, the aberration of Mr Whitlam, the greatest, the greatest centralist government that this country has ever seen. We, we, we now are going to have a future Prime Minister who had the audacity to say, in the process of sinking this Prime Minister's uh, Premier's conference, that the states could be trusted with taxing powers, that the states would be delinquent, that the states would be irresponsible, that the states couldn't be trusted. This is a man that gives us a, a million unemployed. Re yes, it, re with respect, Mr Deputy President, I'm certain it is, because because this, this is seen as a great leap forward by this Prime Minister. This was his vision for, you for the future. This was going to be a new Australia. This was, this, was his, this was his vision for a different Australia. It, well, it is about the bill because this bill, this bill alleges, alleges to allow the states and the territories to participate in the, pro, in, in the process. And, uh, of course, it, uh, as I say, um, but it, it is the last, it's the last great leap forward uh, uh, by this uh, Prime Minister that really ended up as an absolute winter. It's, it's, a, it, it's, the last, it's the last shred of the Prime Minister's uh, concept of, uh, of federalism. And of course, uh, we, all, we, all know, we all know what happened to the bigger picture. We all know that the Premier sought to have have the special premiers conferences to give them real powers, to give them real teeth, to give them real involvement in national matters, and the uh, the present, uh, the uh, the member for Blacksland and the future prime minister ignominiously sunk him, simply because he could see a cheap political point to be gained uh, by doing so. But uh, my objection to this legislation is not that it addresses or fails to address the question of use of plays. It doesn't do that. It, it ignores the enormous amount of revenue that's already raised through excise. This government sees excise, and we've had the Treasurer say it, and I believe we've, I believe we've had the Prime Minister say it, well, it that, 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 that excise, well, through you, Mr Deputy President, you mm. don't set up authorities and commissions and bodies unless you're going to give them a function. And the function will ultimately be to ensure that there is a, a greater raising of revenue from the transport industry, uh, road transport industry, than there presently, than there presently is. And the self-funding is to come out of licensing fees. And the great contrast: this government wonders why it's in so much trouble, Senator Collins, at, at, at a time at a time when your government is taking greater revenue. The Liberal Party is offering to give it back. Now, now, quaint as it might be, quaint as it might be, it was you that suggested that to increase the zone allowance by 25 per cent was trivial. $34 million going to people. 11, 11, 11 bucks a year, 11 bucks a week, 11 bucks a minute. That's $34 million is going back to, zone, to, to, to people who live in remote and isolated areas. And that's a 25 per cent increase. Mr Deputy President, in the present rate set by this government for zone allowances. Now, if you're arguing 25 per cent is a modest increase, that simply means that the base figure is modest. And this is at a time when, when this government's increasing revenue, the Liberal Party is offering and promising to reduce, um, reduce the cost of fuel, to abolish excise, to reduce the cost of living in the remote and isolated areas of Western Australia. And Australian to to reduce fringe benefits tax by uh, by uh, five percent. The facts of the matter are this this legislation will do nothing more except load up costs for the transport industry, who will wherever they can pass them on to consumers. And the consumers that will be most acutely affected will be those that live in remote and isolated areas. I don't believe that the legislation has got any merit. And I don't believe it's got any virtue. And I don't believe it's got any place in the statute books.
Seeing as there were two additional speakers who spoke by leave, I suggest if there's any new material, Minister, you would have a right to make any comment on it. Okay. The question is then that the amendment moved by Senator Chapman be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against no, I think the noes have it. Aye, Ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bell. Lock the doors. Order. The question is that the amendment moved by Senator Chapman to the National Road Transport Commission bill be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Reid, tell her for the ayes, and Senator Jones, tell her for the noes.
Order. Result of the division there being 31 ayes and 35 noes, the question is resolved in the negative. Order. Senator Calder. Well, Mr. President, I, I now formally move the second reading attachment uh, standing in my name. Is uh, anybody going to speak to this? Senator Chapman. Thank you, Mr. Mr. President. The, uh, or, order. Order. Before Senator Chapman speaks, would all senators resume their seats or leave the chamber? Senator Chapman. Thank you, Mr. President. The, op the opposition will not support this uh, amendment moved by the Democrats. The opposition's uh, amendment, uh, which we put uh, earlier in the debate and which has just been voted on, which was defeated because the Democrats chose to support the government, really got to the nub of the issues of concern with regard to this legislation. The amendment that has been moved by the Democrats does not. It lacks strength and it lacks purpose. And if uh, we refer to the, the amendment, uh, Clause A of that amendment, which affirms that passage of this bill in no way guarantees passage of the road transport legislation foreshadowed in the schedule, is simply a statement of the obvious, Mr. President. This Senate could, should consider each and every piece of legislation on its own merits. And therefore, of course, uh, passage of this particular bill order, in no order, way guarantees order. There's passage. There's too much, too much audible comment. Senator Chapman. Therefore, as I was saying, Mr. President, of course, the passage of this bill in no way guarantees the passage of any subsequent legislation. And this uh, clause A simply states the obvious. And it seems strange to me that the Democrats feel the need to state the obvious in this way. Perhaps they've been in bed so often with the government that they're now starting to feel they're being taken for granted by the government, and uh, that the, the government has their, their unbridled support on each and every piece of legislation. And they, so they feel the need to they feel the need to back away from that uh, with clause A of this second reading amendment. Clause B is simply a very pale and a very poor imitation of the second reading amendment which, is, which I've already moved and which has just been voted on. Uh, on behalf of the opposition. In conclusion, Mr. President, uh, Mr. Deputy President, may I say that the Democrats' amendment is really nothing more than a last attempt by them to salve their consciences for selling out those uh, Australians who are so dependent on the Australian transport industry for their livelihood and for their, uh, their supplies. By supporting this uh, government legislation, without either adequate or critical analysis of it. And we heard in uh, Senator Coulter's uh, earlier remarks quite pathetic excuses for the Democrats not being represented at the legislation committee that inquired into this legislation and which heard s strong and solid evidence as to why this legislation should not pass. And so it is, uh, it is quite, uh, quite pathetic now for the Democrats to come in here and move this meaningless second reading amendment which will do nothing in terms of the legislation which should be uh, defeated in this chamber and for that reason the opposition will not support the amendment. Senator Burnett, sir. Mr Deputy President, if I can address this uh, amendment by the Democrats very briefly. Uh, obviously this is the deal that the Democrats reach with the government or the, or the government reach with them uh, at the beginning. Uh, before uh, we went to that committee of before that committee of inquiry the other night, you can have your go next, Minister. But uh, obviously, it was the deal that was reached, and then uh, Senator Coulter chose to ignore the transport industry around Australia, and then chose to blame us for bringing these people uh, to uh, Canberra on false pretence. I suppose that's his excuse, and he's allowed to stick to it. But the point is. He, he claims still that five days is not enough notice for Mr. Senator Coulter to attend an inquiry, and so he spent ten lousy minutes with him. I'd like to uh, know why they bothered to have the first uh, part of the passage of this amendment in, uh, affirms that the passage of this bill no way guarantees the passage of the road transport legislation foreshadowed in the schedule. Mr Deputy President, if the Democrats can be taken on their track record in this place, I believe that they might as well have le left that one right out because I do not take one iota notice of it because I just don't believe it. Senator Kemp. Uh, thank you. I just rise uh, to um, 
support my colleagues uh, in their uh, opposition to the amendment uh, moved by Senator Coulter. Uh, I wish just briefly to draw the attention of the Senate uh, to a, a major issue which I don't think, I think has been properly canvassed in this debate, and certainly it is one of the reasons why we would be very suspicious of the amendment which Senator Coulter has, has uh, proposed. I refer, Mr uh, Acting um, Chairman, to the achievable vision of the alternative budget proposals brought down by Senator Spinner on behalf of the, the Australian Democrats. And the Senate may not appreciate this, but uh, in this budget, uh, the, uh, the Australian Democrats are seeking to raise $455 million, million dollars by a 1 per cent tonne kilometre charge to be levied on all domestic road freight movements. Road freight movements. And, and for Senator Coulter to come in here and pretend that he is a friend of people in the road transport industry, to pretend that he is a friend of the rural industry, when in the alternative budget, which Senator Spindler has brought down, in the, in the famous alternative budget that Senator Spindler has brought down, you have a vast range of taxes which are going to hit particularly, Senator Coulter, the freight industry. The Honourable the Minister. Mr. Uh, Senator Spindler. Do you want us to support this or don't you, Senator Spindler? <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I, I, would like to take, uh, I would like to take this opportunity and uh, draw uh, the Senate's attention to the antediluvian views that Senator Kemp has just put on the record, uh, that if we are going to get our taxpayers to get, to get a fair deal, uh, rather than throw money at people that damage roads, uh, then Senator Kemp, of course, has a point. And if he wants to continue uh, to use fossil fuels, which are running out at a fast rate, then of course he's got a point. But then, but then that's where Senator Kemp is coming from. I mean, in, in the trade practices inquiry, he Order. even voted Order. against competition. A liberal. Order. Uh, <laughs> Order on I rest, I rest my order, case. Senator Ochi. <laughs> uh, Senator Ochi, I called you to order. Uh, what's your point of order? On a point of order, there was, there was clearly unparliamentary language from Senator Calder, and I asked you to withdraw it. Well, you don't ask him to withdraw it. You ask the chair to ask him to withdraw it. Se uh, in that and case, and I, I asked you to ask him to withdraw it, Mr. I didn't hear Deputy it. President. Senator Spindler. Well, can I tell you what it was then, Mr Deputy oh, President? Yeah. There is no point of order. Senator Spindler. Oh, I had finished my point, Mr Chairman. The Honourable Minister. I'll give you a 9 out of 10 for this, Mark. Uh, <coughs> Deputy President, um, do I understand by what you have just said on that ruling that should some offensive language be used in this place, and I didn't hear the language, I don't, well, know, that it, I don't know that it was. Uh, well, I, I don't know that it was offensive. but. But should a senator or member believe some language has been used, that they need not bother raising the point of order if, it, in, in their view, the chair hasn't heard it? Or, or, or is it the case that if a senator or member believes something has been uh, said, which shouldn't have been, and we all make mistakes, I understand that, um, that the senator or member has the opportunity, indeed I would have thought perhaps the obligation, to raise the matter with the chair? And, uh, and uh, ask the chair to uh, ascertain whether unparliamentary language or offensive language was used or not. Uh, it, I mean, it, I'm sure. Well, I'm waiting for you it, to sit down, and then I might answer your question. Is, is it the case that if you don't hear it, we don't worry about it? The, the situation was that there was much disorderly con um, conduct in the Senate. There was so much disorderly conduct it was difficult for me to, un to hear the the person who had the, uh, had the floor. I understand that I, <clears throat> I called to order. Senator O'Chi kept um, uh, being disorderly. I asked him to stop. He said that he was asking someone to withdraw. Some now, if Senator O'Chi wants someone to withdraw something, it should go through the chair. It shouldn't go across the chamber by, by disorderly contact, conduct. I would ask... Uh, uh, Senator Coulter, whether he considers he 
made any comment which needs withdrawal, and if he did, he might do so. Thank, thank you, Mr. Deputy President. Uh, Senator Spindler was correctly, correctly identifying the opposition as antediluvian. Now that, of course, refers to the that refers to the period that, that refers to the period of the of the flood. Uh, and I remarked, that the op the, I remarked that the opposition had come out of the primeval slime, which of course is, is, is precisely what you would expect if they were recovering uh, from that antediluvian period. And I find nothing offensive in that remark at all. It's simply continuing, continuing the allusion to, to where the opposition quite clearly comes from. Order. On, on that point of order, quite clearly, on his own admission, that language is unparliamentary, Mr. Deputy President, and quite clearly, as you have previously, quite, quite clearly, as a term such as idiotic has been ruled unparliamentary, quite clearly that term also ought to be so ruled. Uh, uh, Senator Bell, thank you very much. Uh, I, 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 I think we're becoming. <coughs> Uh, that's the word I was looking for. We're becoming too sensitive. There's no point of order. The Honourable Minister. Mr uh, Deputy President, I think it's very churlish of the opposition not to support this Democrat amendment, and because it's Christmas, we are. The question is the amendment be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, contrary no. I think the— uh, Mr Deputy I, President. I think the ayes have it. Well, wait a minute, Senator Bishop. I just wanted to uh, uh, add one quick point uh, to the. Uh... Well, Mr. Deputy President, I was on my feet while you were still. Uh... Now, what, 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 uh, Can uh, I seek leave then? Are you speaking to the motion, or are you speaking to a point of order? I'm speaking to the. To, to the amendment. I'm speaking to the amendment. Uh, well, 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 go ahead. Uh, go Thank ahead. Go, go ahead and then I will call for the amendment again. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. I just wanted to make a couple of quick points that just um, uh, expanded the points that were made by my colleague, Senator Kemp, when dealing, when dealing with the, uh, the Australian Democrats, the Achievable Vision Alternate Budget Proposals 1991-92. Interesting document. And uh, we have said, and uh, Dr Hewson has said, that in a country which has been described as suffering from the tyranny of distance, how important it is to get rid of the, uh, the tax, the excise that is on fuel, to allow uh, there to be um, uh, a cheaper way of transporting our goods. And I just think it's important to put down on the record that the Democrats propose that there would be additional levies placed on black coal, brown coal, oil and gas. On oil it would be a one cent per litre levy, and that would raise an additional $747 million. And I think it's important that we have that on the record to know that the Democrats are a taxing party, whereas the fight back package is a, is a, uh, is a package which is, designed, which is designed to reduce the cost to ordinary Australians and make them have more control over their own lives. Order. The question is the amendment be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Is a division required? A division is required. Ring the bells.
Lock the door. Order. The question is that the amendment moved by Senator Coulter be agreed to. The ayes will pass the right of the chair, the noes the left. I appoint Senator Faulkner, tell her for the ayes, and Senator Brownhill, tell her for the noes. Order. Result of the division there being 33 ayes and 28 noes, the question is resolved in the affirmative. The question now is that the bill be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. Order. The question is that the National Road Transport Commission bill be narrowed a second time. The ayes will pass the right of the chair, the noes to the left. Point Senator Faulkner, tell her for the ayes. Senator Brownhill, tell her for the noes.
Order, result of the division there being 32 ayes and 29 noes, the question is resolved in the affirmative. Clerk. Bill for an act to establish a National Road Transport Commission. Those honourable senators not seeking the call and standing, please um, take a seat or leave the chamber. Is it the wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole? Yeah, I think we can do it as a whole. Mm. Uh, there being no objection, it is so ordered. The question is that the bill stand as printed. Uh, Senator Chapman. Mr. Chairman. Um on behalf of the opposition, I have two amendments which, by leave, I would seek to move together. Well, is leave granted for the two amendments to be moved together? Yes, well, that's. Well, that, that's right. a, okay. Well, so, so would it. I thank, uh, thank the Senate. On behalf of the, the opposition, I, am, I move amendments one and two uh, circulated uh, to the chamber. The first of those amendments relates to. Clause 3, page 2 of the bill, the proposed definition of agreement. And in the bill, uh, agreement is defined as meaning the agreement made on the 30th of July 1991 between the Commonwealth, the States and the Australian Capital Territory, a copy of which is set out in the schedule, or if that agreement has been amended or affected by another agreement, that agreement as so amended or affected. The effect of our, our uh, amendment is to remove all words after schedule, which means we are removing words or, if that agreement has been amended or affected by another agreement, that agreement as so amended or affected. The effect of our amendment is to require, <coughs> in effect, is to require any changes to the agreement to be approved by this parliament. In other words, the, the uh, agreement which has already been approved, if our amendment uh, is accepted by the Senate, will not be able to be changed without the approval of this parliament. The second amendment is to clause 8 on page 4 of the bill and has a similar intent and that is uh, that relates to as I said to clause 8 page 4 subsection 2 which states a consent for the purposes of paragraph 1e or f is to be given by resolution of the ministerial council carried in accordance with the agreement. Paragraphs 1e and 1f relate to the functions of and powers of the Commission, and e spells out that the functions and powers that are, with the consent of the Ministerial Council, conferred on the Commission by writing signed by the Minister, are among the powers uh, and functions of the Commission. And f 
states that functions and powers that are, with the consent of the Ministerial Council, expressed to be conferred on the Commission by writing signed by one, a Minister of the Crown of a state that is a party to the agreement, or two, a Minister of a territory that is party to the agreement. The effect of our amendment is to, to add to clause 8 after the word agreement, that is at the end of that clause, further words, and I quote, and is a disallowable instrument for the purposes of section 46A of the Acts Interpretations Act 1901. Again, this will, this will uh, retain for this parliament the power to, uh, to maintain some control over the functions and, and powers of the Commission without, it, uh, without those powers and functions simply being conferred by the, the Ministerial Council. And again, we believe it is important that this power be retained for this, this Commonwealth Parliament. And so it's uh, with the concern that the, the bill as drafted undermines uh, valid powers of this Parliament that both of these amendments are moved, and I commend them to the Senate. Senator Calder. Mr uh, Chairman. Um, it's a pity that Senator Chapman has moved the both amendments together because the, uh, the, op the um, Democrats uh, are moving an amendment uh, identical to the first opposition amendment and uh, therefore we're supporting that amendment. I, I would put the two amendments separately. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> um, and I understand that the, the government is, is quite happy with the, with the, first, uh, with the first of those amendments. But in the case of the, uh, the second amendment, while we, we recognise that what the opposition is attempting to do is possible, uh, we also uh, <clears throat> understand that it uh, really is un unnecessary and, and an impediment to the efficient operation of the uh, Commission. And for that <clears throat> reason, we'll, we'll oppose the, the, uh, the second amendment put by the opposition. But uh, while I'm on my feet, and in view of uh, some of the things that were said about our, our alternative budget uh, uh, in the second reading stage, I'd just like to read a, a little brief piece from the opposition's fightback package, where under land transport, the, uh, the, um, the fightback package says, over the longer term, responsibility for road funding will be transferred to the National Road Transport Commission and roads will be funded through user charges as proposed in the current negotiations being undertaken in the context of the Special Premier's Conference. And, and, and so I, no, I'm, really, I'm really, really puzzled, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, that uh, here we have, uh, here we have the, the government proposing something that is really right out of the package. Order. And, uh, Order. And, uh, and, I, and while, uh, while dealing with the, uh, the fight back package, Mr uh, Chairman, I noticed that under aviation on exactly the same page we read, the government has replaced the two airline policy with a three airline policy. The resulting price reductions are but a forerunner of the potential benefits from full deregulation. In view of what's been happening today, I just wonder whether the opposition want to reconsider, reconsider their position there. But uh, very... Uh, in relation to, the, uh, to these amendments, I simply want to indicate that uh, we're, we're supporting the first uh, of the amendments, but not the second one. The Honourable Minister. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr Chairman, I'll, I'll be very brief because I actually haven't abandoned all hope yet that we can actually conclude this legislation by 6.30. Uh, the government uh, will support the first opposition amendment. Um, and we've indicated that to the opposition, indeed the Democrats, and as Senator Collar has pointed out, the Democrats, in fact, quite independently were intending to move for, this way uh, uh, in any case, and of course uh, both uh, the opposition and the Democrats have drawn on the report of the Scrutiny of Bills Committee, superbly chaired, I might add, by my colleague Senator Barney Cooney, that, uh, that pointed uh, out uh, uh, their difficulties with this, and this amendment of course fixes it. So far as the second amendment is concerned, we will not be uh, uh, supporting uh, this amendment, uh, Mr Chairman, and uh, the reasons are that paragraphs 8, 1, E and F referred to in this section are intended merely to facilitate the Commission in the performance of its functions, and this is the important point, which are only advisory in nature. The functions and powers that may be conferred by executive action are limited to those that come within the executive power of government, such as powers to make inquiries, to form opinions about questions of policy and to make reports or non-binding recommendations. It would be inappropriate and time-consuming 
for such actions to be disallowable instruments for the purpose of section 46A of the Acts Interpretation Act 1901, particularly as resultant decisions of the Ministerial Council will be subject to parliamentary scrutiny through the normal legislative processes. The amendment proposed is not in the spirit of the cooperative approach encompassed in the decision under the Heads of Government Agreement to establish the Commission. And I might further add, uh, uh, Mr Chairman, simply to clarify this matter beyond dispute uh, uh, for, the, uh, for the Democrats who have raised this concern with us, I will add this. Uh, as was explained in the Government's response to the Scrutiny of Bills Committee, powers that can be referred by executive action do not include power to compel people to supply information or documents or to make recommendations which have legal effect. These are powers that cannot be conferred on the Commission other than by legislative means. Uh, I'll put the two amendments separately. Um, the question is that amendment number one be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Uh, the question is that amendment number two be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. 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 The contrary, no. no. I think the noes have it. Is the division required? Division is required. Ring the bells.
Dr Dawes. <coughs> the question is the amendment moved by Senator Chapman be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the nose to the left. I appoint Senator Brownhill teller for the ayes and Senator Faulkner teller for the nose. Uh, would honourable senators please remain in their seats? The result of the division being ayes 29 and noes 33, the question is resolved in the negative. The question is that the bill as amended be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The question is that the bill be reported. Those of that opinion say aye. But the question. Well, if there's a point of order, the, the, uh, the, Senate's, the sitting of the committee is suspended until 8 p.m. There's always one.
<coughs> Seems to be some confusion about whether the question was put. The question is that the bill be reported. That Mr. Deputy President, before you uh, put that question, I'd like to ask a question of the minister, and the minister uh, would know. Uh, the minister at the table would know that uh, to complete this legislation, at least at the stages where the charges are going to be imposed, you need uh, st complementary state legislation. And, uh, and uh, the premiers of Australia, except the ones that are not going to be in the in the show, they are not. There are no premiers. Okay, if there's no premiers, then. Uh, but the, in other words, they've all undertaken to deliver the legislation. Now, in the event, and those ministers, those premiers, are not totally in a position to deliver the legislation because of uh, uh, s uh, some states haven't got the hold of the upper house in in, in the, those states. Uh, can I just ask the minister what contingency plans? There is, uh, if uh, one state drops out, or indeed two states drop out, does the whole uh, the whole corporation or the whole commission fall by the wayside, or does it carry on without those states or or whatever? So I'd like the minister to answer that one before the question is put. The honourable minister, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I tell, tell you what, if you can't do better than that, you want to give up. Mr Chairman, um, can I just say I'm, I'm at something of a loss to understand why Senator Panizza would want to ask uh, this question, seeing as he asked precisely the same question in the committee as Senator Chapman can recall, and I'm going to now give him precisely the same answer. Uh, Mr Chairman, in that eventuality, the options would be available, of course, if it was only one uh, state uh, uh, that was in that position um, to, uh, to simply uh, proceed. Uh, with the remaining participants. In the event, of course, uh, and, and this entire arrangement, might I say, Mr Chairman, is one that's of necessity based on political common sense. If, if there was a, a situation where the process, uh, for example, irretrievably broke down, and I might add I didn't make this point at tedious length in the committee, then clearly that's a, a position that would then have to be politically re-evaluated at the time it happened. And the reason I think it's an important point, and I'm glad Senator Panitza asked the question in the committee, is that it simply reasserts the point I made earlier. This is not a piece of legislation which the Commonwealth Government is shoving down the throats of reluctant states. This is a piece of legislation which precisely reflects the heads of agreement that has been reached between the Commonwealth, the states and the ACT, who are all acting as equal partners in this arrangement. The Commonwealth has no more vote on the Ministerial Council than any other state. So that's the situation. If a state determines later that, for example, and it's the hypothetical situation I put, Senator Panitza, as you recall in the committee, that the charges are, are outrageous or, or uh, if that eventually arises, they have the complete sovereign right not to participate any further. The remaining members of the Council can at that point determine to go on with the arrangement without the state, as currently we are doing without the Northern Territory's agreement to one aspect of the charging regime. Um, but that's, that's the situation. It's a, it would be a political problem and it would be dealt with politically. Senator Panitza. I thank the minister for his answer. I don't apologise for asking the same question that I asked in the committee. At least I did get the same answer and it is, and it is recorded in the hand side of this debate. Thank you. The question is the bill be reported. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Order. The Chairman of Committees, Senator Colston, reports that the committee has considered the National Road Transport Commission Bill 1981 and agreed to it with amendments. Minister. Mr Acting Deputy President, I move that the report be adopted. The question is that that uh, motion be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. Minister. Mr. Acting Deputy President, I move that the bill be now read a third time. The question is that that motion be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. Against say no. Aye. I think the ayes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells.
division man. Lock the doors. Order. Lock the doors. The question is that the National Road Transport Commission Bill be now read a third time. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the nose to the left. I appoint Senator Jones, tell her for the eyes, and Senator Brownhill, tell her for the nose.
Order. Result of the division, there being 34 ayes and 30 noes, the question is resolved in the affirmative. Senator Watson. Leave of the Senate to present a report from the Joint Committee of Public Accounts. You, you don't need leave. Thank you. Mr President, on behalf of the Joint Committee of Public Accounts, I present the 313th report of the committee entitled The Control of Visitor Entry. And I seek leave to move a motion in relation to the report. Is leave granted? Thank you. Mr Please President, granted. I move that the Senate take note of the report and seek leave to incorporate my tabling speech in Hansard. Is leave granted? There is no objection. Leave is granted. Yeah. Right. Order. The question is that the Senate take note of the report. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Mr. Clark. Such a standing orders be suspended as would prevent me moving a motion in the following terms. That the Senate notes that the Labor Party has rewarded the architect of the recession and the principal cause of, mis of the misery being suffered by 900,700 unemployed Australians and their families right. with the highest office of government. And two, is of the view that in recognition of such appalling judgment, the 19th of December shall be forthwith known as a national day of shame. Yeah. Mr. Uh, Mr Deputy President, it is, incre it is in incredible, it is incredible that, this, that the once great Labor Party, the once great Labor Party would reward the architect of the recession, the architect of the recession, the person principally responsible for nearly one million unemployed Australians and all of the misery being suffered by them and their families, of another 500,000 who have given up looking for work who are underemployed, 31 per cent of young, young, young Australians unemployed looking for work unsuccessfully. It is amazing that the person principally responsible for this shocking state of affairs in this nation would be rewarded by this government and given the office of Prime Minister. It is important, therefore, that this motion be debated tonight, because the consequences to Australia of what will follow is too horrible to contemplate. This was the man who claimed to know it all economically. This was the man who basically designed the recession. This is the man who claimed credit for the recession. He was the man who said this was the recession we had to have. He was the one who gave us interest rates well beyond that of our competitors, who gave us inflation rates well beyond that of our competitors, who designed, who designed the J-curve, all of these other exotic economic expressions, and basically produced an economic environment in which so much misery and suffering has resulted. And what does he get for that achievement? The Labor Party makes him Prime Minister, throws out their successful Prime Minister who had won four separate elections, gives him the reward of being booted out while still in office and puts into office the principal architect of the recession, the person responsible for the horrible state of affairs that exists in this country at the moment. How could that occur? How could these people be so silly? How could they not find a third party if they are sick and tired of Mr Hawke? How could, they put, how could they put Mr Keating before the Australian people as a credible Prime Minister in the light of his economic record and the suffering that he has caused? As a result of that, Mr Deputy President, we are of the view that this day will be a day known in the history of Australia. It will be a day known as a day of shame. It will be a day known when the judgment of the Labor Party was finally recognised that the appalling state that it's in and the consequences that Australia is going to suffer as a result of it is too great to, uh, to contemplate. So I move, this, I move this motion as a matter of, as a matter of regret. We don't understand. We don't understand how the Labor Party could have been as foolish as this. They deserve to be thrown out of office. They've demonstrated tonight that they deserve to be thrown out of office, and the sooner they're thrown out of office, the better. Order. There will be order on my left. There will be order on my left. Senator Richardson. 
Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy order. President. Order. Now, I, uh, or, order. Oh, sir. I, I will not call for order again. I will take action. <laughs> Senator Richardson. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy President. It, uh, it disappoints me that, uh, that if, uh, if the opposition was serious, Mr. Deputy President, about uh, a resolution such as this, we'd have got more than a two and a half minute speech from the leader. I'd have thought that if this was really all that uh, it is cracked up to be, we got two and a half of you. Mind you, that's about all you're capable of. None of us are surprised. You, could, you couldn't go three minutes unless you had it written by your staff. Order. You wouldn't know how. I warn Senator Hill. I warn Senator McGibbon. I warn Senator uh, Kemp. I, uh, I'd have thought. Uh, <laughs> I, I'd have thought, Mr. Deputy President, that. Uh, if we were really serious, we'd have got more than two and a half minutes. Mind you, I just don't think Senator Hill's capable of it. Now, we're given, uh, we're given two lines here. First is the rewarding of the architect of the recession. Now, I, uh, I find that an interesting, uh, an interesting phrase for uh, the Senate to be uh, debating tonight. I can recall that there was a certain Dr Hewson who used to give advice. He used to give advice to a former government. Now, you'd all recall that government. Some of you were members of it. Now I wonder what happened while he gave advice. He gave the economic advice that gave us double-digit inflation, that gave us double-digit interest rates, that gave us double-digit unemployment. He got the trifecta up. Dr Hewson got the trifecta up. No chance of that now, none whatsoever. But what did you reward him with? You rewarded him with the leadership of your party. No one, no one in the Labor Party can even seek to emulate those kinds of achievements. No one can even bother, and we won't. I, uh, Senator Calvert. I, I'm not sure. You, all you've just shown me, Senator, Senator Jesus, Calvert, you've washed your hands or that you've given up. One of the two. One of the two, you've washed your hands or you've given up. Either way, I'm happy. Either way, I'm happy. It shows a change. If it's, if it's the former, it shows a change in personal habits. Order. If it's order. Senator Calvert, I've called you to order three times. I warn you. I. Uh, Mr. President, uh, I, I, won't, uh, I won't continue to answer Senator Teague's uh, uh, gesticulations. I would, however, suggest that uh, the idea of this uh, rewarding the Arctic of the recession really is nonsense. The second part, though, the second part, the second part really, really shows what we've got. The second part of this resolution refers to the National Day of Shame. Now, I reckon, I reckon, with even just a half a dozen government senators, if we'd been able to sit around for three weeks thinking about this, we might have come up with a better line. Than a national day of shame. I reckon we'd have just about done a bit better. That is pathetic. I mean, at least we expect better theatre from you, if nothing else. Ham off the bone does not do it justice. Does not do it justice, Senator Collins. So I, uh, I would, I would have thought that you'd have done a lot better, a lot better than just a national day of shame. But I tell you what, you will get over the course of uh, the next uh, 16 months, 18 months. What, what you will get. What you will get is what you don't want. What you'll get is a drubbing day after day after miserable day. Day after day. A drubbing of massive proportion. I mean, you'll all recall. It's only Order. a few months. You'll all Order. I had warned Senator Kemp. I named Senator Kemp. I invite Senator Kemp to to uh, make an explanation uh, to you, Mr. Bad <coughs> no, this is the normal. I'm going through what I'm going through the normal procedures, Senator. We don't need your puerile assistance. Mr. Deputy President, uh, I ask you to invite uh, Senator Kemp to uh, make some act of contrition there, and uh, so we don't have to take this matter any further. That's what you do. Uh, could I seek, yes, seek your guidance, uh, Mr. Deputy President? Uh, uh, what, on, on what basis was I named? Se Senator Kemp, you were, 
You were warned of disorderly behaviour on a number of occasions, and because of your continued disorderly behaviour, I warned you, and then you continued to, after some time, you started interjecting again, and that was done after a warning. Now, in accordance with Standing Order 203, I call upon Senator Kemp to make an explanation or an apology. The reason uh, that I think you named me, Mr Deputy President, was that, was that I was laughing. And I regret to say, Mr Deputy President, that I was laughing loud. And I was laughing along with a lot of my colleagues. And I have to say, I have to say that I found it very hard to stop laughing, Mr Dep Deputy President, because uh, in view of the comments that the Speaker was making at that time, I have to say also uh, that I, I feel it rather, rather surprising in the context of uh, the noise that there was in the chamber that uh, you chose to single me out. And uh, I would appreciate a clearer reason why I happen to have been singled out, but you are quite right, I was laughing. And I suspect, Mr Deputy President, I was laughing loud and I suspect that I would have been laughing long in view of the comments that I had heard. I am not aware, I am not aware that laughter is a um, disorderly act. Uh, if it is, uh, can I say to you, Mr, Mr. De De Deputy President, uh, I will certainly try to control myself uh, more fully in the future. Uh, but I have to say that, uh, uh, in view of uh, the way we were being uh, provoked by, by Senator, Senator, Senator Richardson, that I did find, uh, find it difficult. And uh, that's the reason for my behaviour. I do not think, in the context of what has happened today, and the context of what the Labor government has done to Mr Hawke, right, right. that it is a very serious act. In fact, in the context of what has happened today, it is a very minor act. But you are right. I was laughing. I was laughing loud. And I was laughing at Senator Richardson. Yeah. Order. 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 Senator Kemp, I ask you to make an explanation and an apology. You have made an explanation. Do you make an apology for your um, uh, apology? Do you make an apology? Mr. Chairman, <laughs> Mr. Acting President. O order. Mr. Acting President. O order. Order. Mr. Acting President. O order. Yes, he's made an explanation or an apology. Um, yes, Senator um, Archer. Mr Acting President, um, firstly, you did not ask for an apology, right. and secondly, um, Standing Order 203 says, one, if a senator persistently and willfully obstructs the business of the Senate, which Senator Kemp did not do, b, is guilty of disorderly conduct, which Senator Kemp did not do, c, uses objectionable words and refuses to withdraw those such words, which Senator Kemp did not do. D. Persistently and willfully well, refuses to conform to the standing orders, which Senator Kemp did not do. E. Persistently and willfully regards the authority of the chair, which Senator Kemp did Stop not do. The president may here. report to the Senate that the senator has committed an offence. If you could control those jackals on the other side, we'd get on quicker. Order. You're on the point of order. If an offence has been committed by a senator, in the committee of the whole, the chairman may suspend the proceedings and so on. There's nothing in there which indicates that Senator Kemp has committed any offence to the chair or to the chamber. None at all. Mr. Mr. Acting President, I would ask you to read 203 yourself, and I would certainly support Senator Kemp in that he has committed no offence. And I, I believe that certainly. Senator Richardson was doing his best to provoke the opposition in any way he could, and he did, and, I, and nobody would, would dispute that. And, uh, Mr. Mr Acting President, I just ask you to review uh, what you have said and what you have demanded of, the, uh, of, of my colleague, Senator Kemp. Oh, 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 order. Um, Senator McMillan. 
point of order as well, uh, Mr. Deputy President. I, I think everybody would, un well, everybody except possibly uh, from what he's just said, Senator Archer, would understand that which led you to uh, uh, be concerned about the constant interjections to issue, uh, which quite clearly, on this occasion and on other occasions, uh, have uh, constituted persistently and willfully obstructing the business of the Senate. Being in that event, at, at someone trying to speak to a motion that some people at least thought was important. The people, on the, the people who are actually interjecting in, indicated they thought it was important. So I think there wasn't any doubt that those circumstances were the sort of provocation that would lead someone in the chair to consider the action which you took and which reasonably led you to it. And were it not... And it, I've, I've, actually, I've actually just referred exactly to the words, Senator Archer, and uh, I've also, I'm also aware of the precedent in the way in which they are used and have been used in the past. And Mr. Quite straightforwardly, but Mr Deputy President, were it not for uh, the nature of uh, the uh, explanation uh, given by Senator Kemp, which uh, I thought I heard him say uh, that he apologised, uh, and Senator Collins thought I heard the same, but certainly was tantamount to, was tantamount, uh, I thought, to that. And were it not for that, I would have thought you might have been, you would have been justified in proceeding further under the standing orders. But I certainly defend the initial decision which you made. And were it not for the explanation uh, given by Senator Kemp, I think you would have been justified in seeking to take further action. So I speak to the standing order raised by Senator Archer and suggest we get on with the business. Senator Calder. Mr Deputy President. Um, when Senator Archer uh, spoke on this uh, point of order, he seemed to be implying that the various clauses under 2031 were um, uh, connected through the, uh, the word and. The clauses stand quite separately, and uh, any one of those clauses being fulfilled satisfies, satisfies the requirement of 203. And it is made absolutely clear in D where the word or appears. And, uh, I would, support, I would support what Senator McMullen has said, and the, the condition has been fulfilled. The uh, part three then goes on and says that um, the senator um, be called upon to make an apology or explanation. We have heard an explanation. We have not heard an apology. But it then goes on, and then a motion may be moved that a senator be suspended, and I forthwith move that uh, Senator Kemp be suspended. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Order. 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 Resume, sir. Order. Senator Coulter, there was uh, a great deal of uh, background noise. Did I? Could I ask you? Um, what you, uh, in fact, said. Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Deputy uh, President. Uh, in accordance with the second part of clause three of 203, I'm, mo I'm, moving, I'm moving the motion that the senator be suspended. And I would remind you, Mr. Uh, Deputy President, that no amendment, adjournment, or debate shall be entered into, and that therefore the motion should be put forthwith. Order, order. I have a motion before the chair, and and. and Order. I have a motion before the chair, and no amendment. Order. I will raise a fresh point. You will, order. You will take a seat when, this, when the chair is standing. No amendment, adjournment, or debate is allowed on such a motion, and it's to be put immediately by the person in the chair. I therefore put. I put. I put the question, moved by Senator Calder. That Senator Coulter's motion be agreed to. Those, those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. Point of order, Mr. Deputy President. I am putting the question. Mr. Deputy President, I, you put the question. You asked, you asked Senator Coulter when other people were on their feet. I will put. Order! I'll put the question. Uh, the question is that Senator Calder's motion be agreed to. 
Those with that opinion say aye. Aye. The contrary, no. No. I think the ayes have it. No. no. Divisions required. Ring the bell. Lock the doors. The question is that the motion moved by Senator Colter be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Jones teller for the ayes, Senator Brownhill teller for the noes. With those honourable senators, there is a there is a division in place. Would honourable senators take their seats?
Result of the division being eyes 33, nose 32. The question. The chamber will come to order. 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 Senator Kemp is accordingly suspended from the sitting of the Senate for the remainder of the sitting. Question is that Senator Hill's motion be agreed to. Um, Senator uh, Boswell. Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Acting Deputy President, I believe the uh, or whatever. I believe the uh, motion deserves support. Here we have tonight, one of a, a night of infamy for the for the Labor Party, a night of desperation, where they have tried to throw out a leader that has won them four elections on the trot four elections and in a desperate stand to gain to gain yes they're sitting there laughing and they've destroyed a man that has won four elections at a trot for them in a desperate effort in a desperate effort to gain popularity order order mr acting deputy And to Megan, should be heard in silence. And, uh... Please, Mr. Mr. Deputy President. S S Senator O'Chi, if you like to try frivolous points of order like that, I will deal with you as well. S point of order. Senator Boswell. On a point of order. Senator Boswell. On a point of order. What is your point of order? Mr. Mr. Deputy President. The people on that side are laughing as loud as Senator Kemp was laughing before. And it is very clearly the case that the, the rules of this chamber, I respectfully submit to you, have to be applied fairly and equally. And if we're going to have laughter from that side, then I suggest they should be named as well. Senator Boswell. Deputy President, what I was saying is a, a night that will be remembered as a disgrace to the Labor Party where they have thrown out a Prime Minister that has won four elections on a trot 
in a desperate effort to regain popularity with the Australian people. And I can tell them now that it is an act of desperation that will have no value in it. You have replaced a man that could lead with a man that is more unpopular than him with anyone in the Labor Party. And you've taken this act because you think you'll just throw him off the sleigh and you'll win popularity again. Mr. Senator Boswell should address the issue before the chair, which is the suspension of standing orders. He's uh, attempting to address a substantive issue, which is not before the House. And he's... The... No, it's, there is a... no, it's not. There is a... Uh, Senator Boswell. Uh, Thank you, the... Mr Acting the, the, Deputy the, the, Chairman. The, the, what I, I, I am doing... Senator is... Boswell, I uphold the point of order. You continue. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. But what I am doing is trying to address the, the uh, motion before the House tonight, that, uh, that one that... Uh, Senator Hill introduced, and it needs to be debated. This man that has wrought havoc, this previous treasurer that has order, order. The time for um, the time has expired for the, uh, the the debate. I put the I put Senator Hill's motion for suspension of standing orders. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. no. I think the noes have it. A division is required. Ring the bells.
Order. Order. There are too many dejections from both sides. Lock the doors. The question is that the suspension of standing orders motion moved by Senator Hill be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the nose to the left. I appoint Senator Brownhill teller for the eyes and Senator Jones teller for the nose. Order. Result of the division there being 30 ayes and 35 noes, the question is resolved in the negative. Would all senators please resume their seats? Order. Mr Clark. I seek leave to move a motion of no confidence in the Deputy President. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Mr President, I move that the Senate has no confidence in the Deputy President. I move, I move this, uh, this motion with regret, Mr President. I move, I, move, I, I, move it, I move it with regret. Order. Order. There will be no interjections. Senator Hill. It's not the first time the Deputy President has lost the confidence of this side of the chamber, but it's the first time that we have taken, taken this action. And we've taken it because of the extraordinary action of the Deputy President tonight. I've been now here for 10 years 
and apart from on one occasion late at night due to an unfortunate mixture of circumstances, nobody I, no. 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 that's no. offensive no. to Senator Walters. No. no person has Order. been no person has been named. Senator Kemp on our side. Senator, Senator, Senator Kemp was named tonight, it seems, because he laughed. Well, what was it? He was, he was named order. because he laughed. In an environment where he was Senator Hill's got the call. In an environment where he was more than entitled to laugh. As he said himself, he had every reason to laugh at the presentation of Senator Richardson. He had every reason to laugh at the behaviour of the Labor Party today. How is laughing disorderly in terms of Standing Order 203? Is it persistently and willfully obstructing the business of the Senate? No one can say that Senator Kemp did that. Is it disorderly conduct? Surely it's not disorderly conduct within the normal meaning of that expression. It's certainly not objectionable words. He's certainly not willfully refusing to conform with the Standing Orders. And he's not willfully disregarding the authority of the chair by laughing at Senator Richardson. It is well within reason of what can be fairly expected in a debate of this nature in this chamber. The truth is, Mr. President, the Deputy President lost control and saw the only way of getting himself out of that difficulty was to throw someone out. That is not the level of performance that the Senate should be entitled to expect from the Deputy President. As I've said, Mr. President, it is in the light of other circumstances that have occurred in recent times where this side of the chamber has been particularly unhappy with his performance. But we haven't moved in this way because it's not obviously not a course of action that we would desire to take. But tonight it is beyond all sense of reason and we therefore see that we have no alternative but to take this action. And I therefore move, as I said, that the Deputy President no longer have the confidence of this chamber. Senator, Senator Button, uh, we're entering a difficult time uh, in the pre-Christmas period when there is a lot of business for the Senate to be conducted and uh, a lot of parties are being conducted outside, I guess, and that, that uh, makes it... <laughs> Point order. of order, Mr. President. Point of order. I don't, I don't want to embellish the point of order I'm about to make, but there was an occasion in the old Parliament where Senator Button alleged that a member of the Liberal Party was found drunk on the lawn, and it took months and months and months for him to withdraw and apologise. Now I hope he's not again making an assertion of a very discolourful nature, which reflects improperly upon members on our side. Now whether the Labor Party themselves have been imbued with a sense of disaster or ecstasy, I don't know. But I ask that he would draw any imputation on members on this side. Well, uh, order. Well, you'd be one to talk. You'd be one to talk. Order. 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 I'm not going to let this get out of control. I heard Senator Button say, make a reference to parties. I don't think he said a reference to a party on any particular side of the chamber, and that's why I did not take offence. We've been sitting for six weeks. That's what everyone says. Order. Uh, thank you, thank, thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. President, for your ruling. I made no reference to any political party. Senator Crichton Brown rose in a manner which uh, reminded me of the cap fitting, and. Uh, <coughs> a, point, a point of order, Mr. Point of order, Mr. President. Order, order, the order. Senator Crichton Brown, look, there are there are too many unparliamentary remarks coming from behind you. Well, Mr. Now, I think this should be Mr. a Pre reasonable debate. Mr. President, with respect, it's not for me to make judgments about the, the unparliamentary points of what have been made behind me or comments. But can I say it's always regrettable when Senator Button gets back into a corner, we have this vicious, nasty little That's comment right. that seems to flow so freely from his mouth. Now, can I say with respect, if he continues to reflect improperly upon the integrity and the conduct of members on this side, you, sir, with respect, will continue to get proper points of order. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Senator Button. Uh, I made no reflection in the remarks which I made on members of the opposition. And uh, if, you're, if anybody is sensitive about that, I again repeat, I made no remarks which reflected exclusively on the opposition. Now let me say, uh, Mr. Mr. President, uh, we're, we're reaching the uh, end of the, uh, uh, the session of the parliament, and uh, of course there is uh, business still to be considered. And earlier this evening, the opposition, uh, seeking to contrive, uh, sought to contrive, in the absence of any interest in the community outside, uh, in, in the Senate's deliberations tonight, I think the community outside would be concerned to see that the Senate completed its business. That's what they would be concerned about. And uh, well, well, I, I would think that was what the community expected. Ex ex expected. Uh, that's what the community ex would have uh, would have expected of the Senate uh, tonight. But of course, the Senate tonight, uh, the opposition moved a resolution to uh, suspend standing orders. Uh, to enable them to take, you know, on this night, in, in the interest of being seen as being politically virile, uh, to enable them tonight to debate uh, the uh, new prime minister of this country, and and, uh, and Mr. Uh, Mr. President, that was an issue. That was the issue which was before the Senate. Now, Senator Hill gets up and moves subsequent to that, in relation to Senator Kemp's exclusion from the chamber. Senator Hill gets up and moves subsequent to that vote and that debate and that vote that uh, Senator, uh, Senator Colston no longer has the confidence of the Senate and says, I, and says, I move this motion with regret. So he ought to. So he ought to move it with regret because it is unprecedented or almost unprecedented in terms of the deliberations of the Senate. And of course it's unprecedented and uh, almost unprecedented, I'm sorry, and it's done tonight. It's, it's done tonight because of the failure of the previous resolution. Now, uh, Mr. President, Mr. President, <coughs> well, Sen Senator, Senator, Order. Senator Crane, Senator Crane says nonsense. Well, he, he had, uh, <coughs> I, I would have thought uh, his behaviour was transparent, Mr. President. Now, <coughs> Mr. President, uh, in terms of uh, Senator uh, Senator Colston's ruling. Uh, of course, managing a chamber such as this, as Senator Colston was doing, in, in, in very difficult circumstances when there is acrimonious debate taking place in the Senate, is not an easy task. And uh, Senator, the Senator, is, as Deputy President, is entitled to make judgments about these matters, which, unless they are horrendously, uh, horrendously out of line with the standing orders, are judgments are judgments which, uh, which should be respected by the Senate, uh, judgments which should be respected by the Senate and which I believe are respected and were respected by a majority of the Senate. Were, uh, Senator, were respected by a majority of the Senate, and it is a majority of the Senate that is important in determining this issue. So, uh, Mr. Uh, <coughs> Mr. President, uh, Senator Hill made all sorts of uh, allegations about uh, uh, the opposition being unhappy with Senator Colston's performance, not just tonight but on previous occasions. We haven't heard about it before in terms of a resolution. We've not, we've not heard about it. We've, we have not heard about it before in terms of a resolution of this kind. This is the first time this is the first time that a resolution of this kind is moved by the Leader of the Opposition, and it is moved uh, with regret. You know, I was overseas, Senator Macdonald. Brilliant, brilliant conclusion. Don't get too, ex don't get too excited about that. Now, Mr President, uh, the, the, of course the government will not uh, uh, contemplate this action by the Opposition. We have confidence in the Deputy President of this uh, Senate. The majority of the Senate has confidence in him, and uh, I think the matter be, ought to be resolved as quickly as possible. Senator Alston. Uh, I've been in this chamber now for uh, almost six years, and uh, during that time I've, uh, I have uh, had the opportunity to observe the, the great degree of difficulty and strain that can attach to uh, presiding over the conduct of this chamber. And uh, Senator Doug McClellan, your predecessor, I think performed remarkably well, and on this side there was a very high degree of support and acceptance for his performance. For our own part, we had Senator Hamer as deputy chairman, deputy president, and again, I thought uh, showed a great deal of uh, sense and discretion. 
And uh, you yourself, Mr. President, I have to say, have uh, done, I think, uh, a very good job in uh, almost uh, every situation you've been placed in. There are times, of course, when uh, difficulties arise, and uh, we'll have our disagreements. But by and large, you have demonstrated the flexibility and tolerance that is an essential part of presiding over this chamber. And that's where it is uh, with great regret that we have to say that Senator Colston has simply not measured up to that task. On the one hand, he has sought to uh, throw his weight around in such a way that uh, he, had, makes, he demeans the office of deputy president. He brings the chamber into disrepute by rising inappropriately, uh, quite often ahead of time, and as tonight amply demonstrates, with no regard to the circumstances. Now, one would have thought, if you're in politics, you are acutely sensitive to matters of uh, high drama and indeed melodrama. And if tonight's not one of those occasions when, for the first time in history, the Labor Party's thrown out uh, not only its most successful leader but uh, a prime minister uh, that it's uh, previously regarded very highly, I can't imagine a more uh, charged atmosphere. And yet, Senator Colston purports to act as though this is just another debate just another discussion amongst uh, competing forces and something that uh, doesn't deserve to even have uh, an exchange of, of views, an exchange of interjections, an exchange of laughter. All those things are part of the give and take in this place, part and parcel of making democracy work, and in almost every instance the chair, uh, with you in it in particular, has been flexible enough to allow that to happen. And the great tragedy of Senator Colston's misrule and uh, the way in which he's presided, not, not just on this occasion, but I think amply demonstrated in the way that he reacted with Senator Bohm, was to overreact in the first instance and then make a complete fool of himself by backing off. I mean, if he had any guts, he would have proceeded with the sort of motion that we've been forced to tonight by the treachery of the Democrats. Yeah. Now, if ever there were, if ever there were double not all of them. I agree. I agree. I agree. I agree entirely. And, and again, that is a double tragedy because the way Senator, Colston, uh, Senator uh, Coulter performed was such that he didn't even seem to understand the basis. Uh, yes. Well, there's not much honesty at the top in the Democrats, and we've known that for quite some time. But that is that is just part of the side tragedy. But the real tragedy is that we have had in this chamber a deputy president who is clearly incompetent. And it gives us no joy to say that because I think we are all prepared to accept that in the heat of the moment you can make mistakes, that uh, you do need to back off from time to time. Senator Ray tonight I thought was a very good example of that quite clearly, didn't want it matters to go the direction they, that they did. But you had no conception on the part of the deputy president that somehow there was a need to try and resolve the matter. It would have been uh, quite permissible for him to have invited the Democrats to back off or to have uh, somehow accepted the explanation given by uh, Senator Kemp. But indeed, we had, we had a succession of errors on the part of the Deputy President, not even beginning to comprehend that uh, a senator who is entitled to natural justice is entitled to know on what basis he's been warned and then named. Uh, demanding that somehow he had to give a, a, an apology when clearly the standing orders don't require that, uh, not really heeding the explanation given, not being prepared to accept that uh, there were circumstances that would justify overlooking uh, any uh, minor misdemeanour, and that's about as high as you could possibly place it, and again singling out someone that, uh, from where I sat, uh, committed no greater offence than probably half of this chamber tonight. And, and that that is why it's such a sad state of affairs that uh, you don't have the confidence of the chamber when suddenly someone is singled out for behaviour that almost everyone else would regard as fair and reasonable in the, in the fairly highly charged circumstances of the night. And uh, that's where judgment's required. That's where discretion's required. Senator Colston manifestly lacks either of those qualities. He's been given an opportunity over a long period of time to demonstrate that he can learn on the job, that uh, he can uh, use tact and discretion, that he can familiarise himself with standing orders, but what we've found time and again is that he has no understanding of the standing orders, constantly has to have it explained to him by the clerk, and uh, generally demonstrates an inability to handle the affairs of the chamber. And, and that, that is a very sad state of affairs, Mr President, and that's what brings us to the position we're at tonight. 
Um, we, we are very much united behind Senator Kemp. We don't regard him as having committed uh, any offence, certainly not within the terms of uh, Standing Order 203E, persistently and willfully disregarding. I mean, if, if what Senator Kemp did tonight, whether or not you regard it as more than laughing, if that is somehow characterised as persistent and willfully disregarding the chair, we might as well close up shop and go home. Everyone would be guilty of an offence every five minutes. And you know, Mr. President, in question time, in question time, there's a fair bit of give and take. And I don't mind it. And I don't mind giving it. And I don't mind taking it. And by and large, we get by. I mean, some people can't keep quiet for five seconds. They come and say to you, they come and say to you, are you moving an amendment? You say no, and you're told I'm going to speak for no more than 60 seconds. Well, he went for six minutes on that occasion. I, I thought he, you said one minute. One minute, he said. Order. Now, now, that's the sort of uh, thing that we tolerate. And Senator Ray can get up and thump the table and carry on, and we accept it. Senator Richardson can go through the sort of mealy mouth performance we had tonight, and uh, we know he doesn't believe a word of it. We know uh, what sort of machinations that uh, have been undertaken over the last uh, six weeks or so. Again, we cop it. And unless you're prepared to have that spirit, you, this place can't work. And that's why. We're reluctantly driven to the position we take tonight, and uh, Mr. President, I have to say that uh, we cannot go on in this way. You brought matters to a resolution on another issue, because you took the view you simply couldn't go on the way things were, and we take the same view tonight. Yeah. Yeah. Senator Ray, Mr. Uh, President, we've often uh, in this chamber, when we've come to a debate, standing orders, often referred to the most important one that's not there, and that's common sense shall prevail. And there's a couple of uh, couple of phrases, couple of phrases uh, that have been used by the uh, two opposition spokesmen tonight. They said uh, today is an extraordinary day. Well, certainly it was. And Senator Olson says there should be a lot of give and take in the chamber, and I agree with that. But I was here for the whole of that debate, and I think in my time in the Senate I haven't heard so much noise coming from one side of the chamber as we did tonight. No, I think that's a, I think that's a fact. And I can understand why, and I don't condemn uh, the reasons for that, uh, that noise and joy. And it wasn't a question, Mr. President. Order. This was not a question tonight of the odd interjection floating across, but an absolute bar barrage. No, not just of laughter, Senator Newman. There are a whole range of things said. The second thing that I think disturbed me in the behaviour tonight is, irrespective of what that side of the chamber, this side of the chamber, may evaluate in a presiding officer. When the presiding officer gets to their feet, there, then there should be silence, and there wasn't tonight. The barrage continued. Well, you see, you say that's justifiable. That Senator Olson says that's just, a, just that you know he's lost the confidence. If, in fact, the chairman gets to his feet because it can't uh, can't uh, establish order, then silence should prevail. You all know that. You know that's the practice, and that's it. It didn't happen tonight. It's been said that Senator Kemp was picked out. I heard Senator Hill warned. I heard Senator McGibbon warned. And I saw Senator Kemp warned. Then later I saw Senator Calvert warned. Uh, well, you say all well on this side. I'm, I say with due respect, Senator Bishop, 95 per cent of the noise tonight, because some of us are a bit down, came from your side. And I, uh, I think that's the case. Now, where this uh, particular issue got away from us, I have to, have to explain to the Senate, and I hope some of the senators agree. Immediately, uh, Senator Kemp was named. Um, well, I think it was myself who made the point that we should hear an explanation. We then started to have a variety of points of order. At, at that point, Senator McMullen intervened, made a contribution, and said, let's get on with it. Everyone on this side, I must say, hold on, everyone on this side, assumed that was the end of the issue. and what I didn't even realise that Senator Calder was talking to the point of order, and then he moved the motion. And, the, and I have to say here, the Deputy President, when you read the standing orders, had no choice but to put it. The standing orders at that stage, it gave us no chance to intervene, us no chance to try to apply some common sense, us to apply some sort of interpretation to what Senator Kemp had said. 
because I took Canada's, Senator Kemp's explanation as probably being sufficient. Order. But we had no alternative. We had no alternative when the motion was put to, in fact, back up the deputy president. Now, uh, people say uh, at that point the deputy president could have backed off. He couldn't. Once the motion is moved, no. Once the motion is moved, the deputy Order. president must put it. Order. Which again goes to the point where traditionally those sort of motions are moved from this end of the, the chamber, traditionally, and very rarely, in some occasions, they move from where Senator Al about where Senator Alston sitting. And that's that tradition, I must say, should continue. However, we have been through an experience before. We have been through an experience before, in which a presiding officer some years ago named a disorderly senator. Uh, and I, uh, I don't comment on the circumstances. And this chamber did not back up. Order. No, 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 no. No, I'm not picking on anyone. I'm not picking on anyone. But this chamber did not back up the presiding officer, and I think this chamber was at fault. Exactly, exactly. We can concede that. Order. Senator I can see that. The chair. But it's very Order. difficult for for most people in the chamber not to back up a presiding officer who has named someone. And uh, that's what occurred here. Now, where do we take it from here, uh, Mr. President? I don't take it as far as to say I have lost confidence in the deputy chair. The other side does. The coalition does. I do not. I've seen him perform some very admirable performances in this chamber on difficult committee stages, complex committee stages, etc. And I again repeat, to me, in my experience in this chamber, I must say tonight was one of the noisiest that I've uh, gone through. No, it is. You know. it, and it, it wasn't really one of those give and take ones this time. There's a lot of given, and we were taking it all on this particular side. Now, uh, you know, some reference was made uh, going back to, uh, to the election or non election of Senator Crichton Brown. I mean, I thought he took his defeat rather well, and I don't think that should intrude on uh, the debate or judgment at all tonight. Uh, uh, because a reference was made from uh, from your side, uh, Senator, uh, by yourself, saying that you know we made a mistake. Uh, Order. Uh, while you were waving bogon moths away, is the way I took it. I just say this, Mr. Uh, Mr. President, uh, in conclusion. I um, I say this, uh, Mr. President, in conclusion. Uh, today has been an interesting day, and I just uh, I just reflect in contrast with the experience I've been through today. <coughs> Where I see someone who has uh, behaved uh, impeccably, honourably, etc., and I come in and see some of this, and I come in and see some of this puerile performance tonight, and I'll remember this day of contrast. A great Australian, uh, whose career ended today, and a pack of puerile performers in this chamber, and uh, that contrast will always stay with me. I do not believe. I do not believe the uh, opposition has made a sufficient case to warrant a motion of this seriousness, but I do believe that uh, at some stage people from this chamber should enter into a dialogue to understand uh, what is within the acceptable bounds of give and take uh, in the chamber. And there should be, as Senator Orson is right, there should be a fair latitude. It doesn't come to a point, though, I think, you'd, you'd agree, Senator Orson, to a total shouting down of someone trying to deliver a speech in this particular chamber. It bordered on that. Had it been a speaker other than Senator Richardson, who's got a pretty loud voice, they would have had absolutely no chance of being heard in this chamber. Absolutely no chance whatsoever. Mr. President, this is a serious, uh, this is a serious step by the opposition to move. Senator Hill has acknowledged how serious it is. I don't believe the case is sufficient, but I do think common sense should prevail more often in this chamber rather than a quick resort to standing orders, and that we should at some stage, and we're probably too tired in this period to have some sort of discussion as to how the chair's authority is reinforced, especially when the chair is on their feet calling for order. Senator, point of order. To be misrepresented, I seek leave to make a brief statement in respect to that matter. Is leave granted? Senator Crichton Brown. Mr President, I've just put it for the record because the, the presumably flippant manner in which it was put by Senator Ray won't reflect in the hand, so. Senator Ray. I thought implied that there had been some motive from somebody on this side of the chamber 
to move this motion on the basis of Senator Colston defeating Senator Crichton Brown for the Deputy Presidency. I would hope that Senator Ray will acknowledge for the benefit of the Hansard that no mischievous intent was in his mind, because it certainly has not been implied from this side, nor would it be. And I like to think that all of us accept the decisions of this chamber with good grace and understanding. And I, I'd be deeply personally offended if, if I thought Senator if I thought Senator Ray were. I wonder why I just finished this, Mr. President. Without yes, order, order. I'd, I'd ask Senator Collins and Senator Walters to stop interjecting. Oh. Oh. Senator Crichton. Thank Brown. you, Mr. President. I'd, I'd be grateful if, if Senator Ray would acknowledge that he wasn't impugning that or imputing that in any way. I so acknowledge and ask leave to have that put on the record. Senator Ray, Senator Bell. Thank you, Mr. President. <clears throat> In the contributions so far from the coalition, part of the defence which has been offered has been that laughing was a natural response to the situation, or that it was a minor misdemeanour, or that it was a fair response. And that description has also been turned around to offer part criticism of the, uh, the deputy. Much of that is a matter of opinion so far. I'd like to offer two facts. Two facts which I think uh, myself and Senator Coulter are privy to, and perhaps nobody else on the, nobody on the, uh, the government bench and nobody else in the, uh, in the debate so far has acknowledged. The fact one was that I was standing next to Senator Kemp while he was chuckling and not disrupting the chamber but simply chuckling. Fact number two, I was still standing next to Senator Kemp when Senator O'Chi introduced a deliberate strategy of disruption. Senator O'Chi gave an instruction to not only Senator Kemp but several others, and I challenge, I challenge, <coughs> I challenge Senator O'Chi to deny that he said, and I quote, and I quote, keep laughing, they can't chuck you out for laughing. End of quote. Senator O'Chi orchestrated he danced from one place to another in a deliberate strategy which showed disrespect to this chamber and in particular provoked Senator Kemp to not laugh but to in fact make loud disruptive noises which mimicked laughter but which served only to disrupt this place and to interrupt the legislative processes. I submit, Mr President, that what we saw from Senator Kemp was part of a process orchestrated by Senator O'Chi, something which we saw from this end of the chamber and which disgusted us to such an extent that we thought it should be stopped so we could get on with the legislative process. Senator, Senator O'Chi. Order. Well, we will deal with Order. That Order, Senator Macdonald. Senator O'Chi. We will deal with that interjection in a minute, Senator Bell, because I take umbrage at that suggestion. But the, uh, the comment I make, uh, Mr President, is that Senator Bell did not hear what I said correctly, and I want to put it on the record what I did say, because I make not one effort to resile from what I have said, and it is very simply this, that we cannot interject but there is nothing to stop us from laughing, and I was laughing genuinely, as many of the members on this side of the chamber were doing. And for Senator Bell to come in here and perform another stunt, hot on the heels of the one we have seen, is, I find, personally offensive. And now to be accused by Senator Bell of lying, Mr. President, is even worse. Is even worse. And I say. That if Senator Bell has a problem with his hearing, then so be it. But I don't want him coming in here and trying this stunt on me, because I will not tolerate, tolerate it, and that is why I ought to put it on the record right here and now, so we can get on with this debate about a very substantive point. But Senator Bell is in here to score cheap shots. We are not. I challenge you to deny it. You didn't. Senator Haradine. <clears throat> Mr President. Uh, the motion that is before the chamber is a very serious motion indeed. It is a motion that suggests that the Senate 
has uh, no confidence in the Deputy President. It's a motion that uh, <clears throat> in all of the 16 years that I've been here, I don't think I've heard uh, of uh, such a motion. Um, it's a motion that I believe that should be uh, supported by far more evidence than I've heard thus far. It should uh, reflect a <laughs> continuous discontent by uh, a majority of this chamber over the actions of the Deputy President, uh, such that would lead to such a, uh, a motion. Now, I haven't heard uh, that, um, uh, that um, uh, evidence uh, thus far. I don't think that, the, uh, that this motion uh, is appropriate to be moved because of one incident. Now, I must confess to the chamber that I left this, par this uh, house at uh, around about five or ten minutes to seven this evening uh, to attend a commitment outside of the chamber, uh, thinking that the uh, transport uh, bill would still be before the chamber when I got back. I got back here, I think, around about 25 or 20 to nine. Um, the car having picked me up at about quarter past eight, and the bells were ringing. I got to the, uh, I, I just about made it to the door, um, and uh, then I heard the reason that the bells were ringing was for a, a motion uh, that uh, Senator Bell, uh, uh, Senator um, uh, Hills, a motion to uh, suspend standing orders. So I wasn't aware of what had occurred before then. I wasn't in the chamber to observe um, uh, what happened in so far as Senator, uh, um, uh, Senator Kemp was concerned. Now clearly, if there were concerns about what occurred then, the uh, clear um, uh, response would be to vote against uh, uh, the particular motion. Uh, that was uh, presumably moved on that occasion, and uh, thus register uh, your disagreement uh, with uh, the uh, action that had been taken. Whether that act, where you're registering disagreement against the action of the deputy president, or whether you're registering your disagreement with the action of the uh, of the person who moved the actual motion. And thus, you're registering your disagreement uh, uh, with the motion itself. Now, that's when the uh, well, well, you've already done that, uh, as I understand it. The opposition has registered uh, its objection to the action that's been taken, either by the deputy president or by the person who moved the motion. But uh, there has only been one reference made by the opposition. Uh, tonight, there's been general statements made about um, uh, about the deputy president's uh, um, uh, efficiency or otherwise in the job. General statements, no specific uh, mention, except about the occasion a couple of weeks ago. Now, uh, that occasion, I thought, was dealt with sensibly by the chamber. I thought it was dealt with sensibly by Senator Bohm, and I thought it was dealt with sensibly by the uh, uh, Deputy President when he was chairman of the committee. It was a very difficult situation, and I observed and I thought that it was dealt with sen sensibly. Now, I've um, then served in this chamber, uh, and uh, uh, during those years, I suppose there's been four or five uh, Deputy Presidents. Uh, uh, that have been that have occupied that uh, persons that have occupied the position of deputy president, and one of the functions of deputy president, of course, is that of chairman of committees. And if you've got no confidence in the deputy president, you haven't got confidence in him as chairman of committees. Well, I, well, I want to stand here and say that. His performance as chairman of committees is as equal, equally good, if not better than any of those other deputy presidents that have served. He has been an intelligent, 
sensitive, considerate, tolerant and efficient deputy uh, uh, chairman of committees. And, uh, I, I certainly would not support uh, the resolution on the basis of the evidence that has been presented to us. I, I apologise for not being here tonight, but even if I were here tonight, you could not support this uh, resolution on the basis of one single incident. There's got to be a pattern of virtual misbehaviour by the Deputy President for such a motion uh, to, to be supported uh, and accepted by the Chamber. And, uh, I certainly don't believe that that pattern, pattern of behaviour is there. Senator Archer. I too regard this as a matter of considerable seriousness. And you, Mr. President, Mr. Deputy President and myself, along with Senator Harradine and Senator Walters, all started in this place on the same day. Now, we've had enough experience between us to know how this place operates and what sort of give and take is necessary to make it operate. Senator Ray produced the solution for what was going on tonight. But because of ignorance and stupidity and short-sightedness and one-upmanship, it didn't get the opportunity to work. Now, that is the real problem we are facing tonight. Section Clause 203, infringement of order, which was what caused this problem tonight, is, is fairly simple and straightforward. It says that a senator who has been reported as having committed an offence, and I've previously gone through the various offences, shall attend in the senator's place and be called upon to make an explanation or apology. Or apology. And then a motion may be moved that the senator be suspended from the sitting of the Senate. Senator Kemp very adequately made an explanation which would have been perfectly acceptable to you, Mr President, and would have been perfectly acceptable to Mr Deputy President. Perfectly acceptable. There was never any doubt about the nature of the explanation that was given by Senator Kemp. But here, this body tonight, through arrant stupidity, has put a plaster on Senator Kemp for the rest of his life that he got thrown out of the Senate for misconduct. That's what's happened as a result of some stupidity from further down the line. Now, I do object to that. I object to that far more than I object to the fact that we're dealing with, with a, a, a motion of, of uh, no confidence at the moment. It is a day of high emotion. I accept the fact that history has been made today, today and we're all part of it. Now, we don't often fit into this place when real history is made, but today is one of those days. There is a lot of emotion on both sides. There's a lot of emotion of conflict on either side, particularly on the other side. But this isn't the way to deal with it. And I just feel that you know, what, a, what a terrible thing we've done today as far as Senator Kemp is concerned. If you can get thrown out of the Senate for laughing, you couldn't get thrown out of the Senate in, uh, uh, in any place I can think of. Probably Ethiopia, you wouldn't. In Mongolia, you wouldn't. You know, where would you? Where would you get thrown out for laughing? And I don't think for an instant that Senator Colston would have thrown Senator Kemp out of the Senate for laughing. Now, whatever else. But I wouldn't have thought that the people opposite would have voted to throw him out either. And that's where the problem lies. Absolutely. Why did you mob over there vote to throw him out? You stupid lot. Look what you've done now. Order. Apart from the fact that you've Order. now got, It's half past nine at present. 
We could have started at 8 o'clock. But because you wanted to play your games as a means of getting rid of the, the tension that you've built up during the day, it's half past nine. Now, really, why can't we do something that can review this stupid decision that we've suffered and get on with the business like we're supposed to? Senator Alston was talking about a bit of give and take. Now, that's what it's all about. Senator Ray was on about it. But why Senator Coulter? wanted to be the main figure in the act today, and so this is where we wind up. And that's what happens. Now, really, Mr President, can't we do something to reverse this decision and get on with the business of the day? Senator McMullen. Order. The, the question is that the question be now put. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells. Order. Order.
Lock the doors. The question is that the question be now put. The ayes will pass the right of the chair, the nose to the left. I appoint Senator Foreman teller for the ayes and Senator Brownhill teller for the nose. Order. Result of the division there being 32 ayes and 29 noes, the question is resolved in the affirmative. Order. The question now is that the motion moved by Senator Hill be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. Aye. I think the noes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. The question is that the motion moved by Senator Hill be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the nose to the left. I appoint Senator Brownhill teller for the ayes and Senator Foreman teller for the nose. Order.
Order. Result of the division there being 28 ayes and 34 noes. The question is resolved in the negative. Would all senators please resume their seats? Would all senators please resume their seats? Senator Hill. Uh, Mr President, I seek leave to move a motion uh, forthwith, um, a motion of rescission of the, of the resolution suspending Senator Kemp, uh, and I need leave, because otherwise I'd be bound by the uh, notice requirements in Standing Order 87. Yeah. You do need leave. Is leave granted? Before, Senator I Collins. I, I wonder if I could also seek the leave of the House. Um, because I'm somewhat taken aback by the suggestion that's been made, and I'll only speak for one minute. Mr. President, uh, can, can I, I, honourable senators, I please resume their seats. Mr. President, um, I'll be one minute. Uh, Mr. President, I, I wasn't aware of the of the actual nature of the, the motion that uh, Senator Hill uh, intended to move tonight, and uh, I don't know, frankly, what Senator Colston's reaction that, uh, to this would be. But the situation was this evening, and I'll be very brief, and Senator Ray, I thought, very, uh, very effectively uh, uh, put it down, is that I thought, uh, frankly, I agreed with Senator Ray, and I did so by interjection, I thought the Senate suspended tonight, in fact, gave a very proper and gracious uh, response. Um, Senator Coulter, of course, actually moved the suspension. Um, what I would suggest, Mr President, is that— Correct. Mr President, what I would suggest, and I know that the Senate is certainly capable of doing this with your advice on how we do it, is that uh, a resolution to this, and I think it's appropriate after six weeks on the last night, is that the suspension against the Senator for, uh, for the service of the House be rescinded and that the motion against uh, uh, the Deputy President uh, be withdrawn. And is, I would seek leave to move. Uh, is leave granted to Senator Hill? Senator Hill sought leave to move a yes, motion. Yes, but on the right? first part. Well, it can be done by leave if uh, you wish to move it, I think, Senator Collins. Mr President, I seek leave to move the motion I foreshadow. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Collins. Mr President, I move that the suspension from the service of the House of Senator Crane be rescinded. Senator, Senator Kemp. It has, been, it has been a long six weeks. Order. I, I move, Mr President, You're lucky, the, Senator Crane. That, the <laughs> that the suspension from the service of the House of uh, Senator Kemp uh, be rescinded and that the motion uh, of no confidence uh, against the Deputy uh, President of the Senate be withdrawn. Senator Hill. Um, I want to express it in this way if I'm speaking to the motion that uh, has been moved by, by Senator Collins. Um, certainly, I think uh, the motion of rescission that I wish to move, I sought to do so because I listened carefully to what Senator Ray said, uh, and I got the impression that, uh, that it was his view and therefore the view of um, government members that the offence of laughing uh, was not disorderly conduct or abuse of the chair or, or anything that, uh, that justified, uh, justified being thrown out. And I thought it therefore sensible, particularly in the uh, unprecedented circumstance when the motion to suspend him wasn't in fact moved by the, by the government member but by a member of uh, a third minority party, that the Senate should give, uh, should give further consideration to, the, uh, uh, to that um, unusual course of action of um, suspending Senator Kemp for laughing in the chamber. It certainly seemed to us uh, that that was warranted, that a reconsideration was want warranted, and that's why I was seeking leave to move that immediately. And the minister has uh, has taken the procedure and done so, and that part of the motion that uh, that we'll support. With regard to the 
withdrawal of our, our motion of no confidence, um, it puts us in a very difficult um, position that I'll try to explain, Mr. President. As was said on both sides of the chamber, the action to move a motion of no confidence in the deputy chair is don't wave your arms around is is something is something that shouldn't be an action that shouldn't be taken without very serious consideration. And very serious consideration was taken. We were of the view that the conduct of the deputy chairman was such that he should no longer have the confidence of this chamber. My discomfort is by complying with, uh, with this and trying to uh, meet the spirit of Christmas and so forth. It may well appear that uh, we now regard our action as not of that uh, consequence, and I'm not going to take any. I'm not going to uh, take any position in this place that in any way withdraws the gravity with which we believe the matter we believe of this matter uh, and our justification in moving the motion that we moved and well it, it, it doesn't quite apply to the suspension because I think around the chamber people are generally of the opinion and genuinely of the opinion that it was a miscarriage of justice. Well, I listened to Senator Ray, and Senator Ray, in effect, might come back. But Senator Ray, I think, in effect, indicated that uh, the Labor Party felt they were locked in to protect the deputy president once Senator Coulter had taken this incredible, incredible Stupid. action. Stupid. And, uh, and I got the impression that what Senator Ray was saying was that it wasn't a hanging offence and that course of action shouldn't have really been taken, but that he didn't have any choice once Senator Coulter had taken the action that he, that he did. And I think Senator Ray regretted uh, what had occurred. And that's why I wanted the chamber to reconsider what it had done, uh, and I wanted Senator Coulter to reconsider the action that he'd taken, because I would like to think on further, further reflection he would think that that wasn't a sensible course of action to take. And it wasn't, certainly wasn't a course of action that was going to result in the, the type of uh, environment that's necessary to make this place function in the future. And I like, would have liked him to have the opportunity to consider that. But what the minister has done, however, is ask us to also withdraw the motion that we've just, uh, just lost. Now, I'm not too sure how you do that in any event. Um, it, may not, uh, it may not be possible. Uh, I'm, uh, we accept we lost that vote. The, ch the chamber has confidence in the deputy president, notwithstanding the very serious point of view that we put to the chamber, and we accept that. And uh, uh, we're, we're in business. We're in business with Senator Colston in the future, and he will continue to get respect in the future in the way that we would give respect to any president or deputy president that has the confidence of this place. But I don't think, Minister, the more I think about it, that you can ask us to take a course of action now that would indicate that we didn't hold the, the action that we took earlier with the level of gravity in which we did in fact Absolutely. hold it. Absolutely. Uh, and I'm not sure with this unusual procedure that you moved how uh, we get ourselves out of that. But if, you've, if, you're, if you're waving your hand to suggest that you have a solution, I look forward to hearing it. I seek leave to speak again, Senator Collins. I seek leave, Mr. President, to speak very leave briefly. Leave um, And I, I do granted. have to acknowledge I'm indebted to Senator McMullen for the suggestion. Um, Mr. President, I, I'm obviously entirely in your hands, uh, but I, I'm uh, grateful to hear the, uh, the views of Senator Hill on this. Um, what Senator Mullen, McMullen has suggested is that uh, the procedural problem I had not recognised, Senator Hill, and I think you're correct, is that perhaps. Um, a, uh, a, a motion of the chamber can be moved, leaving the vote stand as it is, uh, in a more positive way, and that is that the suspension of Senator Kemp uh, be withdrawn, and uh, that the House uh, affirms its confidence uh, in the Deputy President. Order. 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 Senator Alston. Uh, Mr. President, uh, 
What, what Senator Collins is proposing is um, an attempt to somehow rewrite the entire course of recent history. And I really don't think, if we are in a spirit of compromise, that it is necessary to go to that point. No, no one wants to reopen wounds. No one wants to traverse the same ground. All we are saying, I think, uh, on this, at this end of the uh, chamber is that, uh, in the circumstances, it, we are warranted in reconsidering the position we took in relation to Senator Kemp. Other than that, let bygones be bygones. We've uh, put our point of view in relation to the Deputy President. We've lost. We accept the consequences of that, which are that there is no uh, motion of uh, no confidence or censure. We will continue to uh, treat Senator Colston with all the respect that uh, the position deserves. And uh, there is therefore no reason for resiling in the way that Senator Collins would suggest. And I don't think that e either of us are wanting to go back over all of that ground. And I think we can very simply get to the point we want to get to. Senator McMullen. Mr. President, this is frustrating in that we are very close to agreement. I, I understand the sense in which Senators Hill and Alston have spoken and uh, Senator Collins. And we are uh, we're seeking to do two things in this discussion. And if we can do, if we can find a formula to do both things, we will be in agreement and get on with the business. What, what the government will not agree to is any resolution which indicates in the slightest way that we do not have full confidence in the Deputy President. Whatever, in whatever manner... No, I under... Yeah, but... Thank you. I do understand that. It's helpful. It's very helpful. Well, there is absolutely no sense in saying to us that we will do only one thing, which is, uh, lift the, uh, is go to the rescission of the suspension of Senator Kemp. We will not do that by itself. I understand the point, and both Senator Ray and I, in speaking, to, uh, in speaking in response to the explanation offered by Senator Kemp, indicated some sympathy for uh, the fact that perhaps, uh, with some further action on his part, a way out might have been found. But the resolution has been moved, and we support, supported and support the Deputy President and continue to do so. But Senator Archer, in speaking uh, in the debate, made some points which I think everybody would I didn't agree with all of it, of course, because he got stuck into our side of the house. I didn't agree with that part of it, and that's fair enough. But he was making some comments about uh, the uh, impact of this upon Senator Kemp, and if there is a manner in which something can be done that in no way reflects upon the, the standing and support of the government for the Deputy President. Uh, while dealing with uh, that perceived problem, which we appreciate, uh, is held on the opposition side. We are prepared to try and find that. Comp we are prepared to try and find that compromise, but it needs to have two elements. It ne you can the form of words of the second element is something that is negotiable, but I think we need to find that. And can I suggest, uh, Senator Hill, that it, Senator Hill? that it may be that we need a little more time to discuss the form of words in which this manner is resolved. And if you think some further discussion may do that, I might suggest the debate on this motion be adjourned to, uh, until a later hour this day. So I, I'm prepared to accept dealing with it. I understand what you're trying to achieve. But, uh, but uh, I'm, happy to, I'm happy to do that if you think discussion will find the form of words that will allow both points to be achieved. If it will not, we will simply uh, oppose your motion, Mr. President. Mr. President, I move. I move that debate on this matter be adjourned to a later hour. Well, I, well, I, I thought that was a good suggestion. There'd been a order. Order. There'd been a speaker from the government side. I call Senator Bishop. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, I find out what resolution is before the chair because I still think it's Senator Collins. Well, I'm speaking to the to the to the res, to the motion moved by Senator Collins, which he's moved in two parts. And uh, by listening to Senator McMullen, he is saying that he will agree to a uh, rescission motion, provided he gets his way, uh, and that somehow there is a vote of confidence in uh, uh, Senator Colston. Quite clearly, that is unacceptable on this side for the reason that we, in all 
in all honesty and sincerity, moved that motion out of sadness and slow anger as much as anything else, and with a desire to see somebody put out of their misery. All right. It is a situation that we have been experienced over the time, and indeed I am seeking the, uh, to uh, examine the, uh, the Hansard at the moment and will bring back to this place a list of the people who have been warned by Senator Colston over a period of time. And I know that when it comes to light they will all be virtually people on this side of the House and not on that side of the House. And part and parcel of this question of confidence is one of respect, and you earn respect in the chair by having an even-handed and, and uh, reasonable approach, that is, the approach of a reasonable man. Now, anybody who saw, and we have access to video replay in this place, and anyone who had a look at the video replay would see uh, that many of the rulings that we are, uh, that have led to the moving of this motion, or rather led to the moving of the earlier motion, were ones that have come out of anger from the chair. And that is clearly not an acceptable way in which to manage this chamber. Now, in speaking to the motion as moved by Senator Collins uh, and the one foreshadowed by Senator Hill, and that is simply to move the rescission motion, I think it is fair and reasonable uh, that the motion be rescinded. As Senator Colston rose in his place and asked Senator Coulter if he would repeat what he said because he did not hear it the first time, and if he had listened more attentively, attentively to what Senator Ray had to say, who was offering him the way out and he simply didn't have the ability to accept that offer and rule that way. And in his anger, which is so obvious every time you look at a replay of the way that these incidents arise, you will see that he asked Senator Coulter to uh, repeat the motion that he had moved and really got himself into the mess. Now, it is quite unreasonable for Senator Collins to ask this side of the chamber, who, as I said, moved the motion out of both a long sense of burning anger and injustice and a sense of sadness to see a man in a position where he is unable to cope. And I think, Mr President, that if Senator Collins could uh, see his way clear to put his motions into two parts, i.e. two motions, uh, then we would be able to vote accordingly. Otherwise, we ought to have Senator Hill's motion as he has sought leave and be able to vote on that. Senator Collins, I seek leave to withdraw my motion and to make a short statement to, as to why I wish to do so. Is leave granted? Mr. 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 Deputy. Order. Uh, Senator Hill, is leave granted? I'll be one minute. He's seeking leave to withdraw his motion. Oh, I'm sorry. I, th I thought we. Certainly. Yes, I, yes, we will. But we're not going to. No. Yes, yes, we will. But we're not going to have a long debate. No, we're not. Yes, we will, Senator Hill. Mr. President, uh, leave granted. Leave's granted. Senator Collins. Mr. Mr. President, I deeply regret the contribution that has just been made by Senator Bishop, who, in fact, said in the Hansard will show it, purported at least to speak on behalf of the, the opposition. She said, "We will not agree," etc. Now, I just point out, in terms of in terms of the suggestion Senator Bishop has made, Mr. President, uh, and which is about to be moved in uh, in a motion that's going to be put by uh, Senator Hill, which we will oppose, and I think rightly and justifiably. I think we're perhaps indebted um, to Senator Haradine, uh, because I got this third hand for the, for the original suggestion is to try to get a peaceful resolution to this. And I just point out to all senators, Mr. President, that the question of the um, suspension of uh, the senator from the chamber, I mean, Senator Bishop seems to think there is no concession on this side of the House at all. We're simply asking for one from the opposition. That is absurd. The suspension of that senator was carried by a vote of the Senate. The Senate voted to suspend the senator. Mr. Mr. President, I, I, in good faith, offered a solution which, frankly— Order. Oh, look, it'll only take me 30 seconds to finish. Which, in good faith, I frankly think the, the good majority of the Senate were prepared to support. But it puts us in an impossible position, Mr. President, if that concession on this side of the House—and I thought it was a reasonable one—to uh, withdraw the suspension of uh, the senator uh, was uh, only uh, agreed by the opposition, and they were not prepared. Uh, and Senator Bishop has, uh, has said it. We will not agree to withdraw any lack of confidence on this side of the chamber in the deputy president. And in so, I, with great regret, with great regret, Mr. President, for that reason, I withdraw the motion, and I indicate, for the reasons I've just given, I think reasonably, the government will be voting against 
uh, the, uh, the motion about to be put uh, by Senator Hill and so that the suspension will stand. Senator Hill. Well, I, I move the, uh, the motion that the decision of the, the resolution yes, of the Senate— Seek leave. Seek leave. Well, leave's I'm granted. Leave's granted. Senator Hill. I move the motion that the suspension of Senator Kemp be— uh, the, the resolution to suspend Senator Kemp be rescinded. Uh, and uh, I do so for the reasons that uh, I've said a few minutes ago. And with regard to the, the issue of the, of the uh, Deputy President, I again repeat also what I said a few minutes ago, and that is that the Chamber has resolved confidence in Senator Colston. We respect the decision of the Chamber and we respect the office of Deputy President and he can expect that respect from us when he returns to the chair. Now, I don't, I don't think that you can ask us to do any more than that. And I've put that on the record. And in those circumstances, I urge you to reconsider your view on the rescission. And I urge you to recognise, accept, that the decision to throw Senator Kemp out tonight was wrong, and it was an exercise that should be, should be put behind us. And that's why I give you this opportunity, whilst demonstrating, while demonstrating respect for the chair. I give you the opportunity to reconsider this uh, this this issue recognising, I think, in the spirit of what Senator Ray said, and that is that it really wasn't a hanging offence. It wasn't an offence that warranted Senator Kemp being suspended. It diminishes the Senate. Read to the whole decision. Just read it. I give you the opportunity to reconsider, and I give Senator Coulter the opportunity to reconsider the action that he's taken. There's a chance, there's a chance to get things right tonight in the end. And the way to get things right in the end is to rescind the motion of suspension, allow Senator Kemp to, to return, to accept that what we have said, and that is that we, we always show respect for the chair and will continue to show respect for the chair and will show respect for the office of Deputy President. In that light, I urge you to reconsider the attitude that you seem to be indicating by shaking your head. Senator, Senator Coulter. President, I don't need to remind you, Mr. President, that uh, the conduct of this chamber is only possible if there is respect for the chair, for the rulings of the chair, for the orders of the chair, and reasonable decorum in the chamber. When Senator Bishop was speaking, she simply proved her own uh, her own side's misbehaviour because she said that Senator Colston could not hear what was going on. The reason that Senator Colston could not hear what was going on, there was so much puerile and infantile rabble going on over here amongst the, the opposition. A number of, a number of opposition uh, senators had been named, and clearly, clearly contrary to what Senator Hill point has just order. said, the opposition was showing no respect, order, no respect whatsoever order. for the chair. Sit down. Sit down. Now the order. reason sit down. Sit down. I, Mr President, order. I do I'll tell people when to sit down. Senator Panizza. Yeah, Mr. President, I do believe that Senator Kilder used the word rabble towards us. I believe that it is unparliamentary, and I believe that you should ask him to withdraw it. Order, order. As I said in a letter to you the other day, Senator Panizza, I did consider it unparliamentary, and therefore I'll ask Senator Coulter to withdraw it. But a lot's been said tonight about give and take, and clearly, if on my left, and I haven't pulled it up because of the tenseness of the debate, I've heard expressions like sewer rats and a sleazy mob in reference to, a, to the party that you're now taking the point of order. Now, I'll ask Senator Collar to withdraw, and I'll ask everybody to have a better sense of behaviour. Thank you, Mr President. I'll withdraw that remark. The, uh, the opposition were extremely rowdy. Uh, they were disruptive. And in my opinion, the um, Deputy President was entirely, entirely justified in calling to order a number of senators and the opposition. Now, we in the Democrats are fed up with this constant interjection and the dis disruptive, disruptive behaviour which prevents the proper conduct of the operation of this chamber. And 
I personally was driven to the action that I took tonight, and I think the the motion. Look, if Mr. Mr. Order. President, if the if the opposition are going to continue to behave like this, well then I will continue. I will continue to use that section 203 because uh, it seems to me that they need to be taught a lesson. If if we're going to get on with the business, the business of this chamber, the fact that it might not have been used uh, very often in the past seems to me to be quite irrelevant. If it's not going to be used, why have it in the standing orders? Now, it seems to me that Senator Collins' motion was entirely reasonable. What I was doing was attempting to uphold the, the, the proper order of this chamber, the rulings, the rulings of the deputy, uh, the deputy president, and I will continue to do that. And consequently, I'm pleased to, to note that uh, in, in the light of what the opposition are uh, refusing to do, that Senator Collins has withdrawn his motion and we will be guided by his action in that. Senator Walters. Mr President, said, being said earlier than, uh, tonight, Senator Harradine, Senator Archer and myself have been here now for just over 16 years. Mr President, in that time we have only had, as far as I can remember, one person thrown out and not on this side of the chamber. Brown. Not on this side of the chamber. Two. two. Yeah. In fact, two people, Macklin. both from the Labor uh, benches. On every occasion, and indeed, Mr President, when there was a threat that I'd be thrown out, not for unparliamentary language, I don't believe, when I said that uh, one of the ministers was a disgrace to Her Majesty's government, it was ruled unparliamentary, but I didn't believe it, sir, and I refused to withdraw. But at least I was given, and everyone else who has ever been thrown out of this place has been given, the opportunity to first explain and then an opportunity to apologise. Now, I'm sure Senator Harradine will back me in that. They have never been refused the opportunity to apologise. On this occasion, Senator Kemp was asked we will have the Hansard tomorrow, to explain. He was not asked by the Deputy President Never. to apologise Never. Never. at any stage. Now, when that was pointed out and Senator uh, Kemp ex made his explanation, as soon as that was completed, Senator Colston said, I want you to apologise. I didn't hear you apologise. Now, there was a general call from our side that it had not been sought. Before he had the opportunity of seeking an apology from Senator Kemp, Senator Coulston, Coulter, Senator Coulter rose and usurped the position of the government. Never before in this place has anyone but the leader of the government sought the suspension of a senator, be it from either the Labor government or the Liberal government. Never before has some minority group usurped the position of the government, leader of the government. But because he chose to act so stupidly and to try and usurp the position, rightly taken by a government in that position, we reached the stage where all the efforts of Senator Ray to pour oil on troubled waters at that stage were undercut and to no avail. Now all I can say is that if the Democrats want to grandstand in the way they have tonight, except Senator Kernow, who voted with us because she also saw that the Democrats had undercut Senator Ray in his efforts to overcome the problem we had, <coughs> then we will always get into this situation. The Senate is only run according to the standing orders and tradition. And I would like to press the and tradition part. Because, Mr President, once you depart from tradition, as has occurred tonight, then you will always run into trouble. I'm quite sure that Senator Harradine would agree, and had he been here, I doubt whether we would have lost that vote. 
because never before has there been a situation where a senator has been thrown out of the Senate without first being given the opportunity to apologise. And that is what occurred tonight. Senator Kearney. Uh, Mr President, uh, <coughs> whether we could come back to the, to the mood that perhaps uh, provided the Chamber at the start of this. And I can understand everybody getting a bit offside, but um, <coughs> I think uh, Senator uh, Hill put forward a proposition which I think uh, needed discussion. I think it was answered by uh, Senator uh, Collins and, and, and Senator McMullen, and I thought we were progressing fairly well along a, uh, a peaceful path where we all sort of saw ourselves as senators who wanted to get rid of a problem. And uh, we seem to have moved a bit away from that to where we're uh, getting a little bit, uh, a little bit uh, curt with each other. Uh, Senator Coulter, I think, has uh, done what he uh, thought right. Uh, Senator uh, Colson uh, is, is perhaps bruised by what's happened, and I suppose the one that's suffering most is Senator Kemp. And I'm beginning to wonder whether what we're not doing is sacrificing uh, those three people uh, to the uh, to the uh, to the speeches we're making, the shafts we're throwing across the chamber. Uh, I was just wondering whether a Senate, with the people that are all as intelligent as we all are, can't come to some sort of compromise position. I thought perhaps. Uh, one thing might be to adjourn, perhaps let the, uh, the uh, whips or somebody else or anybody, somebody brilliant like Senator Bohm come forward with some sort of compromise. Oh, you're about to do that, Senator Bohm. Well, there you are. And, uh, well, I, I think in those circumstances, and since we are coming to reason, uh, that it, uh, I'll sit down and let the, the, the reconciler come forth, uh, Senator Bohm. Senator Bohm. I thank uh, I thank Senator Kearney, Mr. President, for uh, uh, for his uh, support, uh, which is uh, uh, even more strenuous and effective than on the tennis court. But, um, <laughs> uh, Mr. President, the problem clearly has emerged, as everyone has said, because of the precipitate action of uh, uh, an unprecedented action of the Australian Democrats. I don't want to go into that matter because it's uh, been well dealt with. The problem is, and I have to say that I have some feeling for Senator Colston on this matter, the problem is simply that before Senator Colston had the opportunity to consider, to consider the explanation by Senator Kemp, before he was given that opportunity, it was snatched away by precipitate action by the Australian Democrats. Now, clearly, clearly, the way out of this, which seems to me to uh, resolve all problems, is that the rescission motion uh, uh, as uh, set by, uh, by uh, uh, Senator Hill should be accepted, but that, and that would then give uh, 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 Senator Colston the opportunity to determine whether or not he would accept, and whether or not. Mr. President, there's no assumption either way that he would or he would not, but that he'd be given the opportunity to, to determine an opportunity he was denied, an opportunity to determine whether he would accept Senator Kemp's explanation. When he had made that decision, then it would be up to the, uh, up to the Parliament, up to the Senate, and I had uh, Senator Collins might, uh, uh, might take this on board. It would then be up to the uh, Senate, having heard the manner in which Senator Colston could make his, would make his determination, and if his determination were, for example, to accept the explanation of Senator Kemp, then it would be up to the Senate to move a motion supporting the decision of the Deputy President to, in, to accept Senator Kemp's explanation. Now we've got to recognise, we've got to recognise that to an extent, the opposition's feelings of grievance emerged from the fact that it appeared that Senator Colston had not taken into account the explanation which was asked for and very properly given, and which, as Senator uh, 
Ray indicated was one that was, quotes, acceptable, and, uh, and Senator Collins said was, quotes, acceptable. Now, and that's the thing. It is unfair to Senator Colston that he was not given the opportunity. He should be given that opportunity, and I believe it would then be proper for the Senate, having heard whatever Senator Colston then determined, either, well, in, in the event that he did accept that explanation, to move a motion which I hope would be carried unanimously, supporting the decision of the Deputy President to accept Senator Kemp's explanation. Now, that seems to me to be an indication of support for the ultimate decision taken by the Deputy President, if that were his decision. I don't want to prejudge it. But it seems to me ridiculous that we can't get together on a simple issue like this uh, in, in a matter which I would hope would firstly resolve this waste of time and secondly present at least some evidence of goodwill at this time of the year. To make a very brief statement in response to Senator Bowen's uh, contribution, which is, leave is positive. Is leave granted? Leave's granted. Senator McMullen. Uh, Mr. Uh, President, at, at this moment and in that particular form of words, I'm not sure that Senator Bowen has exactly the solution we're looking for, but it seems to me it is back in the spirit which we were pursuing when Senators Hill uh, and Alston had spoken. And I reiterate my previous suggestion that we should adjourn this discussion so that we can have a discussion about a form of words that will resolve it uh, and get on with the business of, running, uh, of passing legislation and come back this evening with, a, with an agreed yeah, form yeah. of words to resolve it. And I move that the debate on Senator Hill's motion be adjourned. To a later hour this day. The, qu yeah, the question is that the debate be adjourned to a later hour of the day. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Yes. <laughs> I hope so. Well, we want you on the um, Mr committee. Clark. Mr President, Senator I seek McMullen. leave to move a motion to suspend Standing Order 64 for this day. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Mr President, I move that Standing Order 64 be suspended to enable new business to be commenced after the question for the adjournment of the Senate is first put this day. The question is that this motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. I thank you, Mr President. I now move that the order of consideration of government business for the remainder of this day be as follows. Number three, Insurance Laws Amendment Bill 1991 and five related bills. Number four, Bankruptcy Amendment Bill. Number two, National Rail Corporation Agreement Bill. Number five, Financial Legislation Amendment Bill 1991. Uh, the question is that this motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I don't think so. The ayes have it. Mr Clark. Government Business Order of the Day, Insurance Laws Amendment Bill 1991 and Associated Bills, Second Reading, Adjourned Debate. Senator Kerno. Thank you, Mr President. The Senate is tonight belatedly considering a group of six bills concerning the life and general insurance industries. These six bills are the Insurance Laws Amendment Bill 1991, the Insurance Acquisitions and Takeovers Bill 1991, Life Insurance Policy Holders Protection Levies Collection Bill 1991, Life Insurance Policy Holders Protection Levies Bill 1991, Life Insurance Supervisory Levy Amendment Bill 1991, and the General Insurance Supervisory Levy Amendment Bill 1991. The bills were referred to the Finance and Public Administration Committee before this second reading debate. And that committee has considered the legislation. Senator Coates has already presented the committee's report to the Senate. The proposals before us arose because of a financial scandal which occurred last year involving the attempted takeover of two life insurance companies, Regal and Occidental. These two insurers were, and still are, part of the Battery group of companies. Battery decided to sell Regal and Occidental to an American investor, Mr Philip Carver, via a company he controlled, Heath Holdings. Price was $132 million, payable in three instalments over 12 months. $65 million of this was paid by the Bank of Melbourne to the Commonwealth Bank and the ANZ Bank to extinguish debts owed by Battery. 
This $65 million had been taken from the statutory funds of Regal and Occidental. That is, the statutory funds had been raided to pay for the acquisition of the life insurance companies. As Senator Bohm has remarked to this Senate in the past, this unauthorised use of the statutory funds of a life insurance company is contrary to section 38 of the Life Insurance Act. Yet more than a year later, no final legal action has been taken against the people who undoubtedly contravened this provision. Some other charges, however, may be laid against Mr Carver, who was recently arrested at Sydney Airport whilst attempting to leave Australia on a false passport. The recipient banks refused to return the $65 million, claiming that they had received the money in good faith and that they had extinguished loan obligations of equivalent value. A judicial manager, Mr Richard Grellman, was appointed under the Life Insurance Act by the Federal Court. This is the first such appointment and resembles the appointment of a receiver or provisional liquidator in that the directors have been temporarily replaced. It is his responsibility to continue to run the two insurance companies, which still have about 90,000 policyholders and assets of over $300 million. Legal action is being taken to recover the $65 million and there's a very good chance of success. A successful action has already been achieved, which entitles the judicial manager to use the company's funds to pursue this legal action. The whole matter is currently before the court, so I won't mention it further. But these extraordinary circumstances prompted the former treasurer to intervene to abort any crisis which may have occurred. And we can contrast this with the completely hands-off approach by him to the devastating Faro Group crash in Victoria. After a succession of no negotiations, the Treasurer, this is Treasurer, former Treasurer Keating, now Prime Minister-elect, announced in January that a compulsory levy would be imposed on life insurers to make up 90 per cent of any shortfall in policyholders' funds which remained after all the relevant legal actions have been completed. So that is, depending on the results of the various court cases, there may not be any levy ever imposed under this legislation. The earlier industry proposal for a voluntary levy could not be implemented, so a legislated response was sought and agreed to by the government. The former Treasurer also announced proposals to allow the Treasurer to supervise all acquisitions of insurance companies in excess of 15 per cent of capital increased minimum capital standards for both life and general insurers, strengthened investigatory powers of the Insurance and Superannuation Commissioner, as well as increased duties of actuaries and increased disclosure in the statutory returns of general insurers. Now, all of these proposals are contained in the six bills before us tonight. I think the central question about this legislation is should the government be taxing all life insurance policies to subsidise policy holders who have incurred a loss through fraud? Now, the pure answer is no. The risk should be borne by the policy holders because all investments carry a degree of commercial risk, including the ultimate risk of failure of the institution. This must be balanced by the question of the health of the life insurance industry and the financial system as a whole. In this case, the Treasurer took the view that the financial system was in some danger and, as such, intervention was necessary. Given the deregulatory bent of former Treasurer Keating, clearly there must have been some genuine fear, especially after the collapse of the Faro Group of building societies. Also, the extraordinary situation which arose in the Regal and Occidental affair should never be repeated because of the new powers of the Treasurer with respect to acquisitions of insurance company equity. So this package should not be viewed as a precedent for bailing out investors in the future. On balance, the Australian Democrats support the policyholders' levy legislation. The regulation of major acquisitions of insurance company equity is comparable to the provisions which have operated for many years in the banking industry and so is supported by the Democrats. The improved 
minimum capital standards should also lead to greater investor protection and are also welcomed. This should also speed the expected rationalisation of both the life and general insurance industries, which are widely recognised as having too many participants. The provisions strengthening the investigatory powers of the Commissioner arise because of the shortcomings discovered during the investigation of the Regal and Occidental matter. Order. Clearly, Order. It being 10.30 pm, I put the question that Senate do now adjourn. Those that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. no. I think the noes have it. Senator Kerno. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Clearly, a regulator must be in a position to investigate, report and act on any aspect of legislation which he or she has a duty to enforce. And the proposals pertaining to this in this legislation are absolutely reasonable and necessary and have the support of the Australian Democrats. Finally, the related proposals to increase the supervisory levies on both the life and general insurance industries to pay for the extra administration costs which this package imposes on the ISC is also consistent with the general cost recovery nature of the existing operation of the ISC and as such we do not oppose this increase in the supervisory levies. There are many issues in the life insurance area which have not been addressed by the government in this legislation. The Life Insurance Act has been under review for years and uh, perhaps Senator McMullen could inform the Senate of the progress of this review. General insurance in the public sector is also in a turbulent environment at the moment. Premier Greiner in New South Wales is preparing to privatise the GIO. The Victorian opposition has stated its intention to privatise the Traffic and Accident Commission and the Commonwealth is still attempting to destroy the Housing Loan Insurance Corporation. None of these proposed privatisations is in any way driven by efficiency or by competitive considerations. Indeed, they will be anti-competitive and will generally disadvantage consumers. They are purely the result of ideological bias, the bias of the new Prime Minister-elect of this country. Surely this process of deregulation and privatisation has done enough damage for those driving the process to be asked to justify their policies on the achieved gains. Any rational analysis would show us that New Zealand is not a good model to follow. We are starting to hear a few encouraging noises from Mr Crean and Senator Button about active government policy in some areas. We await the economic statement in the new year. But the biggest concern is the almost complete failure of the Australian capital markets to provide adequate development capital. The big institutions, that is the life offices and the banks, have been unwilling to provide the development capital needed to commercialise our scientific achievements. Examples abound of real entrepreneurs, not paper shufflers, being forced to sell to foreign investors because of a lack of local interest. There are real gains to be made by Australian firms collaborating with foreign concerns with expertise and access in foreign markets, but the control should stay in Australia. The Australian Democrats have said this before and we'll say it again and we know that many others are starting to agree with us. Deregulated financial markets have failed. It is time for the government to acknowledge that specific regulation is needed and it must act in this area. Failure to do so will continue to doom Australia to never become the cliched clever country. Senator Watson. Thank you, Mr Madam Deputy President. Due to a unique series of circumstances described as one of the most botched deals in modern Australian corporate history, this was by Australian Business Magazine, we have before us the, the six insurance amendment bills for debate. These amendment bills will hopefully achieve two things. Firstly, they will prevent a repeat of the Occidental and Regal life debacle. Secondly, they will raise funds to compensate to a maximum of $65 million, which was misappropriated by placing a one-off levy on other insurance companies. 
It is not in the Senate's best interest for me to go into the full details of the failed sale of Occidental and Regal Life Insurance Companies by the Battery Group to a shelf company called Heath Holdings. Although for those interested, I would recommend to them an article which appeared in the Australian Business Magazine on April 24, 1991. What has not been said loudly and clearly in relation to this case, which I wish to say today, is that what we are essentially dealing with here is a banking problem which the then Treasurer, Mr Keating, chose to transfer to the insurance industry for them to deal with. The viability of the Bank of Melbourne was threatened as a result of their actions in the sale of Occidental and Regal, rather than have the Treasury having to bail out another fa failed financial institution. Mr Keating changed the focus of attention to life or insurance companies and put the onus on them to bail their colleagues out. What has happened in this instance is indeed unfortunate, not only for those professionals involved, but for all the policyholders affected. The deal, which took only two months to put together and one night basically to stuff up, has resulted in two companies being put into the deep freeze for 12 months so far, and probably another 12 while the legalities are sorted out. The picture is not totally grim, despite neither company writing new business. Policyholders can make claims but cannot surrender their policies, although death and disability payouts are being met. Policy renewals are lower, and those who are paying their premium for death and disability are being fully underwritten by Mercantile Mutual, which has effectively taken over Occidental and Regal's death and disability business. The situation, Mr Deputy President, could have been much worse. Hopefully the amendments we are debating here today will prevent a repeat performance of the Occidental and Regal Life debacle. I will deal just briefly with the six bills on an individual basis. Firstly, the Insurance Laws Amendment Bill 1991, which amends the Insurance Act 1973 and the Life Insurance Act 1945. These amendments, which concern increasing the minimum capital and solvency requirements for authorised general insurers, minor amendments to the description of the accounts and statements required by the Commission, etc., as explained by other speakers, are all welcome moves with which we have no problems. I am concerned, although, that by the tightening of prudential standards, this could cause a problem for the privacy provisions. It is not possible to keep a central register of people making false insurance claims, even though a third of payments are suspected to be fraudulent. I also wish to address the concern raised by the Insurance Council of Australia at the committee hearings with regards to clauses 24 to 26. The Insurance Laws Amendment Bill amends both the Insurance Act and the Life Insurance Act to, virtually, um, to introduce virtually identical provisions, disqualifying directors and certain executive officers. Now, these bills impose formally a levy on life insurance companies to compensate holders of life insurance policies of Occidental and Regal Life. They also contain provisions which will limit the total amount of levy collected under the legislation to $65 million. I plan to propose an amendment to these bills until I read in the budget papers that, which made an additional provision. And I quote, the government has introduced legislation as a one-off arrangement to enable the imposition of one or more levies on registered life insurance companies to raise an amount not exceeding $65 million. And that bill has just passed the, uh, the Senate. The timing and the amount of the levies, which will provide a measure of financial protection to policyholders of Occidental Life uh, Insurance Company of Australia Limited and Regal Life Insurance Limited, will be dependent on the judicial management of those companies. The levies collected will be paid into a protection fund now to be tax deductible to life officers, relating exclusively to non-fund accessible income. Grants paid to Occidental Life and Regal Life will be exempt from income tax and um, will be used to meet up to 90 per cent of the liabilities under life policies issued by Occidental Life and Regal Life. Certain payments to life officers representing surplus monies from protection fund will be treated as non-fund accessible income. These arrangements are from uh, holding office if they have been convicted, of course, of certain, uh, of, of certain types of. Uh, 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 so, uh, I regret that. these arrangements are being imposed because of the special and unusual circumstances involving the unauthorised dealing in statutory uh, uh, fund monies of the two companies. The uh, measures, of course, will operate from the date of royal assent.
Um, I'd also like to mention that while the insurance industry considers the imposition of an industry levy, it sets a dangerous precedent for similar interventions if other insurers were to fail. And uh, we're then accepting the fact that a levy needs to apply in this instance. The industry, uh, which has experienced explosive growth during the past decade, is dominated by two large life companies, which between them control 60 per cent of the market. Neither the industry nor the taxpayer could afford to support either of these giants were they ever to need such help, which would be highly unlikely. Yet, what would be the use of a support scheme that excluded these two? The life companies initially objected to the imposition of the levy. However, they have accepted the need for it in this instance as a one-off levy and are happy to comply with it. They are even happier to comply with it now that the tax deductibility aspect has been addressed by this government. The fact remains that though the policy hold, uh, through the policyholders that all other groups that have been, will be disadvantaged as a result of the fraud in one particular group. This is another instance of lack of prudential standards and a failure of the government to move quickly during a period of explosive growth of the life insurance industry. Such payments on a $65 million give encouragement to those at the cheap and the less ethical end of the market to write high-risk business in the knowledge that in a major catastrophe it will be picked up by government action. Imposing a levy uh, has not been conducive to sending the sort of right signals to encourage right or good practice. There were three objections raised by participants at the Finance and Public Administration Committee's hearings into these bills. One of the comments was, which I wish to raise here today uh, uh, stated, uh, ran to the effect that their concern was that um, there is a group of contracts in the market where the way in which the investment earnings are credited to a policyholder is very tightly controlled by the policy wording. The concern was that Clause 13 does not specifically cover that particular group of businesses where the wording of the policy would not allow the company to pass the cost of the levy onto the policyholder. Now, in response to this concern, Senator McMullen stated that for the purpose of Hansard and therefore the purpose of the Acts Interpretation Act, that it is the government's intention that this legislation be interpreted as a tax for the contract in the terms of the policies which the Commonwealth Life uh, Limited referred to. So I'd also like Senator McMullen to reiterate that point again, as he indicated he would be willing to do so when the bill again came up for debate in this chamber, in the Senate. During the committee hearings, I also raised a point with Mr Grillman, the judicial manager, about the provision for assistance to those policyholders who had elected to voluntarily discontinue payment of premiums under their policies. In response to this question, I have received a fairly lengthy letter from the Insurance and Superannuation Commission. My concern in this area has been allayed to some extent as a result of that, that correspondence. However, I would appreciate the government and any others who will be responsible for compensating policyholders bearing my point in mind during uh, this particular deliberation. The Life Assurance Supervisory Levy Amendment Bill and the General Insurance Supervisory Levy Amendment Bill, I comment the insurance industry is supervised by the Insurance and Superannuation Commission, whose job will now be expanded as a result of the changes introduced in these bills uh, 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 as a result of this legislation. In anticipation of extra staff to cope with this expanded workload, Three supervisory levy amendment bills allow for an increase in life assurance and general insurance supervisory levies from $20,000 to $28,000, from $11,600 to $15,000 respectively. Finally, the Insurance Acquisition and Takeovers Bill 1991. The purpose of this bill is to set out rules for compulsory notification to the Minister of deals that would involve the transfer of certain interest in Australian insurance company, their assets or directors, and to allow the Minister to refuse the right to refuse approval in such deals. If this bill had been in force a year ago, then the Occidental and Regal life situation probably would not have arisen. As my colleague Senator Short has indicated, the Coalition will be moving amendments to this bill. There were a number of concerns raised in relation to this bill by those attending the committee proceedings, which the Coalition has taken up in its amendments. The first concern raised was by the AMP over Clause 5, 
which set out the circumstances which deemed to be contrary to the public interest for the acquisition or takeover of an insurance company. Their particular concern was subclause 3, which refers to a situation which is likely to unduly concentrate economic power in the general or life industry or in the Australian financial system. There are two points with regard to this subclause. The first is the concern that this requirement appears to cover very similar ground to section 50 of the Trade Practices Act, but with a different and vaguer criteria. The concept of unduly concentrate economic power is very close to the domination concept in the Trade Practices Act. The AMP was particularly concerned that an insurance company which had a concern about the competitive aspect if a proposed acquisition would need to seek both the approval of the minister under this legislation and the approval of the Trade Practices Commission, a situation which I describe as a jub, double jeopardy position. The second point is that the subclause relates to unduly concentrating economic power in the Australian financial system as well as the insurance industry, and this type of cross-industry trade practices provision is unknown in other industries. Opposition members were also concerned about paragraph 5.1d of the bill, and that paragraph defines as a matter to be contrary to the public interest if it is contrary to the national interest. Now, national interest is not defined in the bill, and thus we are concerned that the provision requiring, as it does, a highly subjective judgment might be used to unduly restrict entry to the insurance industry. Item A of clause 5 relates to a situation where an acquisition or takeover is likely to adversely affect the prudential conduct of the affairs of the company. Whilst this item is supported, it was pointed out at the committee hearing that the Life Insurance Act contains no direct obligation to conduct a company's affairs in a prudent manner. It is thought that there should be both a general principle and, for consistency purposes, 5A of the bill. Now, when this matter was raised in the committee, Senator McMullen responded that it was a worthwhile comment which he would take on notice. I trust the point has not been lost and that Senator McMullen will stand by his word in this instance. I would also like the Senator to, to reiterate for Hansard purposes the comments he made in committee about the decisions under this clause being reviewable, and if it appears that the Minister has made an arbitrary decision in the face of facts, the AAT would overturn it. Now, Moving to clause 15 of the bill, the Australian Bankers Association has drawn attention to the formula in clause 15.5. The intention is for a, per, a percentage to be calculated. The formula written doesn't result in a percentage. The Australian Bankers Association has suggested an easy remedy, and I would suggest that for the sake of completeness that the alteration be made. Still on the acquisitions and takeover bill, National Mutual has expressed concern in relation to what is referred to as the trigger proposal. Their specific concern is with capital raising procedures. Without a National Mutual representative present at the hearing, this matter was passed over fairly quickly. National Mutual points out that the trigger proposal will complicate its capital raising process. The company then goes on to say that the inclusion of regulations which may result in such proposals being exempted from compliance if the minister sees fit is of some comfort to them. It does not, however, increase their workload. It does, however, I must say, increase their workload, and I would not be surprised to see some changes in this area in time to come. And I think there are probably deficiencies there. The losses of regal and occidental life companies has hastened the need for more and stronger government regulation of the life, insurance, uh, of the life and the general insurance industry. The lack of regulation has meant that many too small and inexperienced operators have entered the market. Hopefully the legislation before us today will significantly tighten both the area of the ability to enter the industry and the area of ongoing supervision, such that the history books will never again record a debacle such as we have experienced with Occidental and Regal. Um, um, the Minister. I do apologise. I was <laughs> resolving a problem that Senator Short and I just noted with, uh, discussed with regard to another piece of legislation, and I uh, appreciate the, the cooperation. There's not a lot to be said in summing up the second reading because we've had uh, extensive and worthwhile uh, 
uh, discussion in the committee on these bills, and I appreciated it. It was uh, informative. Uh, the, this package of bills is, I think, uh, an important uh, package of bills. With, uh, in the debate, in, in the uh, pressure of debates such as this and the, the constraint of time, uh, the positive things upon which we agree in packages of legislation tend to get uh, overlooked uh, in the course of uh, debating the points that are the highlights of contrast between us. But uh, we have a package of bills uh, which, taken together, increase the level of prudential protect protection provided to life and general insurance policyholders and provide a measure of financial support to policyholders of Occidental Life Insurance Company of Australia and Regal Life Insurance Limited in particular. It also uh, provides a mechanism for the prior screening of changes to the ownership and control of life and general insurance companies, puts in place levy arrangements which will ensure that an appropriate degree of protection is provided, as I said before, and allows for the recovery of costs arising from additional resources provided to the Insurance and Superannuation Commission for the purpose of improved industry supervision through an increase in the life and general insurance supervisory levies. And uh, I emphasise, as I think has been said in the, committee, uh, in the committee hearing, that these are measures which have been developed in liaison with senior representatives of the life and general insurance industry associations. Uh, the substantive point of disagreement between us now lies with the uh, opposition's uh, amendment, which we'll deal with in the committee stages. So uh, I'll say no more at this stage than thank uh, the Senate for its support for the second reading of the legislation and uh, commend the bill to the Senate. The question is the bill will be now read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye, and say no. I think the ayes have it. Insurance Laws Amendment Bill 1991, Life Insurance Policy Holders Protection Levies Bill 1991, Life Insurance Policy Holders Protection Levies Collection Bill 1991, Life Insurance Supervisory Levy Amendment Bill 1991, General Insurance Supervisory Levy Amendment Bill 1991, Insurance Acquisitions and Takeovers Bill 1991. One of the bills, uh, Uh, it's the wish of the committee that the um, committee consider first the insurance acquisition and takeovers bill. It's so ordered. The question is: the bill be uh, is the wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole? There being no objections, so ordered. The question is that the bill stand as printed. Senator Short. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, uh, the opposition has uh, an amendment uh, to the insurance acquisitions and takeovers bill. It was circulated that this uh, package uh, through the Senate of this uh, package of this legislation, the passage has been on again and off again, and uh, it's really been here for quite a few weeks. And I, I think that uh, the amendment, well, the amendment was actually circulated uh, back in uh, in October, and uh, I'm not sure where the, the Democrats' uh, situation on it, but uh, they now have been uh, sort of reminded about it. The, uh, the amendment, which uh, was circulated uh, at that time, and uh, which I now formally move on behalf of the opposition, uh, is an amendment to clause five on page seven of the bill, uh, paragraph 51C, lines nine to eleven. Uh, the amendment uh, to be moved is that uh, that uh, subpara, those three lines, uh, be omitted. And uh, they, those uh, three lines read uh, um, that, uh, going back to 5.1, for the purposes of the application of this Act uh, to an Australian registered insurance company, a particular matter is taken to be contrary to the public interest if it is A, B, and then C, the one we're proposing for deletion, if it is C, likely to unduly concentrate economic power in the Australian general insurance industry, in the Australian life insurance industry, or in the Australian financial system. Now, when this, uh, bill was, these bills were uh, considered by the uh, Senate Standing Committee on Finance and Public Administration, 
uh, in October. The uh, report of that committee recorded a, a statement uh, by opposition senators, and that was Senators Watson, Senators Ke Watson, Campbell and Kemp, uh, and supported by myself, uh, although not a member of the committee. Uh, we expressed concern at aspects of the uh, uh, insurance acquisitions and uh, takeovers bill, and one of those concerns related to subclause 5.1 of the bill, uh, which, as I've just said, uh, defines circumstances which, for the purposes of the bill, are deemed to be contrary to the uh, to the public interest, and uh, para subpara uh, C is of uh, particular concern to us. Uh, as Senator Watson in his second reading uh, speech uh, pointed out, uh, the reason, or one of the basic reasons for the concern is that the terminology in 5.1c uh, differs in a material way from the provisions of section 50 of the Trade Practices Act, which addresses the, uh, the same issue and uh, which will also apply to the uh, transactions in question. Uh, we, uh, on this side of the chamber, certainly support action to uh, tighten as much as possible prudential standards in the insurance industry, uh, but uh, our view is that this particular uh, paragraph is aimed uh, at, uh, at competition policy and its inclusion in a bill concerned with prudential matters uh, is, in our view, uh, confusing, particularly given the established uh, body of case law in relation to the existing trade practices uh, legislation. And as Senator Watson again said in his uh, remarks, and as uh, the opposition members uh, on the committee said at the time, the uh, proposed clause introduces an element of double jeopardy to the legislative environment in which the insurance industry operates and may represent an unnecessary barrier to entry to the insurance industry. And that, uh, I would have thought, is a potential problem uh, with which we would all be concerned uh, because the need for an open environment in the insurance industry and the most competitive environment possible in the interests of uh, the consumers of the, uh, of the uh, insurance industry, and that is indeed the most Australians, uh, is a very important uh, requirement uh, indeed. Since that report was uh, written and since the bills were considered uh, in the Standing uh, Committee, I've noted several press articles uh, relating to or dealing with the relationship of the Trade Practices Commission uh, to the insurance industry, and uh, those uh, articles and comments in the media have, I think, raised similar sorts of concerns to the ones that, uh, that I personally have had for some time, and, uh, the, and I think the uh, Coalition shares my concern that uh, just how the Trade Practices Act and the uh, Trade Practices Commission and the ISC are going to work in relation to the insurance industry, how they're going to interrelate, whether there is duplication and conflict there, I think is a matter that does need uh, looking at, and uh, uh, that's perhaps for another occasion. Uh, but to include 5.1c in this bill, uh, when it is a matter really relating to competition uh, policy, and which I think we would all agree competition policy is, is mainly dealt with and, uh, and rightly dealt with by the Trade Practices uh, Commission through Section 50 of the Trade Practices Act. Uh, the fact that that is the situation uh, leads us to move the amendment that, uh, we, that uh, we have now uh, circulated. I hope that the government uh, will be able to agree to the uh, the amendment. I'm not, uh, I must say, uh, totally optimistic that they will, but I think that logic is on the side of accepting this amendment. I hope that the Democrats uh, will accept uh, uh, the, the logic of that as well, for the reasons that I, and more particularly Senator Watson uh, as well, in his second reading speech, has, uh, have outlined. So I th therefore so moved. Senator Kerno. Chairman, the Democrats are aware of the statement by the opposition members of the committee, the statement to the Senate Standing Committee on Finance and Public Administration. I understand what they say they're seeking to do, but uh, we're also aware of the response from the Insurance and Superannuation Commissioner 
dated 3rd of October 1991. And uh, if Senator McMullen's not proposing to incorporate it, I certainly would propose to do so. But the most relevant paragraph, I think, uh, that I'd like to quote by way of explanation of our position on this amendment is that on page two of the letter, we take the view that the bill should allow the Treasurer to have regard to all aspects which could impinge on whether a proposal might be against the public interest and consequently it would be inappropriate not to have regard to concentration competition considerations, particularly given the increasingly important role insurance and superannuation is performing in the overall financial system. And we agree that it would not be appropriate to rely on the provisions in the Trade Practices Act for this purpose because the scope of conduct being regulated is different and there are different thresholds which apply. We don't, we don't concur with, with your concern about the anti-competitive nature here. We, on balance, would have to oppose your, your amendment and I would seek leave unless the Minister, uh, Parliamentary Secretary was intending to incorporate this. I'd like to have this incorporated. Just leave granted. <coughs> leave is granted. Uh, Senator McMullen. Uh, thank you, Mr Chairman. I'll be uh, brief in the light of the comments that have been made by Senators Short and Kerno, who were both uh, admirably brief in their uh, comments. Uh, as was clear in the uh, deliberation to the Finance and Public Administration Committee, uh, I am not without concern about the point that Senator Short raises. Uh, it is a question about which I have given some consideration and which I uh, raised with uh, relevant ministers <coughs> in the government uh, because question of, although I think competition policy is very important and we need to be very rigorous in its pursuit, uh, I, uh, I don't want us to, in an ad hoc manner, proliferate uh, different standards in different pieces of legislation. We do without good cause. There are different standards in different pieces of legislation and they are uh, applied because of the particular nature of, of, of industries. And I wanted the government to consider whether it believed that the circumstances uh, of the uh, industry we are dealing with here tonight uh, was such that uh, uh, this clause was, uh, was warranted as a special inclusion. And I have to say that uh, after that consideration, the government has formed the view that, particularly given the increasingly important role insurance and superannuation industry is performing in the overall financial system, uh, it would be inappropriate not to have regard to concentration and competition considerations. My view is that for so long as we have the national interest element in there, and I believe we should, then any minister making a decision under the legislation would give consideration to competition factors, and it is much better if that is to be the case. I think inevitably that would be so. It's much better if that's going to be the case, that it is explicitly stated in the legislation rather than subsumed into the broader national interest uh, uh, aspect. It, it, it would not be impossible to consider it in, under the national interest heading anyway, but that then means that you're having a, a more indirect statement. And so, given that the government has formed the view that that would be a criterion that ministers would be likely to take into account, it is the view of the government that uh, it uh, ought more appropriately uh, be explicitly stated, and therefore we are opposing the amendment. Although, as I said before, and I repeat, I am not unaware or unsympathetic to the concerns that the opposition raises as a matter of general principle about it. Uh, and I want to make very explicit that it is the government's uh, intention, what is proposed, is that there will be very close consultation between the Trade Practices Commission and the Insurance and the Superannuation Commission as a matter of course on any proposal which involves an existing insurer acquiring a significant interest in another. And the, the views of the Trade Practices Commission would therefore be taken into account in the Treasurer's decision on the proposal. So I think it's, a very, it's been a very legitimate debate. It's been a very important point, properly considered by the Senate in its committee, in its Finance and Public Administration Committee and here. But on reconsideration, the government remains of the view that this, the, the clause, that the paragraph should remain and it therefore opposes the amendment.
The question is the amendment be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the noes have it. The question is that the bill stand as printed. Those of that opinion. Uh, uh, Senator Watson. Yes. During the debate, I sought certain assurances from the parliamentary secretary arising from issues that were raised during the uh, committee stages of the debate at the Senate Standing Committee on Finance and Public Administration. I acknowledge that uh, during my presentation, the parliamentary secretary was absent and therefore it would be fairly difficult for him to respond. But perhaps if uh, we could get an assurance, seeing that that lack of assurance may be seen in the, this parliamentary chamber to be an abrogation of those earlier assurances, uh, I would hope that his advisers could uh, give him the confidence that he will uh, monitor those issues uh, that we earlier drew some attention to because of concerns raised not only by the industry but also by the opposition. Senator McMillan. Yeah, and I don't want unduly to delay proceedings, but it may be that we can resolve this if uh, Senator Watson recapitulates very briefly, as I understood it, and I do apologise, as Senator Watson knows in my uh, other hat uh, as manager of government business, we did have some rather delicate discussions to undertake, and of course, in the interest of decorum, they took place outside the chamber. But as I understood it from that which I heard, the assurance which he sought was a reiteration of an assurance which I gave to the committee relating to, uh, to the, the interpretation of the levy as a tax. Is that, if, the, if that is, uh, is, with regard to at least that point, I'm happy to give that reiteration here. If there are others, uh, I will check the hand side and give a considered response to Senator Watson. <coughs> the question is that the <coughs> bill stand is printed. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Is it the wish of the committee that the remaining four bills be taken together and as a whole? It's so ordered. Uh, the question is that those bills stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The question is that the bills be reported. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Order. The Chairman of Committee, Senator Colston, reports that the committee has considered the insurance laws, amendment bill 1991 and five related bills and agrees to them without amendments or requests. Minister. I move the report of the committee be adopted. The question is that uh, motion be agreed to. Those that uh, that opinions say aye, against say no. I think the ayes have it. I move the bills be narrowed a third time. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. The clerk. Insurance Laws Amendment Bill 1991, Life Insurance Policy Holders Protection Levies Bill 1991, Life Insurance Policy Holders Protection Levies Collection Bill 1991, Life Insurance Supervisory Levy Amendment Bill 1991, General Insurance Supervisory Levy Amendment Bill 1991, Insurance Acquisitions and Takeovers Bill 1991. Order. Uh, the following message has re been received from the House of Representatives. Mr. President, the House of Representatives reports, uh, returns to the Senate the bill entitled a bill for an act to amend the law relating to taxation and equates the Senate that the House of Representatives has agreed to amendments numbers two and three made by the Senate and has disagreed to amendment number one, but in place thereof has amended the bill as indicated by the next schedule. The House of Representatives desires the reconsideration of the bill by the Senate in respect of the amendment disagreed to and the current concurrence of the Senate in the amendment made by the House of Representatives, signed Leo McLean, Speaker. Deputy President, I move that the message be considered in committee of the whole forthwith. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. Senator Watson. That message, uh, I didn't quite Sorry. get the... Uh... You have to wait till Deputy President gets up here. Uh, just, just call, Senator McMullen. 
Thank you. I move that the committee does not insist upon its amendment number one, disagreed to by the House of Representatives, and agrees to the amendment made by the House in place thereof. The question is that motion be agreed to. Senator Watson. The House of Representatives has returned to the Senate an amendment which is, was moved by the opposition and supported by the Australian Democrat and thus passed by the Senate. The amendment concerned the deductibility regime for environmental impact costs. The Senate amendment was actually in two parts. One, full deductibility in circumstances where a decision was made before the end of the current year of income to abandon the project or the project ends before the end of the current year of income. And two, in other circumstances, where the, in other words, where the project proceeds, where 33 and a third per cent of the expenditure was allowable in each of three years. The message from the House of Representatives was to accept that part of the amendment allowing full deductibility where the project does uh, not proceed, but the House of Representatives rejected that part concerning the three-year deductibility write-off. And thus, the effect of that was to uh, reinstate the original 10-year write-off, which the opposition believed was too long. The government does appear to be unduly concerned about the revenue implications. But uh, I must, on this occasion, uh, regret the threat of the government that a failure by the Senate to accede to the government request would result in the government withdrawing the whole of the deductibility proposed from this bill. Now, this threat, the opposition, has taken very seriously. Firstly, this is the last night in which this particular matter can be debated, and we're not sure what time the other House will rise. We also acknowledge that there are a number of companies that will be balancing on the 31st of December and therefore our failure to agree tonight could result in this bill being held over until perhaps April next year. And acknowledging that those companies would have to pay their first taxation instalment on, uh, in, in January 1992, they would be severely uh, affected. We are not prepared under such a threat to put them in that position. But I remain, remind the government that it was the government's timetable. It was the government's timetable to delay this to this last possible minute, and thus the wrath of industry falls squarely on the government's head. We are not prepared in these dire economic times to have industry denied an appropriate deductibility regime. Even over, the ten, uh, even over ten years. And that is the threat that is put to us in the dying hours of this year, prior to Christmas. I certainly hope that this sort of uh, standover tactics that we have seen tonight in this bill and in the earlier debate is not a repetition, uh, is not going to be a signal of the new Keating ministry, because this will not be in the best interests of Australia. And I think it's regrettable that this is the first bill that we've seen under the Keating administration that is so dictatorial and so demanding, and I think so demeaning, really, of government. I remind the Senate that this government alleges its concern about shortcomings in the Income Tax Assessment Act, particularly those shortcomings that affect the competitiveness of Australian industry vis-à-vis -vis those operating in the national field, international field. Our proposal would have put the legislation on a par with the world's best. What we are doing is relegating Australian industry to a second status, making it harder for them to compete. And I find it hard to accept, in the knowledge that next year we are going to find an improved deductibility regime introduced. So it is basically pig-headedness on their part. It's, I suppose it will be seen to be a sign of strength, but it's a sign of folly. And I don't believe it is going to be well taken up by industry at the present time. Currently, the previous Prime Minister and the Minister for Industry, Technology and Commerce had referred to 
Prime Minister and Cabinet, the concern about the efficiency of taxation deductibility regime. Certainly this would be one issue that would be examined. And uh, no, no. <laughs> there is some concern that I think there has been inadequate communication within the government for it to come to this sort of decision. I think it's been made a decision probably made by Treasury without communicating adequately with either Prime Minister and Cabinet, which has this reference before it, in relation to appreciation, or DITAC. I raised this in the question this afternoon, and I'm also concerned that in this whole deductibility regime, the minister hasn't yet come back to the parliament and told those companies how they are going to deal with the industry statement on, on industry depreciation for those companies that balance on the 31st of December, because they are going to be disadvantaged. And I think it is pretty poor legislative tactics for the government to offer a carrot and not produce within the appropriate time schedule a legislative base that will enable companies to affect the, an appropriate deduction which was allegedly promised over nine months ago. But that, I think, that wrath will be shown in time to fall very heavily from industry on the heads of Australian government. I therefore regret the decision that has been made that is certainly not in the national interest. A few moments ago we were talking about legislation that was basically to be in the national, certain decisions in the national interest. I don't believe this is in the national interest, particularly at a time of ailing investment, ailing investment in manufacturing and mining. These are the two industries that surely should help bring Australia out of the recession. In many cases, uh, the environmental impact studies are a, a necessary expense incurred under legislation or incurred as a result of Commonwealth, state or local government decree. And I believe that what we had proposed was not unreasonable in the circumstances. Uh, because of the threat, the opposition will reluctantly have to agree with the proposals uh, as returned from the House of Representatives. But we regret the tactics that have been used. Senator Kerner. <coughs> Madam Chair, well that was pretty stirring stuff, Senator Watson, but if we'd stuck with you, you didn't really have to agree, did you? I mean, for years you've complained, you've actually complained that Australia doesn't have a competitive business taxation structure. You know that Senator Button's written that well-publicised letter to the Prime Minister saying that um, we don't have a competitive business tax system. You say you've responded to a threat. You've agreed to to fold, really, this important amendment that you yourself proposed earlier. Well, it's untested. What I'm saying to you is it's untested. Right? Uh, I've said to you we would have supported it. However, given that uh, you've accepted the government's threat, uh, those numbers mean that the amended, uh, the amended amendment will be carried. The question, oh, Minister, Senator McMullen. Thank you, Madam Acting uh, Deputy Chair. Uh, the, uh, the government, of course, uh, is uh, supporting, uh, I speak in support of the motion I moved and the reason why we put forward the amendment uh, from the House of Representatives and proposing to agree to it. The opposition amendment was in two parts, one of which we're accepting, so I won't waste any time talking about that. That's now agreed uh, by all parties before the chamber. The other, and I, I made this statement brought in the committee stage in the principal debate, I'll only reiterate it very briefly, the government is not of the view that it is appropriate that the, we should use the uh, taxation system to subsidise uh, companies conducting environmental impact statements. Uh, it is, there are two basic flaws with that. I think it is appropriate that we have made the step forward to recognise through the taxation system those expenses, but it is unrealistic to be uh, writing it off over three years and uh, uh, we, it is in effect a subsidy on the conduct of uh, environmental impact statements. We don't believe we should, we should subsidise uh, it because it is a bad tax policy, 
but also I believe that not one jot of extra environmental activity would be undertaken as a consequence of this amendment uh, because the environmental impact statement requirements on companies are set down in other legislation. So it is for that reason uh, that uh, we, are not, uh, we were not originally disposed to uh, agree to the, to the amendment and why we, I confess, took a fairly strong line against it, although not uncompromising because we did propose the, uh, the compromise that came back from the House of Representatives which is being accepted. Uh, everybody would prefer, of course, that uh, we never had to have uh, uh, some, fairly, some forthright negotiations around this place. Uh, there, it, is, uh, it is not a matter uh, that uh, people, uh, it would be nice if those things didn't occur, but we do have, even on matters where broadly we're in agreement, because I think the direction uh, of this bill is something broadly agreed by, uh, uh, certainly this part of the bill, and I think the bill as a whole, uh, broadly agreed by uh, all parties. Some might, because of their uh, other package of policies, want to go further with bits of it, etc. But uh, it is not a matter where uh, we have strong contention, but there are some fairly important questions of principle involved uh, in the, uh, the matter that was before us. That is the reason we took the stand that we did. It is the reason that I uh, reiterate it now, and, it is, and therefore I welcome the fact that the uh, message from the House of Representatives is going to be accepted. I should indicate that, that I think that uh, the compromise may even prove history will be our judge, but it, the compromise that has come back from the House, which accepts part of the opposition's amendment, may even prove to be better legislation than that which the government introduced. Now, this is a heresy which I should not utter, but it's very late at night and it's nearly Christmas. Uh, and perhaps the Treasurer won't ever see that I've done it because he won't read the Senate Hansard. Uh, now, it may also be that the incumbent may not, uh, who, with whom I discussed this matter. But uh, it, uh, it may also be, of course, that uh, some of the concerns which I expressed in the committee stage originally, which are the concerns that some officers and, uh, have and have advised the Treasurer and myself of, that there is a potential for abuse here, may prove to be justified. And our compromise may turn out to be something which we have to move to remedy subsequently. We all hope not, because it would be the sort of uh, 1980s abuse of the tax system that we hope we're growing out of, uh, and that uh, Australian, uh, that, that would not be the sort of uh, use of, of investment uh, that, w that the people of Australia are best served by. So there is an element of risk, but if the, if the risk proves to be justified, it may well be, I think, at, at the very least, a reasonable compromise, perhaps more. So uh, for that reason, uh, I uh, thank uh, senators for their uh, contribution in this uh, debate and uh, support the motion as I have moved it. The question is that <coughs> motion moved by Senator McMullen be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Is the, resolution be reported? the question is that the resolution be reported. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Order. The uh, temporary chairman of the committee, Senator Giles, reports that the committee has considered message number 450 from the House of Representatives and has resolved not to insist upon its amendment number one, disagreed to by the House of Representatives and agrees to the amendment made by the House in place thereof. Mr Ackman, Deputy President, I move the report of the committee be adopted. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. Minister. I'll take some regulations first. Uh, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, uh, in accordance with an undertaking made by the Minister for Administrative Services, I table the following regulations made under the Broadcasting Act 1942. Statutory Rules 1991 number 482, Political Broadcasts Tasmania Regulations. Statutory Rules 1991 number 483, Political Broadcast Australian <coughs> Capital Territory Regulations. Uh, Senator Perra. Um, Mr. Uh, Acting Deputy President, 
I seek leave to move a motion to disallow the political broadcast Australian Capital Territory and Tasmania regulations. Is leave granted. Brief statement on this. It's leave granted. I do assume that uh, I did assume that that might happen, but what I would procedurally like, if it's acceptable to the opposition, is that we deal with the agreed procedural matter, and then we go to the debate about that. I of course, leave will then be granted for Senator Perra to move that motion. But at that stage, if that's acceptable, thank you. Then, uh, Mr. Acting Deputy President, perhaps I shouldn't have sat down, then we wouldn't have got to that problem. But uh, I, uh, I move that intervening business be postponed till after consideration of the general business order of the day moved by the Leader of the Opposition in the Senate, Senator Hill, for the rescission of the resolution to suspend Senator Kemp. The question is uh, that motion be agreed to. Those that have say aye, against say no. The ayes have it. Of the day, notice a motion moved by Senator Hill to suspend a to, to rescind resolution suspending Senator Kemp. <coughs> My motion of uh of rescission, so um, I think it uh, just needs to be put. The motion of rescission has been moved. Uh, <laughs> but again, I'm sure well, it has. Well, I will put the question. Those that have been the question is the motion be agreed to. Those that have been say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Um, after Senator Kemp made an explanation in relation to the provisions of paragraph 3 of Standing Order 203, I accepted various points of order. I was on the verge of ruling that, Senator Kemp having given an explanation, the Senate should proceed to the business before the Chamber. It was my intention to take one more point of order and then make a ruling to that effect. Nevertheless, when a motion was moved <coughs> that Senator Kemp be suspended from the sitting of the Senate, I was obliged to put the motion without amendment, adjournment or debate. In accordance with my earlier comments, I suggest, suggest that Senator Kemp's earlier explanation following his being reported for an offence under Standing Order 203 um, um, <coughs> I didn't have time to write my whole statement. I'll start, start that again. In accordance with my earlier comments, I suggest that Senator Kemp's earlier explanation following his being re reported for offence under st Standing Order 203 um, be, be accepted and suggest that the matter be, now be declared closed. Uh, Mr. President, uh, Mr. Mr. President, I seek leave to move a motion endorsing the Mr Deputy President, I seek leave to move the motion endorsing uh, your decision to accept Senator Kemp's explanation. Leave granted. Leave is granted. Senator Hill. Um, I move that the Senate endorse the Deputy President's decision to accept Senator Kemp's explanation in response to his being reported for an offence by the Deputy President under Standing Order 203. The question is the motion be agreed to. Uh, Chairman, can I just in one sentence say that uh, I think uh, we've probably all been we all learnt from the experience of uh, this uh, afternoon. Uh, both I and Senator Ray were trying to seek a way that, for th that this might amicably have been resolved. It's several hours late, but I think we may have found it. The question is the motion be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Hmm. Senator Perra, did you have? Uh, a motion to move or a resolution? Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Deputy President. I, I, I'll seek leave to move a motion to disallow the political broadcast Australian Capital Territory and Tasmania regulations. Leave granted. Leave is granted. Thank Senator, you. Senator Perra. Thank you, Mr uh, Deputy President. I move that the political broadcast Australian Capital Territory regulations as contained in statutory rules 1991 
What I don't have at this stage, Mr Deputy President, is the number, because they haven't been circulated. 482 and 482. Number 482 in the Political Broadcast Tasmania Regulations is contained in Statutory Regulations 1991, number 483. 483. Made under the Broadcasting Act be disallowed. I'd just like Proceed. to speak bri briefly to the uh, motion I have moved, Mr Acting Deputy President. Just briefly, as everybody would know, this was one of the most outrageous pieces of legislation ever placed before this parliament. It initially commenced in a way that would have banned all advertising at all times 365 days of the year for federal, state and local government elections on radio and television. As time went by, it was somewhat amended. It was also a major reason why the Australian Democrats changed their leader, because it was apparent that a deal had been made with the minister and the then leader, Senator Powell. And uh, it was genuinely thought that, when this le that this legislation, having been referred to the Standing Committee, and I refer to that part of it that relates to the ban on advertising, not that part that relates to the disclosure provisions, would disappear not to be seen again. But what did we see? We saw the new leader of the Democrats, who upped his price in the previous, uh, in the previous uh, agreement, apparently the backroom deal that was made. It was a low figure. Then we saw a deal, yet again another deal made, which would give the Democrats something like $1.8 million of, um, of uh, free radio and television ads, or free television ads in particular, and also another amount which to all parties totals somewhere in the order of $8 million. Because we had what I could only call a ratty provision, one that will not work, whereby a brochure is to be distributed to every householder in Australia which shows the photograph, a curriculum vitae and a short policy of every candidate to be delivered by every householder at taxpayers' expense. Now, there are two reasons why this could make a mockery of the whole electoral system. One is that the, the straight logistics of it will make it almost impossible for this brochure to be delivered, because in the main it's not known until nominations close, except by those people, of course, who know well in advance they've been pre-selected by a political party. It's not known just who will nominate until nominations close. And from that day on, it's approximately 20 days to enable the Electoral Commission to get a photograph, a curriculum vitae, a short policy statement, put it into a brochure and have it distributed to every household in Australia. An incredible waste of taxpayers' money, an abuse of the taxpayer, because surely it is the role of candidates and it is the role of political parties to let the electorate know who they are and what they stand for. The second aspect of that, which I believe will cause incredible problems to the integrity of the electoral system, is it will be an encouragement for anyone in the community for the simple fee of a nomination fee of $250 to be able to nominate and get a brochure distributed uh, which describes their job and their policies and uh, it's not beyond the bounds of possibility that it would be an attraction to local business people to do it, to spend the $250 and get the brochure distributed. More likely, however, is the political parties themselves will see this as an opportunity, a cheap opportunity, to have multiple candidates stand or multiple independents stand, even though they are really fronts for political parties and have these brochures distributed in the hope, particularly in marginal seats, in the hope that they will pick up just a few extra votes that could take them over the line. But the major reason, the major reason Mr Acting Deputy President, that we are opposing these regulations that apply to the political broadcasts and political disclosures bill is that on a legal opinion we obtained 
from the Robert Garron Professor of Law at the Australian National University, Professor Zines. And I'm happy to quote this because in debate during the political broadcast bill, the minister made it, it was said anyway that he had a legal opinion to say that what was in the bill, which is now an act, uh, was constitutional and could not be subject to challenge. Now, Professor Zines is one of the most respected uh, constitutional lawyers in this country. And it was for that reason that we sought his opinion. And he made it very clear that the provisions could not validly operate in respect of state elections. Now, this is what these regulations are about. They refer to the ACT and Tasmania. And the reason they do that, of course, is because within about seven or eight weeks or so, or it's early February, there will be an election in the ACT, and it's also anticipated that there could well be an election in Tasmania. And of course, what happens with these regulations is that they remain in force until and if they are disallowed. So that by seeking leave tonight to have this matter debated, we believe that it's an opportunity, and I really do exhort the Australian Democrats to consider this because um, the advices we have, which I'm happy to, get, which I'm happy to give them Order. a copy, Order. makes it no, very clear yeah. that the... <laughs> uh, Mr Deputy President, I'm sure we all welcome back Senator Kemp into the Senate. I hope he hasn't been too lonely. Um, Mr uh, Deputy President, what these regulations do is seek to impose the will of a centralist federal government upon the states. When the bill was initially mooted by the minister, when it was initially introduced in the middle of this year, the whole hype of the thing was all to do with federal elections. And it was all to do with disclosure and a range of other matters. Now, what these regulations do is tell the states how they must, must uh, operate. And as pointed out by Professor Zines, the central provisions relating to state elections are those contained in section 95D, as is now uh, in the Act. And he points out that, and I just quote in part, it is clearly established that the Commonwealth may not discriminate against one or more states or impair their capacity to exist or function as independent units of the Federation. He, said that, he goes on to say, to date the only ground on which federal laws have been declared invalid under this principle has been that they discriminate against states generally as compared to other persons, and he quotes some uh, cases. And he points out the bill does not fall foul of this aspect in principle, but in his view it impairs the capacity of a state to function as an independent unit of federation. And he said, while no federal law has yet been invalidated on this ground, the principle has been reasserted on a number of occasions in recent times. What it is that may not be destroyed or impaired has been variously described as the structural integrity of the state components of the federal framework. And uh, he said, what is involved here is not the impairment of a state's powers or functions of government, which occurs, of course, every time a federal law controls a state. The implied principle protects the state as an organisation of government, that is to say, in general structure, machinery and processes by which it exercises whatever governmental powers and functions it has. And he points out that a Commonwealth law which purported, for example, to control the appointment of state ministers, judges, the procedure of its parliament or its re relationship between its parliament and the executive would clearly come within the implied prohibition. Um, and he, again, to quote from Professor Zines, he says, and this is the nub of the issue, 
It seems to me that the control of advertising and persuasion for purposes of state elections comes within this category. The process of election is fundamental to the organisation and structure of state governments. It is the process which determines the composition of both its legislature and its executive. And therefore, a federal law which purported to control the advertising of political matter in relation to a state election would be contrary to the implied constitutional prohibition. Now, as he's, I think the key to it is at the end is that the heart of the matter is the impairment of the capacity of a state to function as an independent unit of the federation. Now, Mr. Acting Deputy, Mr. Deputy President, as I have indicated, that is the major reason that we believe these uh, regulations should be opposed. 